Archstone Inc. and One Shot Productions present The Stone Family Lighthouse by Taylor Hart. Read for you by Christopher Ringer. Chapter 1 Marshall drove through the streets of Southport, remembering all those summers and the fun that he had shared with his brothers and sister. He pulled up to the Stone Family Inn and parked. Trey and Ava had made the old house pretty amazing. They had restored it to how it had once looked over a hundred years ago, though obviously there were modern aspects included. Granted, when Marshall had first discovered his mother had given the beach house solely to Trey after she had passed away, it had ticked him off. Not that it had taken much to tick Marshall off during that time of his life. It hadn't been enough to be left at the altar by the woman he'd dated for three years. No. Just when he'd thought things couldn't have gotten worse, his beloved mother passed away after a long battle with breast cancer. Pain stabbed the center of his chest as he thought of his mother. Last week, he'd told his therapist that his mother had been the only woman he'd ever truly trusted with his heart. When he'd said that, it had been a revelation to him, too. Funny how therapy could uncover things a person might not know about themselves. He opened the car door and got out smiling as he remembered the fiasco of his last trip to Southport. If Marshall liked anything, it was a good adventure and a good rumble with the law. Which was funny, because he dedicated his future to law and order. As a Night Stalker helicopter pilot, he had to obey the command structure. Doing so was crucial to the lives of many officers. Lives were on the line every time he flew his missions. Marshall loved to fly helicopters. When he had joined the Army's elite 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, or SOAR, he'd hoped to be one of the recruits chosen to fly Navy SEALs and Delta Force in and out of special operations. And he had indeed been chosen. Fifteen years later, he was an old pro at it. He thought of his last mission before his time off. It had ended with the helicopter burned and crashed and half the crew dead. He sucked in air and tried to push away the feeling that he was suffocating. Breathe, he commanded himself. He closed his eyes. He did not want to have a meltdown. The therapist had told him to focus on breathing, not resisting when the anxiety started. In, hold, two, three, four, and out, two, three, four. He was okay. Really, he was. The front door of the inn opened, and his brother Trey walked out. You're late. Marshall straightened. Seeing his brother was like having a bucket of cold water splashed on his face. It sobered him up. Actually, I'm right on time, he countered. Trey gave him a mischievous grin, and didn't waste any time rushing down the steps and pulling Marshall into a hug. Which was kind of strange. Trey never used to be the hugging type. The change had occurred since he'd married Ava. Marshall lamely let himself be squeezed, not really hugging Trey in return. Trey didn't seem to notice. Don't you know that on time is five minutes late? Marshall grunted. His brother was a recently retired Navy SEAL. You always gotta be right, and cocky too. Trey laughed, moving past him to the car. What, me? Never. You're here, a female voice called. Marshall turned back to the inn and spotted Ava rushing down the stairs. She was gorgeous, of course. She looked better and better every time he saw her. She opened her arms and he fell into them. He and Ava were like siblings. In nearly every one of his beach memories, she was there, with Trey. It felt right that they would end up together. Much like it had a couple of months ago when Kenzie and Tim had finally married. It was like destiny had finally gotten its way with all of them. Things were how they should be. Marshall pulled back. Did I tell you that if this guy ever gives you problems, you can always come to me? He waggled his eyebrows flirtatiously. I'd be happy to step in. Ava rolled her eyes and laughed. Right. Trey punched his shoulder as he sauntered past. Sure you would, cowboy, but that's never going to happen. Marshall had to grin at the threat packed in Trey's punch. He purposefully didn't rub his shoulder. He wouldn't let his brother see that he'd inflicted pain, 
What? Are you threatened, big brother? Trey jogged up the steps. You wish. Ava patted Marshall's arm. Would you mind following me and talking while I pack this stuff? Ah, sure. Ava moved to the back of the SUV and began organizing the bags. Trey may be a Navy SEAL, but I wish he would learn to make things fit properly, she said under her breath. Marshall couldn't ignore the disorder she was working with, and he helped her stack the bags so they weren't a jumbled mess. Oh, that's a good idea, Ava said, nodding when he'd arranged the bags so they fit together like a stack of Tetris pieces. Thank you. No problem. His mind had been trained to solve puzzles, as he had to think of where the best spot would be to land the bird on any given op. There were times when he had to be creative with his landing, and that was something he prided himself on fitting into tight spaces. Ava shut the back door and turned to him. Okay, we have the binder out on the counter in the kitchen for you that will tell you all the major stuff you need to know. The infamous binder. Right. Marshall thought of Kenzie's story. She'd looked over the binder right before Hurricane Sharla had come in and wrecked a bunch of the inn's windows. Ava gave him a look. Read it, please. He surrendered. Fine. She ticked off her fingers. We have two couples and a family here now. We've told them you'll be here this week. Her eyelids fluttered. Marshall felt like she was nervous to leave the inn in his care. It'll be fine. Next week is a pretty light week, too, she hurried on. There will be two families and two couples. Remember, the only thing you need to do is check them in and take them through all the procedures for the pool, hot tub, and access to the beach. Waivers have all been filled out online. But... Make sure they don't use up all the towels at once. You'll have to run some probably by the end of the week. Wash the towels. Check, he nodded. You feed them breakfast. The fridge is stocked and recipes are on the counter. He hadn't really thought about that. He didn't want to tell her that he didn't cook. Perfect. Protein shakes for all. And Kenzie is just down the beach. You know that. So don't be afraid to call her. Kenzie had made it abundantly clear in the last family email that it was everyone's responsibility to help Trey and Ava take care of the inn. After all, Trey had given each of them a percentage of it, even though they hadn't asked for it, as Marshall had wanted to point out. Nevertheless, he was still grounded, so he may as well help. I got it, Ava. Don't worry. Ava pressed a hand to her head. I know I'm forgetting so much. Please check the binder. She pulled in a long breath and then put her hand on the SUV for stability. Marshall was alarmed to see that she looked pale. Are you okay? She put her hand out. I'm fine. I'm fine. He grabbed it. You don't seem fine. He put his other hand beneath her elbow to stabilize her. Let's get you inside. Maybe you can rest a bit. No, Ava straightened. We have to go now. We have to catch our plane in Wilmington. But as she pulled away, she stumbled and reached out for the SUV again. Marshall put his hands beneath her arms. Hold up, little sissy. We're not going anywhere for a sec with you like this. Trey! Don't. Ava turned and leaned into him. Please, he's already worried enough. Don't worry him more. Marshall brought her closer. You okay? For real? Of course, his thoughts immediately went to his mother. This was exactly how his mother looked when she had been diagnosed with cancer. Tired and pale. I'm okay. I think we need to get you to a doctor. His I-have-to-save-you skills took over, and he kept her steady on her feet as he started to pull her to the house. I don't care if Trey is stressed out. He needs to know what's happening. Wait. Marshall. She dug in her heels, preventing them from setting foot on the front stairs. Stop. No. He was about to call for Trey again, or just pick the woman up and haul her into the inn and stick her on the couch. I'm pregnant. Marshall screeched to a stop, both literally and figuratively. He quit trying to push her up the stairs. What? I just get tired, and sometimes the nausea hits me at random times, making me lightheaded. But I'm fine. Her smile widened. You're pregnant. A little thrill went through him, and he gave her a hearty hug. She laughed, then said, Shh, we only found out last week. I'm not even two months yet, and we're waiting to tell everyone. Her lips turned down. 
You know, as you get older, you're more high risk. And I don't want to tell Micah before he goes to be with his dad all summer. He worries about me. Marshall let her go. But he couldn't let go of his happiness so easily. That's so great. Wow. A baby. Trey would have a kid. Not that Micah wasn't his kid, but Marshall was really thrilled that Trey was having this experience. Trey rushed out of the house just then. He was holding another bag as he plowed down the steps. Were you bellowing at me, bro? He rolled his eyes at Marshall in annoyance and kept walking to the SUV. Micah, we have to get on the road. Unable to stop himself, Marshall barreled at him, plowing into his shoulder as he opened the SUV. You dog! Trey took the hit and deflected it, shoving the bag in the back. He gave Marshall a stern look. Trey? Ava said softly. Their eyes met, and Trey seemed to deflate. Marshall had always been baffled at the way Trey and Ava seemed to talk, without saying anything. A huge, satisfied grin filled Trey's face. She told you. Marshall took this chance to bear hug him. Trey laughed and hugged him back. I can't believe it, Marshall said, releasing him. Trey put his dukes up and play punched him. Who knew I'd ever be in charge of one of those little humans? Marshall laughed and did the same, falling right into the little play punch fight he and Trey had worked out years ago in order to distract anyone they wanted to mess with. There were lots of families that would come to the beach for the first time, and sometimes he and his brothers would stage fights for the crowds and then walk away laughing. I'll be right back, Ava called out. He and Trey kept circling each other and play punching. You're gonna be a dad, Marshall said, trying to process this. Wow. Trey shook his head. I know, right? Trey gave him a right hook, and Marshall dodged and pretended to sweep the legs. Trey jumped and both of them chuckled. We still got it. Marshall bumped Trey's knuckles with his own. Yeah, we do. Trey put his arm around Marshall. It's weird. Marshall beamed with pride. It's great. You seem so settled and happy. Whoever would have thought that my big bro would be, he gestured to the inn, so domesticated. Trey grunted. You make me sound like a dog. Maybe a wolf. Is that better? A pet wolf? That earned him an elbow to the ribs, which only made him laugh more. Life catches up to you, old man. Marshall didn't argue. I know. Believe me, I'm feeling it. He'd told Trey about the incident that had left him grounded. Trey understood. He also had his fair share of battle wounds. Trey jerked his head to face him. The look in his eyes told Marshall that he was assessing him. You good? That was code for, you're not going to have a freak out on me, are you? Because I'm leaving with my pregnant wife and son on vacay, and I don't have time for this? You kidding? Marshall pounded his chest. I was born good. Trey hesitated, his face turning serious. You know, I was thinking that if you ever do want to settle down, you might come home. You know Cat is back and I don't think she's dating anyone. Every part of him tensed. Why would I care if she was dating anyone? Trey held up a hand. Chill, okay? I just know that once upon a time, you were best friends. Marshall's heart pounded. It was against bro code to talk about things like past women and settling down. Well, that was then. This is now. Plus, this isn't my home. Hey, I'm just saying that I wouldn't mind having a little brother here to boss around and stuff. Marshall relaxed. Thanks, but the day I don't want to fly is the day you can just put me in the ground. He made a motion like he was firing a gun into the ground. Pine box is fine with me. Trey grunted and looked away. Marshall knew he understood. Seals and night stalkers and special forces would say that to each other. They'd rather be working and doing than stopping. The hardest part was when they weren't spun up. They had endless hours with nothing to take their minds off of the things that they'd seen, the things that they'd done, and the ghosts that haunted them. Trey began walking to the garage. Come with me. I've got something for you. Marshall followed. Well, dang straight he'd follow. When Trey said to come, all of his siblings followed without arguing. At least, without too much argument. 
That was how it had always been. Except for Kenzie. He grinned, thinking of how good it would be to see her. She came and went when she wanted to, no matter if Trey was calling the shots or not. Somehow, those two worked it out. The garage door was open on one side of the two-car garage. The farthest side went two cars deep. Trey moved over to the back of the garage. I thought you might like this. There was a black tarp over something. Trey yanked it back, revealing a red Harley in pristine shape. What? Marshall couldn't believe it. He pulled the rest of the tarp off to uncover another motorcycle standing beside it. A very broken-down motorcycle. He paused. What? Which one am I supposed to be looking at? Trey reached into his pocket and pulled out a ring of keys, flinging them at Marshall. Both. They're both yours. One to ride and one to keep you occupied. If Santa Claus himself had descended out of the North Pole and dropped the bikes in the garage, Marshall wouldn't have been more surprised. He stared down at the red Harley, running his hand lightly over the polished leather and shiny silver. Wow. You like it? Marshall was a bit overwhelmed with the gift. Uh, yeah, I like it. This is too much. No. Trey waved a hand in dismissal. Ava and I wanted to do it. Marshall didn't know what to say. Trey moved to the pile of junk next to it. You see, Ava suggested a new bike, but I suggested an old bike. He clapped a hand down on Marshall's shoulder. Give you some fun. It was true. Marshall yearned to pick up tools and begin working. Well, after he rode the new one, of course. Emotion stuck in the back of his throat. Thanks. Trey nodded. You bet. Marshall turned his attention to the bike that needed work, feeling purpose flow through him. This will be fun. <laughs> Only to you, Trey said with a grunt. Marshall crouched and began to take mental notes. The fuel gauge would need to be replaced. The brakes needed new brake pads. The Remember when you and Kat would spend hours in this garage while you worked on that old bike of yours? Again, her name caught him off guard. He stood, unsure how to handle his brother's question. She told Ava you looked good last time she saw you. Marshall swallowed hard. He and Kat had sat in jail with the rest of his siblings and the beach crew, and he'd found himself right next to the woman. It had been strange. The girl had been his best friend for a long time, but it had been his desire to be more than friends with her that had ruined their friendship so long ago. Oh. He didn't know what to say. Her husband, the guy she'd picked over him, had passed away while serving last year. You should reach out to her. Why would I do that? No reason, Trey smiled brightly. You and her? You two were together all the time when we were here, and... That was a long time ago, Marshall said quickly, unnerved by the way Trey was looking at him. I know. Trey rolled his eyes and sucked in a long breath. Never mind. Yeah. Marshall wasn't going to do this with Trey. Hadn't he talked enough about Cat in his therapy sessions recently? Which had been weird. He still didn't know what to think about the fact that he was still angry about something that had happened back then. The two men stood staring awkwardly at each other. Uncle Marshall! Micah called out, rushing toward him. Marshall had been surprised by how easy it had been to accept and love this kid. He hugged Micah, then ruffled his hair. I think you're two inches taller than the last time I saw you. It had been at Kenzie and Tim's wedding a couple of months ago. Micah pointed to Marshall's arm. I think your bicep is two inches bigger than the last time I saw you. How do you do that? He scrunched up his face. No matter what I do, I can't get definition. It didn't hurt Marshall's feelings to have the kid hero worship him a bit. He managed to keep his next thought to himself. Micah's biological father, Charles, had always been a wimp. What can I say? It's the roids. Stop, Trey said, laughing, moving back to the front of the house. Don't kid about stuff like that. Marshall and Micah followed, both laughing. You do know I'm kidding, right? Right, Uncle Marshall, Micah said. You have to do drug tests all the time. You couldn't be on steroids. Marshall pointed at him. Not on the roids. Just good living, I guess. 
plus crazy amounts of protein and crazy amounts of working out, but who was counting all of that? Trey nudged Marshall's shoulder and opened the passenger door for Ava. Roids, he muttered, shaking his head. Can we be an example for him? Marshall grinned at his big brother. Trey had softened since the hurricane, when Marshall and his brothers had shown up and taken care of business around the inn. The whole retirement and marriage thing had contributed to that too. And now, fatherhood was being added to the mix. I'll be a good example while you're gone, okay? Trey grunted. Better be. Marshall laughed. You guys have fun, and don't worry about anything. I got it all covered. Thank you so much, Ava said. Trey shut her door, then turned to Marshall and patted his shoulder. Thanks. No problem. It was stupid, but Marshall had always longed for his brother's approval, something he hadn't realized all these years. Micah got in the vehicle. See ya, Uncle Marshall. Don't break my surfboard. Oh, I'm breaking it. I'm going to show it how to really surf. Micah laughed and shut the door, waving. Trey got in, and then they were backing out. Marshall watched them go feeling something akin to a father staying behind while the kids went and played. Well, not really that. At least, not his own father. He had passed when Marsha was 15. His father had been a SEAL, too, which had definitely been the catalyst that had gotten all of the brothers to serve in the military. Marshall didn't want to think about his father. Slowly, he moved to his rental car and opened the trunk. All he had was a duffel bag. He pulled it out, and then walked up the stairs and into the inn. The place was pristine. Every part of it looked polished and scrubbed. Trey treated it like he would if he were a captain of a ship. Marshall moved up the long staircase to the second floor, heading straight to his room, the Night Stalker room. He grinned at the plaque on the wall next to the room with his face on it and a little bio about him. Even though he would never admit it, he liked how Ava had given each of them their own room and would only rent it out if they were full, which wasn't often, Trey had confided. Neither he nor Ava liked to rent out the siblings' rooms. Marshall tossed his bag on the bed and sorted his pants and shirts into a pair of drawers. The rest was emptied into a miscellaneous drawer, and he put his bag in the closet. That was done. He left and inspected the rest of the second and third floors. He glanced in on the three rooms that the family and two other couples were occupying. Next to each door was a small chalkboard boasting the name of the family staying there. The Andersons, the Blackstones, the Carvers. Everything seemed to be in order. He moved downstairs and inspected rooms on the east side of the house, then moved through the smaller bedroom, which looked magical. Sure, he would never say the word magical out loud, but as he stared up at the skylight, he noted that he wanted to come here when it was dark, so he could see the moonlight cresting over the glittering glass skylight. Ava had restored a sense of fun to the home. Marshall had thought they'd all lost that when their mother passed. He paused as he shut the door. A feeling of gratitude swept over him. This would be okay. Maybe he wouldn't call this place home, as Trey wanted him to. And maybe he loved the open road, and the thrill of landing in a war zone, but this inn had a definite place inside his heart. He sauntered down the hallway and into the kitchen and living room. He peeked into his father's old office. Satisfied, he shut the door and then moved back to the kitchen, where he spotted the precious binder on the counter. He flipped it open and thumbed through the laminated pages, glancing at the instructions. Had the laminating idea been Trey's or Ava's? Hmm. It was a toss-up. They were both maniacal when it came to the inn, and he supposed that was good. They had a morning list, and a breakfast list, and a closing-it-up list, and a check-the-website list. There was also a list for the pool, and the hot tub, and how to make sure the chemicals were in balance, and what to use, and there were lists for how to use the washer, and what to do if there were certain concerns from guests. Ish, who knew? Part of him was grateful that he hadn't inherited the place. There was a lot to know to keep it running. But he didn't worry, no. His sister was right down the way, and she would probably be over soon to mother hen him. That's what she was good at, after all, though he wouldn't start a fight with Kenzie tonight. He grinned and took a cold water bottle from the fridge, twisting the top off and guzzling it. 
The side door to the pool opened. You're here. Kenzie rushed toward him, wearing a summer dress. He opened his arms, and she was instantly in them, clinging to him. It was silly, but Kenzie had always been so affectionate with all of her brothers. In some stupid, psychoanalyzed way, he liked that about her. He'd always wanted someone warm to be around. <sighs> his ex had been the least warm person he'd ever known, never wanting any kind of PDA. He pushed his ex out of his mind. Thank you for coming, Kenzie said when they broke apart. I've missed you. He grinned at his newly married sister. She and Tim had looked so happy at their wedding. No, you don't. You're too busy honeymooning with Tim. She laughed and smacked his shoulder, a blush washing over her. Shut it. He laughed. His sister had always been so prim and proper. Hey, I think it's great. Make me a little nephew. Now her cheeks really caught on fire. Did Tim tell you? Stopped short. Marshall gave her a sweeping glance, and his instincts told him what was going on. No. What? There was no way his brother and his sister were pregnant. She covered her face, then burst into a huge smile. What? He was stunned. He swept her up, and they hugged again. Are you serious? Who knew? She laughed. His sister was radiant and more beautiful right now than he had ever remembered her being. I didn't think we could because Jeff and I had such problems, so we haven't been doing anything to prevent it, and... She smiled again, tearing up, and... Voila! It happened on its own. Wow! She sucked in a long breath and nodded. I'm only barely two months. Same as Ava. Her eyes became misty with tears. She smiled. She told you? He nodded. Kenzie laughed. I know. I'm so happy for them, too. Yeah. Kenzie shook her head. It's so weird that it just happened like this. Out of the blue. Marshall bit his tongue, cutting off his knee-jerk response of pointing out that it wasn't like a stork would be dropping them off. They knew how this process had happened, but he didn't want to upset how happy she was. She beamed at him. I'm so glad you're home. That word again. Home. He didn't really like being in the same sentence as that word. I'm here for a visit. To take care of this place. It dawned on him now why Trey had been so insistent that Kenzie couldn't be the one to be in charge. This is why Trey insisted that I come and you couldn't handle it. A guilty expression washed over her face. Yep, she said, shrugging. Who knew that my husband and my brother would be so protective and that I'd be okay with it? Well, I'm glad I could help. She cocked an eyebrow at him. How long are you grounded for? A topic he didn't want to discuss. Nervous energy punched at his gut, and he tried to push it away. Another two weeks, or... It just depends on how the psych test went. A light hand rested on his shoulder. You okay? He shrugged the hand off and moved to pick up the binder. He didn't want to discuss that. Fine, thanks. He put the binder by the counter, out of the way. Okay, tell me what I need to know for when the guests get back. Kenzie went through everything. We have a college kid that watches the desk during the day, in case someone comes to the door or the phone rings. Vince makes sure that only the guests are coming and going during the day. That job can be tedious. Oh, good. Marshall hadn't really thought about the details. Vince comes over at 10 and leaves around 7. He'll also help if the guests need something for the pool or the beach. He just sits at the front desk by the door, but sometimes he locks the door and sits in the main kitchen area. Okay. Marshall didn't love the idea of this dude being there all the time, but he also didn't want to be on call every second. Sounds good. And the nighttime ritual is that you put on a movie at 8 and pop popcorn and put out drinks. The guests can view the movie or not. Sometimes they just want to chit-chat. Chit-chat wasn't his thing, but he nodded. Got it. It's not hard. And if you want to go out one night, Tim and I don't mind coming down and hanging out. She smiled at him. But I am tired a lot more, and Tim insists that I rest a lot. 
I would agree. You rest. I'll be good. Okay, Kenzie said, heading for the back door. I'm going to walk home and get dinner going. Call me if you need anything. You bet. She opened the door, then turned back to him. Marshall? Yep. You're going to be the best uncle ever. He grinned. Part of him was delighted that she'd said that, as her opinion meant a lot to him. But there was this other feeling, this nagging feeling. Would he only ever be an uncle? Was he okay with that? He realized he couldn't sit around all night. Ken's, hold up. She was about to shut the door, but she paused. Yeah? Would you and Tim be able to come down after you eat? I don't know if you know, but Trey got me a new bike. She laughed. Yes, it's so cool. You want to go for a ride tonight? Yes, the open road. That was what he needed. If that's okay, we'll be back around seven. Sounds perfect. Chapter 2 Cat Was Tired Stan, if you could just put the rest of the food away, I'll finish cleaning up the kitchen. Margie almost has the bakery done, and we can be out of here by nine. No problem. Stan went right to work, finishing the deli food items that needed to be put away. Stan was a good assistant manager of the deli. Cat had never imagined her life would look like this. Well, not exactly like this, anyway. It had been her dream to open a bakery in Southport after her husband passed away almost a year ago. Looking back, she wasn't sure if that had been the right decision. Her place of business had turned into not just a bakery, but also the town deli. There had been a need to fill, and she had been able to fill it. But on a day like today, with summer just starting and a bunch of tourists in town, it felt overwhelming. The store door opened, and she waved in her parents, who were visiting for the week, and her ten-year-old son, Cade. Come in, come in. Are you hungry? If she was honest with herself, she didn't want to feed another person. But her parents had arrived in Southport a few days ago, and they had been spending time with her and Cade. More time with Cade, since he was off for the summer. Tomorrow they were taking Cade to Florida, where they lived. But of course she would cook for her family. Her father gave her a dismissive gesture. Oh no, baby. We got plenty to eat on the boardwalk. We just came to check in on you. Her son moved to her side and gently leaned into her. Are you almost done, Mom? Cade had admitted to her that he was nervous to be away from her for a week. She could sense that he needed some time with her. Almost, sweetie. Stan moved back into the kitchen. You take off. I'll finish this. And I'll check with Margie to make sure the bakery gets cleaned up. He grinned at her. Stan had been a godsend the past year as she had opened up this bakery in Delhi. The man was in his late forties, and he had lost a wife to cancer some years ago. He was also a retired Marine. He sympathized with her since she'd lost her husband. She wouldn't have been able to bite off so much if Stan had not helped her at every turn. Normally, she would refuse his help. Are you sure? I'm sure. Stan moved his arms and gestured for them to leave. He pointed to her purse, then took Kate into a little hug. We're going to miss you around here, but have fun in Florida. Cade adored Stan. Thank you. I'll miss you, too. Cade was emotionally fragile. Cat could see it in his face, though he was trying to hide it. So she agreed to do what she usually never did. Normally, if her parents weren't in town, she would have him do his homework while she finished up. Or he would go to karate down the street. Or he would... Worst case scenario, play video games in her office while she finished. And there were lots of times Cade actually helped with closing. She sometimes gave him little chores, and he did them. He was happy to help, constantly asking her what he could do. But she tried not to take away his childhood. Her mind flashed back to Cade's father, to the funeral, and to the way her son had squeezed her hand so tightly and asked, Who will be my dad now? She pushed those thoughts away. Let's go. Later that night, Cat put Cade to bed, singing him a song and holding him a little bit longer than normal. It was silly that she felt a little bit vulnerable and afraid to let him go. Cade was a comfort to her. As they walked out of the deli, 
Her father put his arm around her shoulders. We will take good care of him. Her mother smiled at her. Yes, we will. Cat nodded. She knew they would. They were the best people in the world. Her father hugged her to him. Remember, it's just a week. Then you're going to join us, right? Right. She'd worked it out with Stan and Margie that they would take over while she went to Florida. It was overwhelming to think about being gone. On a broader scale, it was overwhelming to think about her future at all. Usually, she focused on dealing with that day or that week, making sure she had enough food going into the week and the vendors were in place. Granted, she often had to book out food and vendors a month at a time. But as for her personal life and Cade, she took it one day at a time. Later that evening, as Kat made sure all was in order for Cade to leave, her mother put her hand on Kat's shoulder. You work too hard, sweetie. I know you don't like it when we talk about this, but why don't you move to Florida? You can live close by. Dad and I can help you get a little place. We will help you figure out a job, and we will definitely help with Cade. The trouble was that Kat didn't want to be that woman, a woman who couldn't do it by herself and who always needed her mom and dad. She hated the idea. She didn't need anyone's pity. No, I'm fine. Kat opened Cade's travel bag and rummaged through it, making sure he had a swimsuit, a bunch of shorts, a bunch of t-shirts, and extra underwear. Ah, <sighs> he forgot his swim shirt. She moved to his room and cracked the door open. Cade was already asleep. Quietly, she walked inside and opened his drawer and got the swimsuit shirt. As she was leaving, she hesitated at the door and suddenly stared at Cade, feeling overwhelming gratitude for this boy. Out of the corner of her eye, she caught a glimpse of a framed picture on the shelf by the door. It was a picture of her husband, J.D., in his uniform. He had just gotten back from a deployment, and they had met him at the airport. He had his arm around her and the other arm around Cade. All of them were smiling. Resentment boiled within her. The smile on her face had in no way reflected her inner state of emotions. She'd been living a nightmare. She shivered. That same day, she'd made the decision that had led to J.D.'s death. No, she couldn't think about that. She sucked in a long breath and blinked away the sudden moisture in her eyes. The closer she got to the anniversary of her husband's death, the more she thought about everything that had happened between them. She hated it. She walked out of Cade's room and put the swim shirt in his bag, directing her thoughts back to how much she loved her son. Cat, are you still getting those weird things from someone? Her father wore a look of concern. It was so stupid. Cat hated even talking about how she sometimes found a batch of cookies left randomly on her porch. And the notes were the most ominous. Enjoy the sunshine somewhere else. What did that even mean? I got one a couple of days ago when I left the bakery. She turned away from her parents and moved to open the sliding door that led from the kitchen out to the deck. Her parents followed her onto the deck and into the cooler air. Why didn't you tell us? her father said, leaning on the rail next to her. Her mother approached her from the other side. Cat, every time you get something like that, you need to call Tim and file a report. You need to document this stalking. When we do figure out who is doing this to you, then you can get a restraining order. Feeling extra tired and not wanting to deal with this, she glowered at her mother. It's not a big deal. It's probably just a silly crush or something. It could be a big deal, her father said softly. She wasn't in the mood to be parented. Don't treat me like a child. I have talked to Tim about the situation. I can handle it. Her mother sighed and crossed her arms. Cat, she said, her tone low, mimicking the same tiredness in Cat's voice. We know you can handle it. I know you can handle it. Sweetie her father said, with a similar long-suffering patience. We just want you safe. We care about you and Cade. Just because we voice concern doesn't mean we don't see how much hard work you put into everything. All of this is you. He gestured around at her little rental house that she had fixed up. You've painted 
and you've fixed so many things in this house. You've made this place really nice and a great home for Cade. Not to mention you've opened a deli and a bakery. That's impressive. Very impressive, her mother agreed. We just want you and Cade safe. Cat wanted that too. Her son's safety nagged at her, like a little pebble in her shoe. The thought was always there, wearing her down until the skin was gone and it was just raw. I know. She backed down and forced a smile. I will talk to Tim again tomorrow. I do appreciate you guys so much. You have been the best parents. And I know Kate is going to have such a good time with you guys. He's not going to want to come home. Her voice cracked at the end of the sentence, revealing that her real worry was about letting him go. Her parents were more equipped to deal with Cade than she was. Of course, her dad was retired, and both he and her mother were amazing. As if sensing how fragile she was, her parents held out their arms. Group hug, her father said, and he and her mother stepped in close. This was a familiar habit of theirs, largely because Kat was an only child, an adopted child. When her parents had adopted her at the age of nine, they'd started the habit of having a group hug every night. Kat sucked in a long breath. It would be okay. Cade would go, and he would have fun. Then she would join them and get a little break. Well, she wouldn't really call it a break. When she was at her parents' house, she started feeling more like a child and less like herself. But she would be grateful for the time away. Thank you. Her mother pulled back and searched her face. Sweetie, do you think it's time to start dating again? The question took her by surprise. Why would you say that? I just want you happy. Cat steeled her nerves. I don't want to date. I don't want to risk bringing someone into Kate's life who won't be good for him. Reluctantly, her mother nodded. Her father sighed and said, I hear Marshall will be in town the next couple of weeks. I ran into Kenzie yesterday. Irritation pulsed through her. Why would that matter? I don't know. Her parents had always liked Marshall. Cat and Marshall had been best friends, and he'd spent a lot of time at their house. She thought of what she'd overheard her father say to her mother in the reception line at her wedding. I always thought it would be Marshall. Cat stepped away from them. I'm going to head to bed. The next day, Cat cleaned up after the dinner rush. Stan worked at her side in relaxed silence, which was another thing she valued about him. He didn't say much but she never felt uncomfortable around him. If he talked of anything, it was about fishing. Pastor Henry handed over his card, taking the bag of takeout in exchange. How are you doing, Cat? She smiled at the pastor. He was Tim's uncle, the one who had raised him since he was young. He was a good man. I'm good. How is Lily? A soft smile filled his face. She's good. Cat handed back his card. That's good. The pastor hesitated. I'm just feeling like I should tell you that it's time to trust again. What do you mean? The man was notorious for his feelings, and it kind of freaked her out. The pastor smiled at her. Have faith and remember something. Cat swallowed hard. Whatever he was about to say, she had a feeling it would be important. Okay. When it seems like there's no way to make something happen, God makes a way. A chill swept down her spine. He nodded and walked toward the door. Good night, Cat. Good night. She watched the pastor walk away, a bit mystified. Margie walked in, taking off her apron and hanging it on the hook. Stan and I have a proposition for you. This caught Cat's attention and she glanced at Stan and then back to Margie. How come I'm sensing a coup? Stan grunted. I don't think any of us want to have a power grab. He smiled at her as he added, especially with Lucy's event coming next week. I think Lucy is the one running a coup on us. Cat and Margie laughed. It was true. Lucy had been over that afternoon right before the dinner rush. She had brought binders and assignment lists and she had gone over exactly what she wanted for her gallery event. 
While Kat was grateful for Lucy's never-ending business when it came to catering, she was also exhausted by it all. Kat had told herself just that afternoon that it was okay, but she was just burned out. She was worried about Cade leaving. She was frazzled. Tomorrow would be better. She would be able to think about everything, and it would all work out. Dang, she sounded like Scarlet in Gone with the Wind. Margie leaned against the counter and looked pointedly at Cat. Are you ready to listen? Cat ignored the jolt of nerves in the lower part of her gut. Margie had a serious look on her face. I'm listening. Stan moved to Margie's side, resting his elbows on the counter and leaning in. We've made a decision. Margie glanced at Stan and laughed. You need a real vacation. What? Margie placed her hand on Stan's shoulder. Stan winced and pulled back. Cat looked between the two of them. Margie seemed like she was trying a bit too hard lately to get Stan's attention. What do you mean vacation? Cat asked. Are you talking about watching the bakery and deli next week while I'm in Florida? No, Margie said, swinging back to face her. We want you to take this week off, too. Get some alone time. I have no idea what you're talking about. Stan pulled some keys out of his pocket and held them out to her. We made an executive decision that you need to take the next two weeks off. Shocked, she stared at the keys. I can't do that. Margie nodded. Again, she smiled at Stan. Yes, you can. We got this. He met eyes with Margie, then plastered on a fake smile and turned back to Cat. She would have laughed at the way Stan was enduring Margie's touch if she hadn't been distracted by what they were telling her. Margie pointed to the keys. We want you to drive to Stan's cabin. It's past Pirate's Cove and a little farther into the mountains. Margie glanced at Stan. Right? Right. It's just a one-bedroom cabin. It's been in my family for a long time. It's the perfect place to get away. His face lit up. There's a little pond. I have fishing poles there if you want to use them. Her mind raced. I can't. Margie nodded to the counter by the deli door. We can do two weeks. Yes, we can, Stan agreed. Your mother packed a bag of clothes and toiletries for you. It has a couple of things you're going to need. I got you some groceries, Stan added, gesturing to two bags of supplies that Kat hadn't even noticed before. They sat by the back door. We will take care of this place, Margie smiled at Stan. Right? Right. I couldn't, Kat said with less conviction. You can, Margie insisted. We'll have a great time. Stan didn't seem as enthused as Margie was to spend time together. Margie was single and a bit older than Kat. She had suffered from some health issues early on in her life, and she had remained living with her parents in Southport for many years. Since she had started working for Kat a few months ago, her health had improved greatly. It will help you to see how I can handle everything, Margie said, and you'll still be close enough to come back if you need to. It's like a test run before you're all the way in Florida. But don't come back, Stan said, his face stern. We've got this. I'll help Margie if she needs it. You will, Margie gazed at him as if he'd just offered to exchange his own life for hers. This all felt so unnerving. I'm not sure. Margie beamed at Cat, and then she put her hands together and clapped. We have been so excited to give you this gift. We've been talking about it and planning it, and we even figured out a way to start working on the foods needed for Lucy's event next week. Let's do this. Together. She turned and once again smiled at Stan. Stan kept his eyes on Cat. Let's do this for you. We want to. And I really think the week up at the cabin, time to clear your head, might be just the thing you need. The sincerity in his eyes convinced her. She felt herself tear up. You guys, I can't believe this. Believe it, Margie said softly, reaching again for Stan. Stan took a step away from her. Margie frowned, but turned back to Cat. Plus, we know what day is coming, and we want you to have some time. That got her attention. She hadn't talked about J.D.'s death anniversary. Margie put a hand to the side of her mouth. It was what she did when she was trying not to tell a secret. 
Cade told us that Thursday will be the day his father was buried. Her emotions felt raw, and she blinked and looked at the door and the supplies. It would be a relief to get out of here, get away from this town and everyone who knew everything about her. Well, I guess I'll take you up on the offer. Oh my gosh, you're going to let us do it for you? Kat's mouth was dry and her heart raced, but part of her wanted the freedom they were offering her. She did need to get out for a bit. Kat picked up the luggage. I'm going to do it. Margie squealed and picked up a grocery bag. Stan picked up the other. We'll walk you out. They all walked to Kat's car, a blue 1985 Toyota Corolla. It was old, but it was reliable. She couldn't believe she was actually doing this, just up and leaving without responsibilities. It was weird. She tossed her bag into the trunk, and Margie and Stan put the groceries inside. With that taken care of, Kat closed the trunk and turned back to her friends. Margie looked more than satisfied with herself. She laughed and then clapped and did another little squeal. You have so much fun. At this point, Stan rolled his eyes and then gave Kat a look that most people wouldn't have caught if they didn't know Stan. She couldn't help a tiny smile. She knew the sacrifice that this would be to keep everything running and to deal with Margie. Thank you. Stan nodded and pointed to the car door. Let me open it for you. Oh my gosh. Kat's heart skipped a beat when she saw a piece of paper on her windshield. Not just any paper. It was the same type of paper that was always left on her windshield from whoever was stalking her. Oh no. Margie rushed to the windshield and tugged the paper out, skimming over it. Of course the stupid stalker has to show up at a happy time like this. Kat's mouth went dry. What does it say? Margie gave them both a blank look and then bit her bottom lip. This was not good. Stan took the note gently from Margie's fingers. His face soured. It says that they hope you have a fun week without your son. Maybe you should leave Southport. Kat wanted to curse. She wanted to cry. She wanted to yell. And she wanted to do all of these things at the same time. How would they even know you were leaving? Margie burst out. Dang it. Kat whipped her phone out of her pocket and did the exact thing she had promised her parents she would do in a situation like this. She turned away from them. I'm calling the sheriff. Tim answered on the second ring. What's up, Kat? She explained about the note and what it said. Well, if there's not anyone who saw anything, all we can do is file the report and wait. Come down to the station and we'll go over everything. No, she said, growing annoyed that he wanted her to come waste precious time at the station. Sorry, I just... Stan and Margie are going to watch the shop while I get away for a few days. Well, Tim said, letting out a sigh, I wish there was more we could do besides file a report, but there's not. You might install cameras outside your shop so we can get an idea of who is doing this. She scrubbed a hand over her face. Tim, I'm making a profit. But if I'm not careful, I won't be. I don't have a budget for that. I can talk to Kenzie. We could probably loan you some money. No. She would not do that. Or I could talk to my uncle. I'm sure the church could donate something. Heavens no. She braced herself, imagining what Pastor Henry would put together if he knew the situation. She'd have the whole town raising money to catch her stalker. Just please file the report. When I get back, I'll stop in before I go to Florida. Okay. Be safe. Thanks. She hung up the phone and turned back to Stan and Margie. The looks on their faces betrayed their concern. I can't put you guys in danger. I can't go. Margie frowned. He's not stalking us. Our lives aren't in danger. Stan glowered at Margie, then turned to Kat. Maybe it would be better if you got out of town for a bit. Maybe things will settle. That was true. Kat's head spun as she thought about everything. But he seemed to know I was leaving. Does he know where I'll be? Margie snapped her fingers. Whoever it is probably just heard me and Stan talking about giving you a vacation. We've been putting together how we would convince you to take this week off. She tapped her head. But I don't know who it could be. Stan frowned. We really haven't paid much attention who we were talking in front of, besides you and Cade. I wonder if Margie's right, 
Someone overheard us. Margie pointed to the paper. Clearly they know where you work and live. So, I think you should go. Stan pulled out his credit card. Actually, why don't you go to a different town? Maybe go into Wilmington and get a hotel for a couple of days. That way no one will know where you're going to be. I don't know. Kat rankled, knowing that her confusion and slight fear was obvious to them. She would never use his money. No, I'm just going to go home. No, Margie smacked the car. You can't. We are ready to give you the week off. If you're home, you'll work, and you know it. You deserve time to yourself. Cat couldn't help but smile at Margie's determination. Stan shoved his card at her. Please, just go. Consider it the gift you deserve for saving me from retirement oblivion. She tried to push the card back. No, I couldn't use your money. Yes, you could. Stan put it in her purse. You can pay me back later. Go and have fun. Her mind raced. Could she do that? Just go somewhere? She pulled the keys out of her pocket. Then here's your cabin keys. No, keep those too. Maybe you'll bounce between places. Margie nodded. Yes, and we'll tell everyone we're not sure where you're at. Her eyebrows waggled. Then the stalker won't know where you are. She liked the idea of no one knowing where she would be. Oh, okay. Stan gestured to the car. Go, have fun, don't worry about anything. He winked at her, especially Margie. Margie let out a light laugh, then smacked his shoulder. Stop, Stan. But Kat could tell that Margie liked it. Stan rolled his eyes at her. They all laughed. Fine, Kat said, seizing the sudden feeling of freedom. It was something she hadn't felt in a long time. I'll do it. She got into the car. Margie cheered again. Stan held the door long enough to tell Kat, Be safe! Chapter 3 Marshall relaxed as he drove the pristine Harley through the streets of Southport. He stopped at a gas station and got himself an energy drink. Most of the time, he had a protein shake as a meal, but there had been no time and he needed a pick-me-up. Granted, it probably wasn't the best for him, but what could he say? There weren't many occasions for him to get a proper meal by himself. When he had been with Sarah, she didn't cook much either. She was a school teacher. They ate out quite a bit when he wasn't deployed. It didn't bother him much. He cooked a lot of eggs. He had a lot of nuts. The most he did in the evenings was grill. Steak, chicken, fish. He tried to keep a clean diet. A simple diet. He liked simple. When he got away from simple, it didn't work for him. And hadn't that just proved itself the past year? He'd thought he could have a life with Sarah, but she'd shattered that idea with the vicious words she'd said to him when he'd tracked her down after she left him at the altar. Hearing those words had been like a dagger through the heart. After a couple of months in therapy, he'd discovered that Sarah had taken something that she knew about him and used it against him. He could see that now. Maybe they called it gaslighting. Whatever. All he knew was that she had broken him. But he was recovering. It was in him to rise up again, and that's exactly what he was doing. He pushed thoughts of Sarah away as he focused on the road. He didn't know where he was going, and he found himself on the road to Pirate's Cove. He thought of the last time he'd been in town, about all the shenanigans with Mr. Banks. He was grateful that after six months of intense looking for the treasure, he had seemed to drop the whole thing. Trey and Kenzie had kept the rest of them informed about how Mr. Banks had come to the family and apologized before he left town officially, and he'd given the Stone family the petroglyphs to keep with the rest of the collection. The sun was starting to set. As Marshall stared at the oranges, blues, and yellows that filled the sky, he realized that it felt good to be back here even though he'd been annoyed when Trey and Kenzie brought up the word home. But if he did have to pick a home, maybe it could be here. Maybe. Depending on what the psych eval said, he could be back in action any time. It had been over a month, and he was tired of waiting. Stupid government bureaucracy. 
He needed to get back in his bird and fly. He believed in his country. He believed in serving others. And the recent therapy had actually been good for him. He was fresh and ready. He flashed back to that last mission, the explosion that hit from the front of his helo, the feeling of helplessness as he tried to gain control of the aircraft that was no longer intact. Marshall pushed it all away. As he took a curve in the road, he had almost reached the turnoff for the caves. He spotted a car on the side of the road. It was an old Camry. There appeared to be a woman hunched over, inspecting her engine. He pulled over. Maybe it was stupid of him to help people stranded on the side of the road. Sarah had often told him that it was dangerous to assume people weren't trying to pull something on him. Sarah had been consumed with listening to true crime podcasts. She'd always told him that the easiest way to capture someone was to make them think that they could help you. If someone wanted to capture him, they would be biting off a little more than they could chew. Marshall wouldn't go down without a fight. He turned off his bike. Marshall? He startled as he tried to place the voice. He got off the bike and moved toward the car. He hadn't been expecting anyone to recognize him, but as he got closer, he recognized the woman standing there. Cat? What are you doing here? A surge of chemistry spiked between them. He couldn't help but grin. This night had just gotten a lot more interesting. Sure, Marshall had seen Cat when they had tried to steal the petroglyph and ended up in jail together, but that had been a few months ago. The energy that had passed between them had been off the charts, but it would never lead anywhere. She'd made it clear a long time ago that she wasn't interested. Everything okay? Fine, Cat waved a hand in dismissal. I heard you were coming to town to take care of the inn. You can go. This mystified him. You don't want my help? You quit giving me your help ten years ago, didn't you? Ouch. Why did she act like he had done something wrong? He wanted to fire back, but he focused on the car. What's wrong? I said you can go. Cat had been his white whale. The girl next door he'd been in love with his whole life. The girl who had broken his heart. The fact that she wanted him to leave made him determined to stay. But you need me to stay. Finally, she let out an exasperated breath and gestured to her car. <sighs> it won't work. He flashed back to the day he'd bared his heart to her, and she'd broken it. But crime here, River, it was over ten years ago. He could be mature. He moved to her side and peered down at her smoking engine. What have we got here? She put a hand to her forehead, which was unfortunate, as she had grease on her hands. I have no idea. I've been trying to figure that out, but I honestly don't know cars that well. I don't know what I'm looking for. Marshall checked the fluids. When was the last time you had an oil change and refilled the fluids? I don't know. He turned to face her. What do you mean you don't know? How could people not know when they had oil changes? He kept a little log in his phone on all of his vehicles and their maintenance. She threw up her hands and shook her head. I don't know. It was probably last year. He sputtered out a laugh. You've possibly ruined the engine and, uh, he bent and inspected the radiator. You have a hole in the radiator. He shook his head, thinking of all the times he'd tried to show her how to maintain her car every summer he was visiting. Didn't I always tell you that you should keep a log in your car and write the numbers down? Why do I need a log when they just put a sticker in the window? He grinned at the fire coming off of this woman. Dang, Cat still had it. He'd always liked that she could dish it out as well as she could take it. Clearly you never look at the little sticker in the window. Anger washed over her face, and she pushed him in the chest. Back off, Marshall. The jolt of her pushing him actually sent him into a minor shock. Then his mind threatened to drift off into nostalgia. What were they doing? It had been over ten years since they'd really interacted. We're already fighting, he said, unable to stop a smile tugging at his lips. Just like old times. Her eyes caught his, and then she cracked a smile. It's nothing like old times. 
True, not old times. It was weird. They had slipped into best friend mode after all these years, and then she'd slipped them right out. Cat wagged her finger at him. You always got in my face when you tried to make a point, and I never liked it. He grabbed her and pulled her closer. Attraction hit him like a bolt of lightning. You think you can touch me and not pay a price for that? It was something they used to say to each other if one of them bugged the other one. A nervous buzz swept through him, the same kind of buzz he felt before daring to land in a place that he might not come back from. A tiny smile touched her lips. Then she glared at him. I don't think you can stop me. He wanted to kiss her, which kind of surprised him because he'd tried to erase this woman from his brain a long time ago when she'd full out rejected him. He released her hand and decided to be his mature self. You should have kept up on the oil changes. Cat cursed and turned away from him. Isn't it enough that I have to keep track of the bakery, deli, parent-teacher conferences, haircuts, every event Lucy is doing, Margie's schedule, Stan's schedule, my mom wants to try to book me out to come to Christmas, and those stupid notes? Marshall recognized when someone was spinning out of control. He should recognize it. He'd done it a few months ago. Calm down. She moved back to his side and peered into the engine. So what's wrong with the car? An inkling of worry pulsed through him as he went back through what she'd said. The same kind of worry that he also felt if he shouldn't land somewhere. What notes? Her face went blank. She turned away from him. Nothing. If the stones were good at anything, his mother used to say, it was sniffing out the truth. Why would you mention it then, Cat? What notes were you talking about? Don't, she said shooting him a fierce glare. But her anger only served to incite his own. Don't tell me what to do. A standoff. That was what they were in. And if he knew this woman at all, which part of him doubted that he did anymore, he knew she wasn't the type to back down so easily. Tell me. No. He turned to walk away. Fine. Then good luck with the car. Are you serious? You're going to leave me here. You told me to, she scoffed. I don't believe you. It's not in you to leave me. Well, strike that. You did shut me out. If anything could strike a nerve, it was that. He turned back to her. Shut you out? She stuck her chin up in the air. Yep. Deep, seething rage lit inside him. But he wouldn't let it show. For one thing, it had been over ten years ago. For another, none of it mattered. He smothered it. Tell me about the note. She cringed and pointed to the engine. Tell me what's wrong with my car. Then you'll tell me about this note, he said, making air quotes. Sure, she flashed a smile. And he didn't know whether she was telling the truth or not. He didn't know this cat. Fine, like I said, you have a hole in the radiator. He checked out the specs on the car. Let's see, it's a 1985 Toyota Camry. Yes, he nodded. Was it having problems before today? She ran a hand through her hair. It was pulling to the side and making noises. He frowned. After someone fixes the hole in the radiator, you need to have them flush the whole system. You need to have them check everything, because it's all connected. If debris is in there, it's going to cause other system problems. You've done a number on it. Would it affect the A.C.? Because it hasn't been working. This was ridiculous and irresponsible. What? Why didn't you take it in? For a long time, Cat didn't respond. He didn't know what to say as he thought about her predicament. Tell me about these notes, he said again. Gosh, you don't give up, do you? She ran a hand through her hair and looked nervous. It's so stupid. I have a, for lack of a better word, stalker. He puts random stuff in random places. Today the note said, I hope you have a fun week without your son. Okay, that was serious. All past transgressions aside, this was Cat. His Cat. She was his best friend. Or she had been. You have a stalker? You've told Tim. Yes, Dad. But it's stupid. I mean, harmless. She turned away from him, her hand going to her mouth. 
What other stuff does he do? She always used to bite her nails. He pushed her hand away from her mouth on reflex. Stop. Her eyes widened. I can't believe you just did that. Every part of him felt keyed up. Well, believe it. What else does this stalker do? She threw her hands up. Stupid stuff like, leaves cookies on my porch. Other kinds of notes telling me to have a nice day and crap like that. Weird, he commented. Stupid and weird, she said, biting her nails again. Then her eyes met his, and she shook her head. You no longer have a license to make me stop biting my nails. He had no intention of doing so. He was too busy thinking about what crazy idiot would be doing this. Who do you associate with? She cocked her head to the side. Um, let's see. Every person in Southport? Between the bakery and the deli, I see the whole town quite often. Right. And Tim has no leads? He wants me to install cameras outside of my shops, but I haven't yet. I can do that, he offered without even thinking about it. Consider it done. No, he frowned. Why? You like being stalked? Stop it. She turned away from him. You're not here to solve my problems. She had a point there. He looked into the car, but her son wasn't there. Where's the little man? She jerked as if realizing her son wasn't there. Oh, my parents were in town this week. Kate is out of school for the summer, so they took him back to Florida with them to spend two weeks. Something began to brew in Marshall's mind that he hadn't really been anticipating. She didn't have her son here, and he was going to be in Southport for two weeks as well. What cabin were you headed to? She stared at the car, absently talking to him. None, now. I was going to take the week off to have time to myself. She cursed again and pulled out her phone, staring at it. But now I may as well just stay and work. Who knows what this will cost me? Was she seeing someone? Well, do you have AAA? Who is the place in town now that tows vehicles? He didn't want to ask the direct question about her dating life. Gah, he didn't want to even be in this situation. No, she sighed. I'll look up Jed's number. Jed's towing? The guy was old. Marshall remembered the shop in town. She tapped on her phone. I don't even have service. She moved to the back of the car, holding her phone up. Do you have service out here? He tugged his phone out of his pocket and checked. There were no bars. No. Dang it. She stomped her foot. Her hand went to her head and covered her face like she was in pain. I can't afford this right now. I... She turned away from him. And then she made a little noise. She was crying. No, he wasn't good with tears. Put a gun in his face. Make him drop the bird into dangerous territory. Or have him rush out and pull wounded soldiers onto his bird? No problem. But dealing with tears from a woman? A woman he might not know anymore but still cared for? That would be less than easy. Hey, it's okay. He moved next to her, putting a gentle hand on her shoulder. It's all right. We'll figure this out. She froze still dabbing at her eyes. This isn't your problem. I can't believe I'm crying. She shrugged out of his grasp. I can't even believe you're here. You, of all people. She clearly felt this attraction, too. He thought again how beautiful she was. Her long, blonde hair. Her green, piercing eyes. This felt like all those years ago, when they had been best friends. He found himself saying the words before he could even process them. I could give you a tow. I'll get Trey's truck and we'll come back. She hesitated, then said, Sorry, Marshall. I don't want your help. This is just... <sighs> Marshall took pause. Sarah had told him that he had a savior complex. That was another reason she hadn't wanted to marry him. He tried to help everyone too much. It wasn't just that he helped people stranded on the side of the road. What can I do, Cat? He used to call her Kitty Cat, but he didn't think she would like the memory. Don't baby me, Marshall. He grinned at her, happy that she had picked up on the fact that he was trying to be nice. Are you okay? She sucked in a long breath and then blew it out. Yeah, I'm okay. Sorry. I'm just having a bit of a meltdown. I hate it when I can't control my emotions, which has seemed like a lot this last year. 
she remarked with a sigh. I guess the blessing in all of this is that Kate isn't here to witness his mother falling apart. It's fine. Everyone has bad days. Admittedly, in his case, it was more like he had bad months. No, it's not fine. It was stupid, but he couldn't stop wondering who she was going to meet this week without her son. Do you need to call this guy and tell him you've had a hiccup? She turned to face him. What? Jed? I don't have service. He gestured to her. The guy you're going to meet at this cabin you're going to. Her lips pursed. No. Okay. Clearly, she didn't want to talk about said guy. It had just gotten completely awkward. She sighed. Not that it's any of your business, but I was going by myself. The cabin belongs to Stan Henley. I don't know if you know him. Marshall's mind scattered. Oh, yeah. He's older than we are. I think he's even a couple of years older than Trey and Ava. Stan works with me at the deli. He's a really great worker. His wife passed last year. He also served as a Marine. I don't know why I'm telling you all this. Anyway, he and the other manager, Margie, who manages the bakery with me, they offer to take care of things while Kate is gone this week. It's kind of a sad week for me. I'll probably be better off working anyway. If I'm there, I'm going to have to work. She shook her head and started tapping on the phone. I can't believe it doesn't get reception here. A thousand questions ran through his mind. Questions he didn't want to have, and he was sure she didn't want to answer. Why do you have to work if you're in Southport? Can't you still take time off and relax? Yeah, right. You know how it goes. If I'm there, in close proximity, I won't be able to stop myself from going in. Plus, she said, looking tired, there's a catering event for Lucy next week and I need to go over all the accounts. I need to get some stuff to my accountant. And you know what? I really shouldn't be leaving anyway. An idea suddenly occurred to Marshall. What if you stayed at the inn? She paused, then turned to face him. Why would I do that? Why not? There's not many people staying there. Right now we have two couples and one family with two kids. We have a bunch of extra rooms and, he said, his mind racing, I could come and tow your car back today to Trey's. I might be able to see what I can fix. What? No, she said quickly. Why not? She looked flustered. Because? Just no. That wouldn't work. I don't want to be an inconvenience. Look, it's no big deal. I don't have many responsibilities at the inn. Breakfast in the morning and a movie and popcorn at night. It's not a biggie. You could just do your own thing and relax. Are you supposed to be there right now? She asked, checking her phone for the time. It's almost nine. No, Mom, he grinned. Kenzie and Tim are taking care of things. I had to take the bike out, he gestured to the Harley. She turned to look at his bike. That is a nice ride. Yes, she is. In fact, it was a surprise. Trey got her for me. She grinned at him. That's awesome. So what do you say? About what? Come stay at the inn. The look on her face turned to confusion. Then she narrowed her eyes and shook her head. No, I couldn't do that. That's not going to work. The more Marshall thought about it, the more he decided that it actually would work. You see, if you're at a beach inn, that's not home. That's not technically your home, so you don't have to work. He gestured to her. It's clear you need a break. Take it. I can't stay with you, Marshall. Why not? We were friends once. His adrenaline kicked up, and he thought of that horrible day she'd turned him down. He blinked, then stared at her. We were best friends, if I recall. Her eyes narrowed. Were we? The reaction confused him. Uh, I think so. Since we were nine... Remember the day I met you on the beach? It had been the story they had always told people over and over through the years growing up. In truth, they had been unlikely best friends. She put her hand up. I know the story, Marshall. I don't need a recap. Ridiculous. He cursed and threw up a hand. Why are you giving me all this guff? He demanded, pointing at her. You're the one who... He didn't want to relive that day. She pointed back at him. 
You ignored my calls for a year. You ignored my texts, my emails, she said, ticking them off on her fingers. Her eyes became misty with tears. You were my best friend, and you cut me off like I meant nothing to you. Marshall couldn't believe this. The anger and pain flooded back. I ignored you? You're mad because I ignored you? I left you a hundred voicemails. One hundred voicemails. And then... Her eyes blinked rapidly. Never mind. I can't do this. Just leave. Until right now, it hadn't occurred to him that she had viewed what had happened between them much differently than he did. He wanted to grab her and turn her back to him and demand answers. Go away, she said, venom in her tone. Just go. Fine, he started walking away. But then he heard her crying again. He squeezed his hands into fists. Every part of him screamed that he should just get on his bike and leave her alone. After all, hadn't that been what she'd told him to do? But all faults aside, his ex had been right. He couldn't leave someone on the side of the road to suffer if he could help. Nope, I'm not leaving. Yes, you are. She was walking the other way. I'm going to walk until I have phone service and I'll figure this out. Inwardly, he winced, but he caught up to her. Just come with me, get on my bike, and I'll take you back. I can tow your car. It's fine. Their eyes connected and hers flashed with anger. I don't need a man to save me. I'm not some damsel in distress, okay? Could this woman get any more infuriating? It was clear that right now she was a damsel in distress. She was on the side of the road with a broken down car. But he didn't point that out. Look, I'm just trying to help. Her angry look turned blank. She crossed her arms. Listen, I know we have a past, but I'm here and I'm willing to help. You need the help and I'm offering it. Plus, it would be a favor to me. Her head jerked to face him. Oh, a favor to you? Really? She threw her hand at him in the air. It's a trick that all of you stone people have always had. Ava had it, Lucy, Cherise, Trey, Matt, Tim, the whole town, she said, scoffing. It's like everyone in this whole town thinks that I'm not okay, that I need help for some reason, when clearly I am the one getting stuff done around here. Who caters all the events? Who runs two businesses in this town? All right, you're right, I'm done. He started walking back to his motorcycle. Fine. She said she didn't need help, and he didn't need this crap. He had plenty of his own crap to deal with. The hog still looked amazing. It made him smile as he got closer. The other thing that made him smile was when he heard her call out his name. Wait, Marshall, hold up. He didn't stop until he got to his bike. She rushed at him. Are you going to help me or not? He grinned at her defiant eyes. If there was anything that made him happy, it was a woman who needed him. So maybe Sarah was right. Maybe he did like helping too much. He did like helping a dang beautiful woman at that. Fine, he got on the bike and waited, just the way he'd done since they were kids and before he could legally drive the motorcycle he had fixed up. He would sneak over to her house and she would get on and they would drive for hours. He started the engine. Get on. She hesitated. Not in the mood for more drama, he swung his gaze to her. What? She looked caught. I'm sorry for what happened ten years ago. He wished he could dismiss the time that had passed and tell her he didn't care about it, but that wasn't the truth. Are we discussing this now? No. She slipped behind him and wrapped her arms around his waist. So many memories rushed through him, almost drowning him in this moment. So many things he denied for so long. Thank you, she said, leaning into him and pressing her face against his back. He took off with a grunt because the past was suddenly all stuck in the back of his throat. The funny part was how much he'd missed her. You're welcome. Chapter 4 Cat awoke the next morning and jolted upright in bed. 
the sunlight streamed through the windows, and the teal-green walls seemed mellow in the morning light. True to his word, Marshall had taken her back to the Stone Family Inn and set her up on the third floor in the Red Sand Beach Room. She looked around, feeling overwhelmed. The flooring was an engineered hardwood with a lush white rug. Soft white curtains and a puffy bedspread could have been pulled down from the clouds. The whole thing made her feel like she had been transported to a different world. Like she was one of those people who came to Southport to vacation. That wasn't the case, of course. She had grown up here. Her family had lived in town, and her adopted parents had owned a restaurant. Maybe that was why it had been easy, in some ways, to come back to Southport and open a restaurant. Well, a deli and a bakery. She had watched her parents make a living that way, but she had discovered that it was a lot of hard work. Truthfully, she felt a bit worn out from it. Cat focused on the rug. Her feet sank into the softness. Heavenly, she sighed. She padded to the window overlooking the beach. It had been a long time since she'd taken a moment to admire the view. It was gorgeous. It was funny to her that even though she lived only eight minutes from the beach, she never came here. Rarely did she take a day off. There were families out there, and an ache blossomed in the center of her heart. Of course, she had called Cade last night. He sounded like he was having the time of his life, telling her about the airplane ride and her parents' home. They had a hot tub, which he was particularly excited about. He happily filled her in on how they had all kinds of things planned for the next two weeks. The beach, trips to museums, snorkeling, and baking lessons with her mother. His happiness was infectious. Why hadn't she made it a priority to teach him basic baking this past year? She moved to the bedside table and unplugged her phone so she could check the time. Six o'clock on the dot. It didn't surprise her that even though Marshall had told her to sleep in, she was up so early. Normally she awoke at 5.30. She would run down to the bakery and either start doing prep work for the day or make sure others were there doing that already. During this past school year, she had run home to get Cade off to school, making sure he had his lunch, his homework, his backpack, and a kiss on the cheek before he caught the bus. Then she would run back to the bakery in Delhi and work until school was out, and then she would pick him up. They would go back to the bakery in Delhi, and she would take a break and help him with homework, or she might get him off to karate. Southport had been a huge blessing. It had allowed both of them stability. Military life had been difficult to deal with, her vision became misty with tears as she thought about this week. Guilt threatened to overcome her, but she blocked those thoughts and focused on getting dressed. Then she went down to the stone kitchen. She pulled out some food from the fridge. It felt good to do what she'd always done, keep herself busy. Plus, it took her mind off the past. Yesterday, it had been a jolt to see Marshall. He had always been that guy the one she would think about when things were hard with J.D., which had been a lot. Marshall was the guy she wished she could still call and pour her heart out about random things. You don't start being best friends with someone at the age of nine and then just shut them out like he'd done to her so easily. She winced. Sure, she hadn't said the right thing that day, but come on. The memory came clearly. She could see the way his eyes had looked so vibrant with emotion, and she could feel the gentle roughness of his hand in hers. She hadn't been expecting what he'd told her, and she had reacted poorly. More than poorly. She didn't understand why he'd frozen her out, even though it had been painful. Memories of their youth had been cropping up more and more this past year, living back in Southport. She'd gotten good at shoving them back down, well, that is, until she had seen him a couple of months ago, right after the hurricane. They'd both exploded in that jail. It kind of made her smile to think about it. It didn't help that the man was amazingly handsome. No, that didn't help at all. Sure, he'd always been gorgeous, but this older version of him was... sexy. Yep, just plain sexy. Ugh. 
He had made no fuss about taking Trey's truck and going to get her car. Of course, a person in Southport couldn't hide out for too long. Kenzie and Tim had been at the inn with the guests, and after she and Marshall had explained the situation, they had agreed to keep her presence at the inn a secret. If anyone asked, they didn't know where she was. Tim had dutifully gone with Marshall to get her car. It hadn't been that long, and soon they had returned and the car was tucked into the garage. Both men had complained that she hadn't serviced the car in over a year. Marshall hadn't even asked her if she wanted this or that with the car or the parts or anything. He had just taken over the project, calling people and looking up stuff on YouTube. Truthfully, it had reminded her of J.D., but in a good way. Kat didn't want to think about J.D. Instead, she focused on scrambling eggs, and she made some French toast as well. She cooked the bacon in the oven, not wanting to get bacon grease all over. Twenty minutes later, she had the table set and most of the food ready. What the hell are you doing? Marshall walked in, acting like she was in the middle of destroying the place. Chapter 5 It wasn't hard for Marshall to get up early. Even when he wasn't deployed, he couldn't sleep in. After taking a quick run, he grabbed a quick shower and then headed downstairs so he could whip up some protein shakes. The smell of bacon hit him before he walked into the kitchen. Then he saw her, standing over a pan and stirring some eggs. Her presence affected him more than he wanted to admit. Yesterday, when he had brought her back to the inn and gotten her settled, it had been unnerving how on edge he was just being around her. Of course, throughout the years, he'd thought about her, a lot. Even though they'd only kissed once, he'd thought about that kiss a million times. He'd replayed that scene too many times to count. It was stupid. He hated himself for even caring about her. The woman had turned him down flat. The following summer, when he'd been visiting Southport and planned to talk things out with her, he'd seen her with the Marine. He'd been so ticked that he'd gotten on his bike and driven for a long time. As he walked into the kitchen, still battling with old feelings for this woman, he was further thrown off when he saw that she was playing house. What the hell are you doing? He looked at the table. It was set for everyone to eat. She glared at him. A simple thank you would suffice. He yanked open the fridge and grabbed the milk. I was going to make them shakes. He began the process of getting his protein powder out and mixing it all together in the blender. Once he'd peeled a banana, he added that as well. So I don't need to thank you for nothing, Missy. Protein shakes? These people are on vacation, Marshall. You don't feed people on vacation protein shakes. He surveyed her. The woman was wearing exercise clothes that were tight. They showed off her curves, and he had to focus on the reason they were arguing. Maybe they're health conscious. You're ridiculous. It was probably a good thing that they were interrupted by a family and their children right then. Yum, said a little girl named Dora, who was probably around five. Can we have some? Cat acted like she was the one hosting them. Help yourself. We're so happy to have you. If there's anything you need, you just let me or Marshall know. And so it went on the rest of the morning as the other couples came down for breakfast. It was both humbling and annoying that Cat was so good with people and serving them. She had saved him. He really would have given them all protein shakes. Now that he was thinking clearly, he could see it was a bad idea. After everyone had eaten and talked and then taken off to their activities or to go shower, it was just him and Kat left to clean up the kitchen. At one point, he turned to her. I got this. You can go relax. She scoffed at his suggestion. No, I'm staying here for free. I want to help out. I insist. Marshall could respect that. He liked a woman willing to work and pull her weight. He'd been raised that way. Everyone worked, and work was good for people. His ex, Sarah, had always made a point to go half on all chores. Once, he'd asked her why she never went half on car maintenance, and she'd told him he was being a baby. Why had he liked her again? Marshall, 
He jerked to face Cat. Yeah. Her brows knitted together. Are you okay? I said your name two times. More and more he was getting lost in his own thoughts, and he hated it. Sorry. She held up a bag of trash. Which garbage can does it go in? There's like three out there. He put down the wash rag, rinsing it out, and then reached for the trash. The second bin, but I got it. Great. She let it go and glanced around. The kitchen looks good. Yeah. He was halfway to the garage when he thought he'd better mention something. So the uh, new radiator won't be here for a couple of days. If you need to go somewhere, you're welcome to borrow my rental car. He'd already been thinking about making sure she had wheels. Since I have the motorcycle anyway. Oh, she nodded. Did I mention how much I appreciate you? No problem. He was pleasantly surprised to hear it. No, seriously, she said, and her cheeks turned red. You saved me yesterday. Between the car and giving me a place to stay? She blinked hard, like she was trying to control her emotions. I know I didn't act like it, but I am grateful. It felt so good to hear her acknowledge all that he'd done. Sarah had always told him that he looked for too much praise. But he didn't want to think of Sarah. He pointed at Cat and said, Not to mention hiding you out. I mean, that's the hardest part in Southport. She laughed. Yeah. It was interesting that she seemed so emotional. He wanted to ask more questions. About this cabin she'd been going to by herself. About her life in Southport. About the Marine. No. He couldn't let himself get wrapped up in all of that. So go relax. Thanks. He waved his hand at her. Have fun. Enjoy. Help yourself to anything in the house. I might swim, if that's okay. Are you going to hot tub? She hesitated. No. Stupid. Why had he even asked that? He remembered sneaking her out of the house to come back in hot tub when they were young. Again, she blinked and swallowed. Okay, I'm going to go. It felt like there was a lot she wasn't telling him, but it was not his business. Right. He went to the garage and put the trash inside the garbage bin, then stopped in front of the hood of her car. Thoughts of Cat crowded in again. What was she going to do today? Why had he asked her if she wanted to hot tub? That was stupid. Would she read? She used to love sitting in their library. She would read for hours. His mother and Cat used to talk about books all the time. Warmth filled him as he thought of that memory. Dang, he missed his mother. The more he thought about Cat and the memories from those summers, the more he knew he couldn't be here. He couldn't just sit at the inn all day. Ava and Trey had told him he just needed to make sure he was back by eight for the popcorn and movies. Vince would soon be here to watch the place, so Marshall could leave. He needed to get out of the house. As he went back inside to grab his phone to text Vince, he noticed that Cat was still in the kitchen. She was standing by the French doors, staring out at the deck with the pool, the hot tub, the pool house, and the view of the beach. Hey, she said, turning to face him. Hey, he paused, his heart racing. What are you doing? she asked. Her face was innocent, exactly the way it had been so many times when they'd been young, and she'd stopped by to see him. Time was like a pretzel, curving back on itself in this moment. I'm not sure what I'm doing. Me either. All kinds of ideas burst into his imagination. He thought of the things they used to do together all summer. Surfing, hiking, walking the beach to find seashells, lying up on the roof and staring at the stars for hours. He didn't want to say any of that. Well... There's lots of things to do here that I think you'll find relaxing. Marshall was about to go up to his room when Cat said, Do you remember how your mother and I would read for hours in the library? His adrenaline spiked. I was just thinking about that when I was in the garage. Your mom was the best. I mean, I'm pretty happy with my mom too, but your mom was just... She just spent time with people when they needed it, you know? Marshall hadn't thought about his mother like that, but it was true. She did. She sat out in the garage and talked to me about as much as you did in the summers. 
the memory of those times softened him. I guess, looking back, I never felt I didn't have time with her. Even though there were six of us, she always found time to spend with us. A smile played at her lips. She was a good lady. Listen, I know you, and I... Well, we're a bit explosive in nature, but I'm glad that you stopped yesterday. He thought of how she'd looked so angry, had accused him of shutting her out. I'm glad, too. Unable to stop himself, he asked, Can I ask why this week is so important for you to get away? To go to a cabin by yourself? What do you mean? I don't know. It just feels like I was missing something when you were so upset and talking about how you really needed this week. I mean, I know everyone needs a vacation, time away, but is there something that is making you sad? No, she said, answering quickly, and turned back to face the window, which meant yes. Marshall sighed. Sarah had been lots of drama. He didn't want drama in his life. Okay. He left the room, calling over his shoulder. Good luck. None of her problems were his business. In his room, he grabbed his shades and his wallet. It was evident that she didn't want to talk to him about whatever it was. So, that was fine. She could chill here, do her thing, get rested, and he would do his thing. They could just be normal people who didn't know each other. Yes, he could treat her the same way he would treat any acquaintance in his life. He strode back through the kitchen and to the garage door. She was gone. Good. He didn't need to think about her. He would take a ride. Yes. He would go where he'd been kind of planning on going yesterday, before his attention had been hijacked. But as he opened the garage door, he was held up. There she was, sitting on his new motorcycle. What the... Sorry, she said as she got off the bike. Again, he had to admire how slim she was, how graceful. Not the girl he'd once known. She had definitely matured. It's fine. You can sit on the bike. She gestured to the bike. I was just enjoying it. That's all. I'm done. She didn't meet his eyes as she walked past him. I'll just be doing stuff. See you later? Yeah, later but he found himself asking, Want to go to the lighthouse? She froze, then turned to face him. Are you serious? The fact he'd asked her actually surprised him. Yeah. I don't know. The idea of her coming with him seemed to take hold of him. I could... I could pack a lunch. I don't think anyone from town will be out there, but uh, we could bring a paper bag in case. A paper bag? He grinned at her. Sure, we can hide you away if someone comes. She laughed, and he knew he had her. No. He redoubled his efforts. Come on, it'll be fun. I haven't been to the lighthouse in years. I haven't either. Then why not? The side of her lip tugged up into a smile. I don't know. You can choose to come or not. He moved back to the bike, not wanting to push her. I'm leaving in 20 minutes. If you're in the garage, I'll take you. If you want to just hang out here, that's great. Chapter 6 Cat ran upstairs and hopped in the shower, hurrying through the process of getting ready. She hadn't decided if she would go or not. The more she thought about staying here and hiding out, the more it felt like the better option might be to just go with Marshall. If she stayed... It wouldn't be restful. She wasn't the type to sit on the beach like she had as a kid. She hadn't read a book in years. Sure, that sounded good. But if she was going to be on the beach, it would be with Cade. Or Lucy, and Kenzie, and Ava, and Charisse. And they would be relaxing and chatting. It wouldn't just be by herself. That felt... lonely. She put on makeup, which she hardly ever did. She had no idea why her mother had packed it but she was grateful. After slipping into shorts and a t-shirt and lacing up her running shoes, she wondered if she should look nicer for this excursion. Why would she need to look nice? This wasn't a date. It wasn't anything. 
As she walked to the garage and opened it, she noticed that Marshall had changed his clothes. To her relief, he had put on jeans, a t-shirt, and tennis shoes as well. He lifted his brows. You coming then? I'm here. The man could be so infuriating. He'd invited her, right? The air was thick with tension. There had always been tension there, even when they were younger. Sure, they had been best friends, but the older they'd gotten, the more the tension had ramped up. Now she couldn't stop thinking about the night he'd kissed her. If he'd only knew how many times she had replayed it in her mind. Marshall started the motorcycle and got on, and then turned to face her. Daylight's wasting. You still know how to make a girl feel exactly like you want them to come. It had been one of their jokes when they were younger, that Marshall was often not very good at communicating his feelings. He grunted, I'm not pretending to be anything I'm not. She let that comment go and moved to the motorcycle, getting on. Somehow she managed to put her hands around his hips. Yesterday, she hadn't really thought about it when she'd grabbed him tight and held on for dear life, partly because she had no other choice. Truthfully, she had been so consumed with thoughts about her car that she hadn't really thought about their history. It had been easy not to think about it. He took the highway and headed back toward Pirate's Cove. There was no direct road to the lighthouse, so driving through the cove was the only way to get there. How many times had she held on to Marshall when they'd been kids? She had always complained about how fast he went, but she'd never missed a chance to go with Marshall when he asked. Of course, she hadn't had much in the way of money. Her adoptive parents had struggled to make ends meet until they retired and sold the business. Back then, Marshall Stone was not only hot and fun and crazy, but he was the richest guy she knew, even though the Stones didn't act rich. She closed her eyes, relishing the sunshine on her face and the breeze on her body. They hadn't been driving very long when they arrived at the caves. He parked and turned off the motorcycle. How many times had they replayed this same scene over the years? She slipped off the bike. He got off and put the keys in his pocket, and they started walking toward the caves. After a bit, she realized the tension was gone. She had always liked that about Marshall. She could just be with him, without talking, without explaining, without entertaining. J.D. had not been like that. The longer she had been married to him, the more she had realized how much she valued the time when he was away. She could have her own thoughts. She could have her friends. It was easy. And then when Cade was born, when J.D. was gone, they had their routine. When J.D. came home, he had acted like she had to change everything. Eventually, she had realized that J.D. wanted every single second of her time and her thoughts and her energy. It was exhausting. Penny for your thoughts? They were already through the second set of caves, and they were coming out the other side. Cat could see the lighthouse. They still had about a mile to go. I don't know. Things with Marshall felt so similar and so different. How could she get to that place where their friendship was alive again and tell him the truth? I guess I was thinking about how you and I could be together and not talk, just hang out and do whatever. And it's always easy. Even that little admission felt intimate. She speaks the truth. Again, silence reigned for a while. He cleared his throat. I never realized how easy it was to be around you either, he admitted. For a lot of years, I dated different women, but I never had a serious relationship. They were so high maintenance, always yapping at me. The way he spoke, just like he always had, made her laugh. She didn't mention his ex, the one who had left him at the altar. The fact he was bringing up relationships at all took her by surprise. Right. They walked for a ways longer. She didn't know what she was supposed to say, or if she should say anything at all. The last woman I dated told me I was too disconnected. She thought it was because of my service in the military that I couldn't reconnect with people on a day-in and day-out basis. Cat nudged him. She just didn't realize you've always been weird, she laughed. 
surprised at how easy it was to fall back into teasing him. He grinned. That's what I told her. War hasn't messed me up. I was always messed up. Both of them exploded with laughter. Okay, maybe you charge more for your thoughts than you used to. I could give you a quarter. I don't know what to say. That's why you just ramble. Don't you remember how good you were at rambling when I got you going? It was silly, but she sighed. True. My parents said that being around you made me into a jabberbox. But they liked it. Yes, they did. She remembered that first day on the beach. Do you remember what you asked me the first time I met you? When we were nine? He paused, then nodded. Then he laughed and covered his face. I was completely suave. Do you think you can fart louder than me? She said, quoting him. Dang, it was a good pickup line. <laughs> the best for a nine-year-old. You looked so angry and lonely. I felt like I might be able to cheer you up. He snorted. Isn't that funny? I wasn't the kind of kid, even then, that really cared if others were happy or not. Just ask my siblings. She didn't think he was that kind of guy even now. But she wouldn't tell him that. He'd always been so good to her. The fact that he'd invited her to come today made her take pause. You were trying to cheer me up today, weren't you? He lifted one shoulder up and down. Nope. He was infuriating and could tick her off in seconds. But he had always been kind-hearted. And clearly he still was. It was a little harder to see with Marshall sometimes. You're still the gooey center of a Tootsie Pop, aren't you? I didn't like the comparison then, and I don't like it now. Woo, woo, she said, mimicking the noise of the owl from the Tootsie Pop commercials. Seriously? But his lip turned up. Goofy references had always made him angry, then happy. Woo, woo, she repeated, cracking up. I swear, you've never grown up, Dixon. The way he called her by her new last name took her aback. He always used to call her Hanson. That had been her old last name, the name he'd known her as. It felt strange that he would call her by her current name. Sorry, he said, seeming to sense her discomfort. I didn't mean to... She didn't look at him. Why was she having this reaction? She refocused on their conversation about their childhood. You were my first real friend in Southport. I had just come to live with the Hansons a few weeks before that, and I had been through some rough things. Her eyes turned misty, and all of those insecurities rushed back to her. You okay? Over the years, I thought about what you did for me, Marshall, in just making me your friend, she said, meeting his gaze. Thank you. Being part of your family and part of the beach crew changed my life. You were the catalyst that led me to being friends with everyone. Honestly, you were the catalyst for making me feel like I wasn't an outsider anymore. I think most of them liked you better than me, he laughed. Most of the time, my siblings asked where you were, or Mom would tell me to go get you because she knew that you made me happy. They kept walking, and even though they were talking about feelings and she was thinking about things she normally didn't like to think about, it was okay. Because finally, after all these years, she was communicating with Marshall again. I'm really glad we're hanging out right now. A smile played at his lips. Me too. She didn't respond. She didn't want to get into what had happened between them before he had shut her out. Right now, it felt good to be out in the sunshine, to be talking to a friend. They arrived at the lighthouse. It looks exactly the same. She couldn't help the excitement that pulsed through her. She walked faster to the door, which was only hanging halfway on the hinge. Marshall pulled the door back and held it open for her. It does look the same. She stepped through. Thanks. Then both of them were walking up the stairs to the second floor. Okay, it doesn't look the same, she said. It was a mess. There were papers and trash all over. Old pop cans, beer cans. The disrespect. Marshall went to the window. Kids these days. We need to bring some trash bags the next time and clean this up. This place shouldn't be treated this way. 
She moved to his side and peered out over the water. Let's do that. Her mind went back to the times she and Marshall had come to the lighthouse during a storm. They had liked to watch the storm rolling in, and sometimes they would point out the waves as they got bigger and bigger. Do you remember that time we thought the wave was going to go over our heads and smash this place to smithereens? He laughed. That was the summer... She trailed off. That my dad died. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Why had she even brought that up? Marshall's brow furrowed. I broke down like a baby. And you just held me. And told me it would be okay. Right in this spot. Their eyes met, and he glanced down at her lips. Lightly, he touched her hand, holding it for a second before letting it go. You were a good friend to me, he said. I never got to thank you for that. For years, she'd thought about talking to Marshall again, explaining why she'd acted the way she had, but she'd never imagined she would feel this intensity or this much attraction and confusion. It was like someone had stuck them beneath a magnifying glass and just ramped up the old feelings. Look, Marshall said, pointing to the inside of the little window. Do you remember that? Her heart skipped as she saw the words he'd engraved a long time ago. You and me, always. K and M. Yeah, she said, feeling a bit breathless. Marshall peered closely at the words. This place has always reminded me of you. Has it? Her mouth felt dry. Marshall nodded. You were always a light in my life, Cat. You... He trailed off. She was floored by his confession. He shrugged. I guess it doesn't matter now, with all these years passing. She wanted to press him, ask him why he didn't respond to her messages. She didn't know how in this moment. After a long time, Marshall turned back to the door. Should we go check out the top? See if they destroyed the equipment up there? Yeah. They climbed to the top. The old equipment was still there, just rusty. It didn't look like anything had been vandalized. I guess the punks didn't ruin it. Marshall began heading back down. Good thing, she said, following after him. A light in his life? A light in his life. The words were on repeat in her brain. He didn't stop at the second floor. He just kept going down to the entrance. Should we walk around a bit? We could eat lunch at the infamous rock out there. She knew the exact rock he was talking about. Let's do it. It was easy to hike with Marshall. They fell into the routine they had always done as kids. They hiked up to the top of the mountain paused at the rock, and looked out. Neither of them spoke. There was so much between them, but there was no way to say it. Cat's mistakes, and the things she didn't know how to explain to Marshall. Marshall opened his pack and pulled out the sandwiches and water. Here you go. Thanks. She took a sandwich and unwrapped it. Marshall did the same. I guess it's probably not as good as yours, since you have your deli. Trey told me it's the best in town. The compliment warmed her up, but she didn't accept the praise. She took a bite. This is good. I like the tangy mustard. I like the mayo. I'm a mayo person. I like your use of pickles. You make it sound like it's a Rembrandt or something. Hey, the sandwich is a Rembrandt in a different way. I mean, I make gourmet sandwiches, so each sandwich is individual and special. This could be the next one I put on the menu. Right, he winked at her. When you're not hiding out, I'll have to come try the place out. Nothing would make her happier. I'll even give it to you on the house as payback. Payback had been a thing between them as they'd grown up, going clear back to when they'd been nine years old. Oh, no, no, no. That is not equal payback. She laughed and stayed firm. Payback is payback. You always tried to make it so one thing was equal to another, and I'm not allowing it. I gave you a week at my inn, fixed your car, and kept your secret. That is not equivalent to one 
sandwich. I don't care how gourmet it is. He scooted closer. She laughed, glad she'd gotten the reaction she had wanted. It's equal if I say it's equal. No, it's not. He was close enough to kiss. It is so, she taunted. She looked at his lips. She wanted so badly to kiss him. She scooted away, her mind spinning. Fine, whatever. What had happened to make her so insanely attracted to this man? She had always been attracted to him, but not like this. He laughed and turned back to his pack to unwrap another sandwich. He tore off a bit to stuff in his mouth and then flashed her a grin through his mouthful. You're such a pig. That was another thing she had said to him all the time. His eyes caught hers, clearly remembering the joke. I'm not a pig. I'm hungry. She burst out laughing and turned to face the ocean. It was gorgeous with the blue sky and the sun streaming down. Everything in the world felt more right than she could remember feeling in a long, long time. It wasn't long until they decided to get back. As they hiked back, Kat checked her phone. It was almost four o'clock in the afternoon. Marshall got back on the motorcycle and waited for her to join him. She slid on and got a whiff of his scent. She'd noticed it before, but now she leaned into his back and deeply inhaled. Instead of the scent he'd worn in high school, it was a woodsier smell, pine, a tinge of orange, and maybe sandalwood. Are you smelling me? Caught, she let out a cough. No, she gave him a little push in the back, grateful that he wasn't directly facing her and couldn't see her blushing. A bit arrogant, aren't we? He laughed and started the motorcycle. I'm just calling it like it is. She leaned into him, wrapping her arms around his middle and laying her head on his back. Hey, cat, Marshall said softly. I just wanted to tell you something. What's that? He jerked his head farther to the side, prompting her to listen. I listened to every single voice message you sent me. All 100 of them. Chapter 7 It had been a quiet evening after their trip to the lighthouse. Kat had said she wasn't hungry, and she had gone up to her room. Somehow, she'd avoided talking about what he'd revealed to her. After dismissing Vince, Marshall had been pleasant to the guests as they had come and gone. It had been easy to turn the movie on at 8 o'clock, pop some popcorn, and get some drinks out. What he hadn't anticipated was that his sister, Kenzie, would show up. How was your day? she asked, without preamble. Oh, dear. His sister was clearly trying to bond with him. Not that he was opposed to that. He just had a lot on his mind. He might as well tell her. She probably already knew. Cat and I went to the lighthouse today. They headed into the office to talk. Kenzie sat on the brown leather couch, then swung her feet around and propped a pillow behind her head. She did seem more tired than normal. And don't say a word about it, Marshall added. What are you talking about? I'm just here to chat with my brother to find out about his day, to catch up. She flashed him a grin that said she had an agenda. Okay, he said, sitting in the leather chair across from the couch. Then let's catch up. How was your day? What book are you writing? How is the writing going? He was being a bit sneaky, because Trey had confided in him last week on the phone that Kenzie had writer's block, and he wasn't supposed to push her about the book. She cast a glance at him, and then leaned her head back. Well, I do have this great romance sizzling in my mind at the moment. Oh yeah? Tell me the good parts. His sister, of course, made sure people knew that she wrote romance. That was more about emotional bonding. But Marshall and his brothers liked to tease her. Well, if you have to know, it's about these two people that were best friends growing up. She turned on her side, and a large grin swept over her face. The guy, let's call him Marsh. He was not finding this amusing. Marsh? Her grin widened further. Yes, and the woman was known as, let's say, Kay. 
Not humored, but not wanting to admit defeat, he flashed her his own kind of grin. Sounds boring. Well, it's just in the beginning stages. He stood, no longer wanting to play this game. It was nice catching up, sis, but I think I'm going to do a quick perimeter check. I'm going to chit-chat with the guests, and then I will make sure everyone is comfortable. Well, we'll have to, you know, talk tomorrow. His sister flipped her legs to the floor. No, you don't, brother. I am still your big sister, and I am keeping the little secret that we have a stowaway. A stowaway, he grunted. What are we, on the Titanic? Marshall, will you just tell me what's going on with you and Cat? Nothing. Is everything okay? I mean, I know that Cat has been through a lot, but you're my brother, and you've been through a lot too. I just don't want to see you get hurt again. His sister had a heart of gold, and as he'd gotten older, he found that his mother also had one. I'm fine. Kenzie had been the one to pick him up all those years ago, after he told Cat his real feelings. Are you sure? She moved to his side and put a hand on his shoulder. Then she leaned up and quickly kissed his cheek. Because I know that you're rough and tough, she smiled at him and he smiled back. It was an inside joke about what his dad used to call him. But I love you, and I just want you to be happy. Marshall did not enjoy being coddled. Sure, he put up with it from his mother and Kenzie, but only to a certain point. I am fine, and I love you too. He slipped an arm around her shoulders and walked her out of the office and down the hallway to the front door. I want you to go home and rest and get that bum husband of yours to make you some kind of pastry that you like. Her face lit up and then turned down into a frown. I do love pastries, but I'm too sick for them at the moment. Have you been sick? Marshall chided himself. He should have been asking questions like that. He'd known she was tired, but he hadn't realized she'd been nauseated. She waved a hand through the air. What is that line in The Devil Wears Prada? Something like, I'm just one good stomach flu away from my goal weight. You're ridiculous. Kenzie laughed and patted his cheek before opening the door. She paused at the threshold and winked at him. I am being ridiculous. I honestly don't care if I gain 50 pounds with this baby. I'm just so grateful. Her voice cracked, and he felt the center of his chest burst with happiness for his sister. I'm having a baby. A rush of chills washed over him and he pulled her back into a hug. You're having a baby, he said, rubbing circles into her back. It's going to be amazing. She sniffled and pulled back, grinning at him. For the first time, he understood what people were talking about when they said that pregnant women glow. You go home now and rest, he told her. The rest of the night, after he'd cleaned up the drinks and the popcorn, he had to put the guests to bed, or at least that's what it felt like. He locked the house and checked the security cameras on his phone. It was a pretty cool app. He would have to ask Trey about his security system. Maybe he could convince Kat to let him install something like that for her. It unsettled him to think about someone stalking her. Sure, maybe it was benign. Maybe it was just some harmless weirdo who was baking her cookies and leaving her notes. But the latest one had told her to enjoy her time at the cabin, which suggested that they were paying close attention. He walked up the staircase, and instead of going to his room on the second floor, he took the next flight of stairs to the third floor. It was only 11 o'clock. He didn't see any lights on beneath the crack in the floor of her doorway. Dang. If only she was awake. He was restless. Spending time with Cat had awakened so many memories inside of him, things that he had almost locked out. He did a cursory sweep of the rest of the third floor, and then he went back downstairs to his room. He opened an app that saved old voice messages on his phone, and he pressed play. Marshall, this is Cat. Will you please call me back? I miss you. It's been a hundred days. Did you hear that, Marshall? One hundred days. I want to explain myself. I want to explain why I acted the way I did after you kissed me. Please. He lay down in bed, closed his eyes and pressed the play button one more time. Chapter 8 
Cat woke early the next morning, but she didn't go downstairs. She wasn't hungry, which was funny because she had skipped dinner. Lazily, she turned on her side and grabbed her phone off the nightstand. 6 a.m. Her internal alarm clock never failed her. She put her phone back, thinking about yesterday. When she had sequestered herself to her room the previous evening, she had spent an hour on the phone with her son. Cade had had a marvelous day, snorkeling and swimming and building sandcastles. Her parents had taken over the conversation then and told her about this really nice couple that they had met at the beach. Cade had played with their son. Cade had been too excited to stay silent, and he'd told her a million things about his new friend, Shane. In fact, they were all going to meet the next day and go to a museum. As thrilled as she was to hear about her son having so much fun, she was simultaneously melancholy about it. Part of it was because she wasn't there, and part of it was because she felt normal mom guilt. Why hadn't she taken them to the beach here? And why hadn't he been making more friends his age here? It was easy to dwell on the things she wasn't doing with her son. She felt like she was failing him in so many ways. She was a good mother, a great mother, but the same questions always nagged at her. Would they be happier living closer to her parents in Florida? Should she just sell her business and move there? The real estate market was still going strong in Southport. The thought didn't feel good to her, though. It felt like admitting defeat. Her mind flitted to Marshall. In fact, she'd dreamt about him. It wasn't uncommon for her to dream about him, but this dream had felt so real. It had included the lighthouse. She and Marshall had been holding hands, and she remembered feeling so happy and laughing. It was exactly the way she had felt yesterday with him. Except in the dream, J.D. had shown up. He had been wearing his military uniform, and he had pointed a gun at Marshall. The dream had skipped to Marshall and J.D. fighting and rolling around on the ground. She had worried that the gun would go off, so she had jumped on the men and tried to get the gun. The gun had fired then, and then she was staring at J.D.'s face as he lay in his coffin, the closed eyes and the stoic mouth, the rubbery skin. He had opened his eyes and said to her, This is your fault. She had woken up, covered in sweat. After a trip to the bathroom to rinse her face, she had ended up taking a shower, trying to push away those thoughts. Today was the anniversary of the day she found out J.D. was dead. It had been her fault. All of it. Her vision grew blurry with tears. She buried her face in the pillow. Guilt assaulted her like a strong, powerful hailstorm. There was no hiding from it. The only thing she could do was let herself cry. Chapter 9 Marshall got up early that morning to make sure he was the one making breakfast for the guests. A child bounded over to him and asked, Hey, mister, where are the eggs and pancakes today? I have yummy protein shakes for you, Marshall promised. The child's parents were walking into the kitchen, and Marshall smiled at them. This morning what we have for you are protein shakes, or you can get anything out of the refrigerator and make it. The mother paused, and a scowl washed across her face. I liked the other girl, the one who cooked a real breakfast for us. I do too, Marshall said, not taking offense to the statement. Later, he cleaned up the kitchen, a very dirty kitchen. It was probably easier to make one breakfast for everyone instead of allowing them to make their own. One pan was particularly difficult to scrub. One of the guests had burnt eggs on the bottom. Where was Cat? Why hadn't she come down yet? It made him skittish to think about what he had revealed to her. Why had he told her that he had listened to all of those voicemails? It was stupid. It didn't matter anyway. Plus, it had made her completely weird. As he finished wiping up the kitchen, he heard someone at the front door, punching in the code. He rushed to the door, only to intercept Vince. Dude, chill. What's up, Vince? Just ready to sit at the desk and watch YouTube? If Marshall had wanted to be a jerk, he would have gone off on a lecture about personal responsibility, about hard work. 
about how the inn could use a dusting and Vince could be just the one to do it. The men he trained when they first came into the Night Stalker program teased him about being a stickler. Well, probably a different word, but he wasn't in the mood to shape a young mind right now. Okay, I'll be around. Should he go check on Cat? He swung by the kitchen and got the extra protein shake he'd made for her. As he approached her door, it still looked dark beneath the doorway. This time he knocked. Cat, are you awake? Go away, she said, her voice muffled. He hesitated, not sure what to do, but he wasn't the type to leave well enough alone. I saved you some breakfast. I have a nice protein shake for you. He smiled, thinking she might find it funny. Nothing. Cat, are you okay? Can I come in? Do not come in. I'm fine. I'm just staying in my room today. That news didn't sit well with him. Why? Go away, Marshall. He didn't move, but he didn't say anything else. I know you're still there. Go away. Still, he waited. She clearly wasn't fine, but his patience was to no avail, because she didn't come out. He could go get a room key and let himself in, but he didn't want to upset her. She had talked about a weird stalker, and he didn't want to be that. He'd promised her rest and reprieve at the inn, hadn't he? Maybe she wanted to just be in bed today. That was fine, right? Reluctantly, he stepped away from the door and went downstairs. He stopped in the kitchen and dumped out the shake. Then he found himself in the garage, pulling back the tarp covering the old motorcycle. Satisfaction wove through him. Yes, a project was just what he needed. Marshall found tools on the tool bench and pulled them back to the bike. He also found a chair and pulled it over. Without further ado, he began tinkering. He removed some of the really rusted parts and ended up dismantling most of it. Someone pulled up to the house. He got up and moved to the front to see who it was. It was Tim in his police car. As he stepped out, a big grin filled his face. Not gonna lie, it's nice to have you in town. He put his knuckles out and bumped Marshall's. Want to see what I'm working on? You mean the old bike tray got for you? He showed you. They walked into the garage and Tim patted his back. You should know that now that I'm the sheriff, added to the fact that I married your sister, I'm in the loop. I'm totally in the loop. More than I ever wanted to be in the loop. I'm sure you are, Marshall laughed. They talked about the ins and outs of the bike. According to Tim, Jed had said the radiator would be in tomorrow for Cat's car. After they finished talking about the motorcycle, Marshall turned to him. The guy was like a brother to him, and he knew he could trust him. She's still in her room today. Do you know what's going on? I knew this was going to be a hard week for her. She mentioned that. But I don't know if it's because she's overwhelmed with work, or if she's just sad her son's gone. Tim's expression soured. I heard this week marks the anniversary of her husband's passing. Understanding dawned on Marshall. That woman has grit. I have watched her open two businesses this past year. She has poured herself into her work, and she poured herself into her son. A couple of weeks ago, she told the women that she was dreading the death anniversary date. Tim frowned. I'm probably saying too much, but that's because I've been hanging out with your gossiping sister. Those women talk way too much, Marshall said absently, his brain working to process what he'd just learned. Kenzie thinks something else, other than grief from losing J.D., is eating at Cat. She doesn't know what, but she feels like it's gotten worse and worse as this date has approached. Other people feel it too. You know, Stan and Margie offered to give her a break, and her parents took Cade. Marshall hadn't thought about how those things could all be related. Grief is rough. We never know how we will react or how long it will take to move through it. In some ways, he felt like he'd spent the last year grieving. Not just because he'd lost his mother, but because he'd lost the life he'd thought he would have with Sarah. But as he'd listened to Kat's messages last night, he'd realized that he also still had grief inside of him about losing her all those years ago. 
As Marshall walked Tim out to the front of the inn and back to his car, Tim turned back to face him. Be careful, Marshall. What do you mean? Tim opened the door and slipped inside. I've seen that look on your face a thousand times growing up. What are you talking about? Tim tipped his hat. The determined look. The look that says you're not giving up and you're going to fix something or do something. But I don't know if Cat can simply be fixed. I don't think she's broken, Marshall argued. You know what I mean. Tim pulled the car door shut, started the engine, and began backing up. Marshall watched him go. One thing was certain. He was going to get Cat out of that bed. Chapter 10 Someone banged on the door, jerking Cat out of her thoughts. Marshall, go away. Not until I make sure that you're okay. I'm fine. Dang, the man was annoying as all get out. It's almost five o'clock. Why don't you come out? We'll go grab some dinner. Cat had noticed the past year that the less she ate, the less she cared to eat. Stan and Margie had made it their purpose at times to make sure she ate at least one meal during the day. I'm not hungry. Cat, he said, his tone rising. Open the door, please. She didn't move, only snuggled deeper into the bed. Cat, I'm warning you. She closed her eyes. More loud banging sounded. The heavy wood door shook in the frame. Ugh, the man was frustrating. Cat threw back the covers, stomped to the door, and yanked it open. The look on his face, one of surprise and shock, told her that she didn't look great. What? There. You can see I'm fine. I'm going back to bed. Please leave me alone. She turned back to the bed, diving into it. For a couple minutes, Marshall stayed in the doorway, not saying anything. Shut the door when you go. Unfortunately, he didn't go. Part of her wanted to demand to know why he hadn't reached out to her when he'd heard those messages. But there was another part that didn't care. The part that felt she was worthless anyway, especially at this low point in her life. Cat, he said, can we talk? She kept her eyes closed. I'm listening. He sucked in a long breath, then moved inside the room. Sitting on the edge of the bed, the mattress dipped underneath him. He wasn't a small man, but the bed was huge, so it didn't bother her. Cat, will you sit up? No. Cat, will... Do you want me to leave? She asked. What do you mean? The inn. No. No. He said it like it was obvious. Then please, just let me be. For a long time he didn't move. When he spoke again... His tone was quiet, unyielding. Are you really okay? Kat's gut twisted with humiliation. It was like she could suddenly see herself through his eyes, this broken shell of a woman. I'm fine. Tears leaked down her cheeks. I'm fine. Please, go. He cursed, but then he was gone. The door closed softly behind him. She cried into her pillow. Memories assaulted her, playing like a broken record on repeat in her mind. The last time she'd sent her husband off, the fight they'd had, what he'd said to her, and what she'd said to him. The relief she'd felt when she found out he was dead. There was no hope for her. She cried until she fell asleep. Chapter 11 The next day, after another argument with Cat about spending the day in bed, Marshall went for a run. He put in his AirPods and let classic rock flow through him as he lost track of everything, letting his thoughts release. It was a tactic Marshall used to release pain, pushing his body to extreme limits. After his run, he returned to the inn and was pleased to see that the pool area was deserted. He took his shirt off, and then he was swimming laps. He'd been on the swim team in high school and had loved it, 
It had been a while since he'd swam, and his muscles burned, screamed, giving him the release he yearned for. His thoughts returned to Cat, the cat who was sleeping in the room upstairs. He couldn't stop feeling this bottomless pain for her. Marshall didn't like to connect with other people and their problems, even though he had a knack for it. His mother had always told him he had a gift for compassion. He discovered other people's pain, and being unable to help often overwhelmed him and shut him down. He tried to stay away from people who were in pain. It wasn't that he couldn't connect. It was that he'd allowed his ex to get too close. She'd slipped past so many of Marshall's defenses until he'd found himself exactly where Cat was right now, at the bottom of the swimming pool, with no one there to pull her out. Dang it. He hauled himself out of the pool. He was going to pull Cat out, whether she liked it or not. He grabbed his shirt and went into the house, hoping he wouldn't run into any guests. Most of them were off property doing various activities. It was only 11 o'clock. Marshall's mind raced as he retreated to his room to shower and change. He would give her a stern talking to. Maybe she was struggling with her husband's death, but she had to pull herself up by the bootstraps. Sure, Marshall had told her that she could stay here, but not so she could wallow. Wallowing never worked. He knew that from experience. He climbed the stairs to the third floor, prepared to go to extreme lengths to get her out of bed. Her door was open. She was gone. Chapter 12 When Kat received a notification that someone had texted her, she sat up and reached for her phone. Even though she was admittedly having a mini breakdown, she was still a mother and she didn't want to miss a text from Cade. It wasn't from Cade. It was from Kenzie. Cat, could you come to my house? I need some help. Somehow, that snapped her out of her depression. She pushed the covers back and checked the time. Ten in the morning. Where was Marshall? Where was Tim? Not to mention all the other women in her old beach crew. What if something had happened with her pregnancy? She had confided the good news to the beach girls the previous week at one of Lucy's brunches. Cat texted her back. I'll be right there. Give me 20 minutes. She grabbed some clothes out of her bag. After a quick shower, she didn't bother putting on anything except a little bit of base and blush and a smidge of mascara. Over the last year, as she had battled these depressive feelings, she'd learned that making herself look better actually made her feel better. If something was going on with Kenzie and the baby then Kat needed to be at her best. She rushed down the stairs and ran into Vince, who was getting ready to leave. He glanced at her, seeming unsure of what to say, but she saw him two or three times a week at the deli. He often came in for a long lunch that usually ended with Trey showing up and telling him to get his butt back to the inn. Hey, Vince said, looking around. I was just leaving. I don't know where Marshall is, but... Could you give me a ride over to Kenzie and Tim's? Vince looked confused for a second, but he nodded. Sure. As they pulled up to Kenzie's house, Kat noticed that Lucy's car and Charisse's car were already there. She got out and called back. Thank you. I uh, could use some gas money, he said. She tossed a $5 bill at him. When Kat got to Kenzie's door, it flung open before she could knock. About time you got here, Charisse put her hands on her hips. We've been waiting. The woman was tiny, but very capable when she wanted to be. Charisse opened her arms. Hug me. Cat fell into a hug, completely confused. What's going on? Sorry, I had to sell you out to our friends. Kenzie stood by her kitchen table, which was piled high with food. Lucy wagged a finger at Cat as she placed a bowl on the table. You should know better than to think you can hide in Southport. She winked at her and popped a grape into her mouth. But we won't tell anyone. Is everything okay? Cat tentatively walked into the living room and toward the table. No, Cherise said, smacking her with the back of her hand. You can't just hide away from your best friends when we know you need us. Cherise wrapped an arm around her shoulders and pulled her toward the table. So you're okay, Cat looked at Kenzie. Relief rushed through her, followed closely by 
irritation. Your text made it seem like you needed my help. The others sat at the table, and Kenzie gestured to the food. You know, I don't feel that well. I can't eat all this food. When Lucy came by and Cherie showed up, I told them we needed your help. And you can imagine they were surprised you were even in town. She put her hands over her hips. But you know they'll keep your secret. Cherie spoke then. Are we keeping this a secret because of your stalker? Did you have another run-in with him? Lucy asked. What did he bring this time? Cinnamon rolls? Or maybe balloons? Just shut it, Kat managed to laugh, a bit overwhelmed, but also relieved. Her friends always made her feel better. The other women laughed, too. Kat usually downplayed any kind of message or baked good from said stalker. Kenzie pointed to the other chair. Sit. I'm hungry, and I'm pregnant, so you guys have to obey. It was impossible not to do as Kenzie had ordered, so Kat sat and closed her eyes as Kenzie said a quick prayer over the food. Then her friends launched into talking and asking questions. Kat picked up her fork and began eating. With a hum of appreciation, she turned to Lucy. Wild orange salad. I know, right? I found that recipe on Pinterest. They have a whole section about summer salads. She snapped her fingers. You should add a whole section of salads to your daily menu. It was strange how quickly that piqued her interest. Maybe. Cherie scowled at Lucy. I don't want to talk about summer menus. I want to talk about the little jaunt you took to the lighthouse with. Her hands pounded out a drum roll on the table. Marshall! The way she said his name implied that there was something going on with the man. Cat turned to Kenzie. Clearly your brother told you about our little jaunt to the lighthouse. Kenzie surrendered her hands. Can you fault someone for caring about her friend? Even though she said the words with a teasing tone, she reached out and put a light hand on Kat's shoulder. I just care about you. We all do. You know that, right? Kat softened, then took another bite of the salad, which had mandarin oranges, spinach, and some amazing kind of dressing in it. I definitely want this recipe. I could call it orange zest salad. I like it. You can put all of the salads together and call it a breakfast. Cherie stomped her foot. No more food talk. I need to vicariously live through your love life. She directed the last comment at Cat. There's nothing to tell, Cat said. We went to the lighthouse. You guys have been there. Other than the fact that some teenagers left a bunch of litter around it, it looks pretty much the same. Kenzie cleared her throat. She flashed a smile and then took a sip of her water. Did you guys talk about anything? I mean, my stupid brother doesn't tell me much. The unrest that had been plaguing Kat for the past three days started to slip away. She told her friends about all that had happened between her and Marshall. You guys know, or you might not know, that we kissed the summer before I went to college in Wilmington. Kenzie nodded, and so did Lucy, but Charisse's mouth fell open. What? She looked from Lucy to Kenzie, and then back to Kat. How did I not know this? I didn't want to get involved like that with Marshall. Kat's heart thumped wildly. It was impossible to explain everything she felt. But when I told him that, he shut down on me. And that was that. I tried to reach out to him. I tried to talk to him. But he pushed me out of his life. The bitterness, still fresh after all these years, slammed into her gut. Until the other day, when I saw him on the side of the road, I don't know if he told you, Cat added, glancing at Kenzie, but I was going to Stan's cabin when my car broke down. I was on that stretch of highway about two miles before you reached the caves. Why were you going to the cabin? Lucy asked. Cat filled them in on Stan's offer and the new note on her windshield. Charisse frowned. How would anyone know where you were going? Kenzie sighed and said, I think you should move into the inn permanently, to keep you safe. I'll talk to Trey and Ava. What? Cat shook her head. No, this will cool off. It's fine. In fact, I don't want to talk about the stupid stalker. There was silence for a minute. A huge smile filled Lucy's face. Doesn't fate just have a great way of working things out? I mean, for all these years, you and Marshall haven't talked. You married someone else. He got left at the altar. And then, bam. 
you're stranded on the side of the road, and Mr. Delicious shows up. Everyone burst into giggles. Kenzie lightly smacked Lucy on the shoulder. You're talking about my brother? Lucy shrugged. I call it like I see it. The man is hot, Cherie said. I'll give him that, even if he is one of the grouchiest people I have ever met in my entire life. She glanced at Cat. But he was grouchy even when we were young. Trent and Hunter always tried to stay out of his way unless he was with you. He was happier when he was with you. Cat had to smile. His siblings had always told her that she needed to stay around because they liked Marshall more when she was around. Marshall was just misunderstood. Personally, she had never viewed Marshall as grouchy. Of course, she could see how he came off that way to people, but he had always been her Marshall, even when they hadn't been in contact, which was also something she felt guilty about. Another chink in the long line of things about J.D. that she had to feel guilty for. What just happened? Kenzie asked, reaching out and putting her hand over Kat's. Nothing. Charisse and Lucy added their hands to the pile. Talk to us, Lucy said. We love you. For a long moment, Kat held her emotions in, but she was so tired, tired of keeping this to herself, tired of feeling angry and guilty and lonely and sad. So she told her friends everything. Chapter 13 Kat was a grown woman. Marshall knew that. He also recognized that she was in a bad mental place, and he couldn't leave her alone. He whipped out his phone and pressed Tim's number. What can I do for you? I can't find Kat. I went for a run and a swim, and now I can't find her. He raced from room to room to make sure she wasn't somewhere in the inn. Well, she's at my house. The energy whooshed out of him, replaced by relief. At your house? When did she go to your house? Kenzie is having a little powwow with the beach crew. I told her what you had said about Cat being in bed. She told me she would handle it, but I needed to find somewhere else to have dinner tonight. He sighed. Once again, the men have to suffer for the greater good of the women. Marshall relaxed. Still, it annoyed him that Kenzie hadn't texted him and at least let him know where she was. He thought about how worried he had been, then pushed those feelings aside. I'm glad she's okay. What are you up to? Marshall wasn't one to shoot the breeze. Look, Tim, I need to get ready for the nighttime party. He couldn't hide the sarcasm in his voice. Tim laughed. How about I stop and get you a sandwich and drop it by? Marshall felt guilty for being a jerk to his friend. That'd be great. They ended the call, and Marshall still had about a half hour until he needed to get the movie on and the snacks ready. He meandered into the library on the third floor. It was the kind of library that had tall shelves a person could access best with a ladder. Ava and Trey had stayed true to the original design, and they had also added a skylight. Moving slowly across the room, Marshall put out his hand and spun the globe in the corner, just as he and his brothers had done when they were younger. He paused in front of the window and looked out, watching several families and a few couples wander along the beach. Of course, his mind drifted back to Cat. He was glad that she was okay, but part of him wished that she was here, talking to him. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw a pile of books. His mother's journals, he realized. He took one out, opening it. They all knew about their mother's journals. She had talked about them before she passed, hoping they would read her journals after she was dead. She'd always been persnickety about that. She'd never wanted anyone to read her journals while she was still living. Marshall thumbed through the dates. These entries had been written when his father was still alive. He paused to read one about how much she'd missed his father, who had been deployed at the time. He shut the book and put it back, exchanging it for another one. But as he opened it, he noticed a page in the book that didn't belong there. It was a piece of notebook paper that had been crumpled. It was his. His heart raced as he flattened it against his thigh. 
It was actually his and Kat's. At the top of the page it read, A List of Things to Do in the Summer. He remembered writing this list. They had sat together in this library when she had just arrived. According to the date, he had been 16. Marshall smiled. He had wanted to kiss her so badly then. Times don't change much, he mumbled to himself. Since he'd seen her on the side of the road, his attraction to her had been off the charts. He felt like a teenage boy again. Only now, he was a man and she was a woman. And there was that inkling of possibility that he could have her. The force of that realization struck him like a nine on the Richter scale. He wanted her. He thought about how she'd accused him of shutting her out. They needed to talk about that. At least, he wanted to talk about it. She was so angry at him, but she'd been the one to end things. But she didn't seem to see it that way. Marshall returned his focus to the paper. He couldn't help but smile at some of the things they had put on the list. Number one, egg the Stout's house. The Stout's used to live a few houses down from them. They had two daughters who were close to his age. Both of the daughters had been snobby and rude. Cat had told him Elizabeth was a mean girl at school. She had liked to make fun of Cat and say all kinds of mean things about how she was adopted and a reject. The memory still evoked intense anger inside of him. Number two, play a prank on Ava and Trey. Number three, get Marshall's bike running. He smiled. Living in Boston hadn't lent itself to much driving, even though he had just turned 16. His mother had promised that if he could fix up the motorcycle, he could drive it as much as he wanted as long as he paid for his own gas. When he and Cat had finally fixed it, Cat had jumped on behind him. They had laughed and screamed as he drove it up the canyon as fast as he could. Wasn't it funny that every memory of Southport involved Cat? Then he saw it, a doodle of his mother's, with the words, Conquistador's Gold, on it. Excuse me, Marshall jerked, surprised to see one of the fellow guests. Hey! The woman tapped her wrist. When are you going to put on a movie? We're waiting. Marshall folded the paper and stuffed it in his pocket. I'm coming. He put his mother's journal back and then went down to start the movie. Almost two hours later, Marshall sat in the kitchen and listened to the end of The Lion King. Tim had brought him a sandwich and a radiator. The car part had come early and he wanted to get it installed. He wasn't paying attention to the guests. All he could do was stare at the piece of paper in front of him. The front door opened. He got up and headed that way. Should we just turn this off? The mom called after him. Sure, I'll come get it in a sec. And don't worry about cleaning up. I got it. How did Ava and Trey handle this all the time? Marshall did not like being a host. Shocker. Cat came through the door, and her eyes met his. Hey, sorry I didn't let you know where I was going. Oh, it's fine. Marshall inwardly laughed at himself. Specifically, he was laughing at this person he'd turned into, the one who didn't tell Cat how upset he had been at finding her missing. But he didn't want to be like that. He didn't want to be a dad to her. Did you have fun? She paused, and she looked up the stairs. He didn't know if she would answer, or if she would just go to bed. A light smile played at her lips. You know, your sister is a meddler, but she's a good friend. Relief coursed through him. She is a good friend. A couple of the guests moved down the hallway and then headed up the stairs. He put on a fake host smile. Have a good night, he told them as they moved past. Cat had a teasing look in her eye. What? I guess I'm disappointed. He felt like he was being set up, but he didn't care since she was smiling. What do you mean? Who are you? She flashed a fake smile and then mimicked him. Have a good night. So courteous. He laughed. What can I say? This is the mature version of me. Her eyes trailed down his chest, 
then up to his shoulders and back to his eyes. Had she just checked him out? Yes, it is. His heart hammered. He didn't want to call her on it, but he felt his own attraction grow. There was a lull as their conversation dissolved, becoming a stillness that kept happening in this new relationship between him and Kat. Do you want me to go? she asked. This hadn't been the question Marshall had anticipated. Why do you keep asking me that? I know I'm kind of a downer. I guess I owe you an explanation. Hell yeah, she owed him an explanation. It's fine. Look, I get it. You're dealing with stuff, he shrugged. Is there anything I can do to help? Her eyelids fluttered, and she looked down at her hands. Today was the day I buried J.D. There wasn't anything he could say, so he didn't say a word. She sighed. It's been hard. He stared at those perfectly green eyes. I'm sorry. Thank you. She moved past him and then up the stairs. Every part of him wanted to chase her down and demand answers. But he didn't do that. He wanted to be the kind of guy who could give her space without shutting her out. Marshall? She stopped and turned back. Yeah? If you listened to the messages, then why didn't you call me back? Marshall wanted to tell her the truth. But it was late, not to mention the fact that she had pretty much stayed in bed all day because she'd been so upset by her husband's passing. No, now was not the time to tell her. I'll tell you tomorrow. Her eyes narrowed. Why not tonight? It's late. Plus, I have good news I'd rather talk to you about. She looked surprised. What? It's about the treasure. The conquistador's gold? Is there any other kind? He smiled at her. His special forces training had taught him about pattern interruption. It was best to give your opponent a pattern interrupt if you wanted to distract them. What about it? He moved up the stairs and reached for her hand. Come to the library with me. Chapter 14 Cat walked into the library with her hand in Marshall's, and a million memories assaulted her. She'd been pulled from her earlier darkness by Kenzie, Charisse, and Lucy. Now she was totally distracted by Marshall's mere presence. I've always loved this room. He grinned and let go of her hand. I know. I always knew that if I couldn't find you, you'd be in here. She moved past him, spotting a wall covered in summer pictures. When she had first moved back to Southport, Ava had given her a grand tour of the place, but she didn't remember this wall and these pictures. There was a picture of her and Marshall's mother sitting on the couch, both reading. Emotion hit her, and she gently traced the glass. I miss your mother. Marshall moved next to her. Me too. Pictures of her and the beach crew and his brothers lined the wall. She moved on to a picture of just her and Marshall. The picture was of them, roasting s'mores. She distinctly remembered that night, because it was the first time he had held her hand. Shortly after, he'd gone back to Boston, but they had spent hours on the phone. They had even Skyped. But the more and more she'd thought about her feelings for Marshall, the more afraid she'd gotten. Her heart clenched as she thought of all that had been between them. Do you want to know why I didn't want a relationship with you? Marshall seemed to freeze beside her. If you want to tell me. How many times had she thought of having this conversation with him? Way too many. Her mouth went dry. Honestly, I never thought I'd get to tell you the truth. She glanced at him. His eyes were riveted on hers. I'm not going to lie to you, Marshall. It is so hard for me to talk about this. It's fine, Marshall said, crossing his arms and setting his jaw. To others, it might have seemed like he wanted to fight, but she knew he was completely focused. This had been the thing that others never understood about Marshall, except his siblings. The man was just intense. He'd always been that way, 
even as a kid. That was why they got along so well, she figured. She understood that serious side. And it felt like he understood her too. Even at the age of nine, and even though he'd talked about farting, she remembered he had this look in his eyes, a look that resonated with her and made her feel accepted. I'm waiting, he said. If I had a relationship with you, it meant I could lose you. I couldn't lose my best friend. As I look back, and as I have looked back over the years, I understand that I have a lot of abandonment issues. You were a constant for me. We were friends, and you were always there, and... She caught her breath, unwanted tears coming to her eyes. I was so afraid of not having you. For a long time, he only stared at her. The words kept coming. She needed to make him understand. I was afraid to go to the next level of a relationship with you. If you really think about it, I told you that. A lot. And I know that you didn't get it. We were young. I can look back and see that. She reached out and took his hand. You were stability for me. You were my best friend. At that young age, all I knew was that if we moved to the next level, if we dated and then possibly got married, I worried we'd end up like my parents. Not that we would have been drug addicts, but all of those feelings of abandonment as a child made me afraid. I didn't want to lose you. I couldn't lose you. She dropped his hand and roughly wiped her face. Then I lost you anyway. For a good minute, he seemed to collect himself. Then he said, I was so in love with you. Even though it was stupid, warmth filled her. She remembered that day he'd told her, I'm sorry. And then I shut you out. A look of horror washed over his face, and he was suddenly blinking. He took a step back, running a hand through his hair. You were right. I shut you out because I was a big, freaking idiot. I didn't realize what you were feeling. I know. When I'm not so emotional, I do know that you were angry. And you had a right to be. And I wouldn't call you back. With a laugh, he pulled her in and crushed her against him. The smell of pine, soap, and Marshall hit her. It was like she'd never forgotten this scent. It smelled so good. I'm sorry. He held her, pressed against his chest. I am so sorry. Chapter 15 Marshall held the girl he'd always loved. Of course you were afraid. You'd lost so much. He thought of her crazy, drug-addicted parents, of her mother. She'd shown up once when they were 13, and she'd begged to take Cat back. It had been really hard on Cat. She pulled back and reached up, softly putting her hand to his face. Her touch was electric, but he didn't show it. Her face was blotchy, and she was still crying, but she looked gorgeous. I'm sorry I hurt you she said. You don't know how many times I've wished I could go back and explain it. He grabbed her hand, pulling it into both of his. Things might have been different if I wouldn't have shut you out. Her eyelids fluttered, and she nodded. I'm sorry, he choked out. No, I'm sorry, she said. How had he not seen that? How had he not called her back? My pride was so hurt, and I couldn't see past it. So many emotions poured through him. It was like this dam of love he'd felt for her for so many years had started to crack, and the crack was just getting bigger. She sucked in a long breath. It's okay. I'm just glad I could tell you. It's a relief to me. He felt her tense, and then she pulled back tugging her hand away from him. He wanted to bring her close again, but she wasn't ready for what he was already feeling again. I... 
She trailed off and ran a hand through her hair. Awkwardness descended. Today she'd been mourning the loss of her husband. Marshall's new feelings started to cool. So what about the conquistador's gold? She asked. Right. Yes, a change of subject. He tugged the paper with their goals out of his pocket and held it out to her. Look what I found today in my mother's journal. A smile filled her face as she scanned the list. I can't believe your mother had this. The center of Marshall's chest warmed. He couldn't believe that his mother had kept it either. He pointed to the clue. Her expression turned to confusion. The conquistador's treasure might be on the west side of the cove? Under the rocky part? Maybe Mom found something in the journals and just jotted it down here. Why wouldn't she tell someone? I don't know. This is crazy, she stared at the note. Could it really be there? There was no way to describe how easy and fun discussing the treasure, something they used to discuss every summer, all summer, felt to him. There's only one way to find out. Let's go snorkeling tomorrow. I'm hiding out, she reminded him. Right. There is no one on the west side where the rocky part is. Plus, we are expert snorkelers. She put up a hand. I have not snorkeled in years. He batted it away. Who cares? It's like riding a bike. The memory of him teaching her how to ride a bike flashed through his mind. Wow, she ran a hand through her hair. I remember that day. I was so embarrassed that I didn't know how to ride one. I'd never learned, and you were so encouraging. It didn't take long to teach you. You were a natural. I think you pretty much taught me how to do everything. Ride a bike, surf, fish. Gut a fish, ride a motorcycle, he pointed at her. Don't forget the important stuff. That's true. If I ever had to live off the land, I could fish. Marshall felt that same old attraction, the one that had been there since he was a teenager. Don't forget if you had to live through a zombie apocalypse. She smiled. Exactly. That's why I'm so prepared. There was so much between him and this woman, so much that instead of being upset with her, now he was awash with humility and forgiveness. So are we going treasure hunting tomorrow? Sure. Why not? Chapter 16 Cat rode on the back of Marshall's motorcycle, gripping on to him tightly. They had worked together this morning to make the guests breakfast, and then they had headed out. They planned to stop at her house first, so she could get some different clothes and change her outfit. She had been wearing the same shirt every day. Her mother had packed a lot of pants, but no shirts. But none of those little details upset her. After she had gone to bed the night before, she had felt this deep peace. A huge weight had been lifted off her shoulders. Marshall knew the truth. He had accepted the truth. He'd forgiven her. And she'd forgiven him. She had slept well last night and awoke with a hunger she hadn't felt in a long time. She'd eaten a huge breakfast, and she was excited for today. Marshall got to her house and parked in the driveway. He cut the engine. She slipped off the bike. I won't be very long. This is a cute place. Can I have a look around? She knew what he was really saying. I don't need cameras. Marshall held up his hands in surrender. I just want to see your place. She headed to the front door. Of course. Come on in. But she stopped short as she saw the pie on the doorstep. And the note taped to the door. She cursed. This was not good. Marshall. He was next to her. What? She took the note and carefully opened it. It was written in the same block lettering that had been used for the other ones. Why aren't you at the cabin? Why aren't you home? Maybe you should leave Southport. Her hand trembled. The note slipped through her fingers. She didn't like being vulnerable. She didn't like someone watching her. Marshall bent and picked up the note. His lip curled into a snarl, and he tugged his phone out and pressed Tim's number. She would have argued with him, but she was so tired of this. 
Yeah, Tim, we're at her place. We stopped over here to get some of her things, and there's a pie and a note. The note is asking her why she isn't at the cabin and why she's not home, and it says she should leave Southport. Anger rose in sight of her as she picked up the pie. In the past, when she had received these baked goods and notes, she had kept herself calm. Usually, Cade was with her, and she couldn't let him know how much it freaked her out. But right now, she didn't need to remain calm. She gripped the pie with both of her hands and then dumped it over and threw it hard onto the deck. Then she stomped on it. I gotta go, Tim. I'll be in touch, Marshall said. He didn't make a move to interrupt her and her toddler fit. No, 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 she stomped on it again. I hate them. Marshall's arms wrapped around her. It's okay. It's okay. If this had been anyone besides him, she would have pushed them and told them to get away. But she spun and leaned into him, speaking into his neck. I hate this. He held her tighter. I know. Me too. We're going to find out who this is. She pulled back and stared into his face. The man had haunted her dreams for ten years. It was undeniable that she still felt so many things for him. The tidal wave of that realization washed through her, slammed into her, and left her reeling with confusion. I don't want to have these feelings for you. They scare me. Marshall's face sobered, and then softness crinkled into his eyes. He lifted a hand and brushed a tendril of hair out of her eyes. Nothing has to scare you. I'm the same Marshall I used to be, and I'm here. Your best friend is here. Believe me, whoever this crazy is that's doing this to you, they are gonna pay. The intensity of those words convinced her. It was comforting. She wasn't ready to tell him that she was really talking about the feelings she had for him, at least in part. Okay. He released her, but kept her hands in his. We're going to have to snorkel tomorrow. Today, we're going to get the cameras up. Relief rushed through her. She hadn't recognized the huge weight that she had carried. It felt nice to have someone she trusted helping her figure this out. Okay, let's do it. He paused. Hold up. Yeah? I know this is like the worst time, but would you ever want more than friendship with me? Her heart raised. Marshall. He pulled her hand to his lips, kissing the back of it. Don't worry about it. He gave her a mischievous smile and tapped on his chest right over his heart. But I know right here, Cat, you never stopped missing me. She glared at him. Like a bad rash. He let out a roaring laugh. That's a good one. Chapter 17 It didn't take long to visit the hardware store and get a bunch of cameras. The trouble was that Southport didn't have a lot of options, so they drove to Wilmington to get better cameras. Marshall even called Trey and got the lowdown on what he'd used for the inn. Of course, Trey took this new event as a personal assault on his family. He talked Marshall through how to quickly install the cameras and hook them up to the app. Then he went over everything security-wise, letting Marshall know what he needed to look for to prevent someone from even being able to get across the perimeter. They also discussed Kat's personal safety, making sure she had some pepper spray and a taser. His big brother was prepared, and Marshall was grateful for that. It was close to 7 o'clock when Marshall finally finished getting everything up and running at her house. Cat had been quiet for most of the day. She had tried to help him, and finally he told her that he would let her know if he needed her. She hadn't lain around, though. She had scrubbed the house from top to bottom. The work seemed good for her. She had way too much nervous energy going on. Not that he blamed her. He had nervous energy, too, and more than a few dark thoughts creeping up about the things he wanted to do to the person stalking her. While installing wire, he'd called Tim again and reviewed the past case history. He couldn't believe this had been going on for over a month. It was ridiculous. This guy had tormented her for over a month and nothing had been done? 
Tim had protested that Cat had been dicey about cameras and even filing reports. Well, that would change. Come hell or high water, they would find this crazy person. Do you want some soup? Marshall turned to find Cat standing in the doorway of the living room. He had been consumed in his thoughts, and he clicked through the camera app, making sure they were all connected. It was hard for him to believe how gorgeous this woman was. Even though she had changed into exercise clothes, and even though her blonde hair was pulled back in a ponytail, and her face had hardly any makeup on, she took his breath away. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. She gestured for him to follow. I set the table. It's ready. It felt so simple to go to the kitchen and sit down at the little table that overlooked the cute backyard. She had a little garden he'd noticed earlier. There was a rope swing and a bin full of balls, including a basketball, a soccer ball, and some frisbees. It was easy to imagine himself living here, to imagine that this was their life. But then he thought about her son. Would they have had a son? Guilt pricked at the edges of his heart. She had just lost her husband a year ago, and he'd seen how upset she was yesterday. Why was he thinking about that? He didn't want to have these kinds of thoughts. He wanted to be here for her. If nothing else, he wanted to be a best friend to her, the one he should have been for the past ten years. The table was set simply, with bowls, spoons, napkins, and glasses of ice water, the kitchen smelled heavenly. Is that fresh bread? He asked, breathing in the warm scent. She grinned as she slid into her chair. I bake when I'm antsy. Delighted, he grinned back at her. I guess that's why you own a bakery. Will you pray? She already had her hands out. It reminded him of his mother. She had always had them pray at the table. Sure. He said a quick prayer over the food and made sure to thank the Lord for the blessing that they were best friends again. Chills washed over him as he said the words. She pulled her hands back after the prayer was over. Do you know that the first time I ever prayed over food was at your house? Marshall had never thought about that. I didn't know that. She tugged the napkin from beneath her spoon and placed it on her lap. Your home was like a magical world to me. I always wanted my home when I grew up to be like yours. Again, a million questions ran through his mind. He wanted to devour the last ten years of her life and her experiences as he would devour intel on whatever op he was assigned to. But he had to handle her carefully. What was your home like with J.D.? He busied himself, putting his own napkin on his lap and then taking a sip of water. She hesitated then let out a derisive laugh. It wasn't like your home. Okay, now his curiosity was piqued. Why is that? J.D. was gone a lot. When he was home, he made it clear that we were on his schedule. If there was a game on, or if there was a program he wanted to watch, or if he was just binging a show. Then he didn't have time for things like prayer. And he didn't have time to talk. If he was in the mood to talk, then he talked. Unrest simmered within Marshall. He hated the man already. He focused on the food as best he could, but he felt himself getting more and more upset. Cat cut two pieces of the bread and handed him one. This is a secret recipe. If I told you, I'd have to kill you. That was another thing they used to say to each other. I'll take my chances. Marshall took the bread and brought it to his nose, sniffing at it. Wow, can't wait to eat it. He took a bite and was happy that he wasn't disappointed. He practically crammed the whole thing in his mouth. So good, she giggled. You're such a pig. He laughed, then took a gulp of water. Hey, don't make such good bread if you don't want me to stuff my face with it. She shook her head, giving him that smile. He knew it well. It told him she wasn't really mad at him. She actually liked his teasing. Both of them ate for a bit, simply enjoying the food. Marshall, I have to thank you for all your hard work today. I've been such an idiot thinking this would just go away. It feels so stupid. I mean, who just leaves baked goods around? But when I read that note today, I kept thinking that if this person knows where I am, 
or doesn't know where I am and he's worried about it, then what will he do if I do something he doesn't like? Like not be at the cabin? We're going to find him. Soon. He placed his hand on top of hers. I promise you don't need to worry about this anymore. I got it. I love this kind of stuff. Even though he was exaggerating, he gave her a smile with false bravado. You know what my unit is called, right? Okay, maybe he wanted to brag a tiny bit. He wanted to talk about how cool his job was, but he also wanted to reassure her. A tiny smile played at her lips. I don't know, I heard you were in the military or something, but I have no idea what you do. She was messing with him. He wouldn't lie. She knew how to get to him. Oh, really? You don't know? She shrugged her shoulders innocently. Are you a cook in the army? Is that what you do? Even though he knew she was teasing him, he didn't like it. It was stupid, but his ego took over. I'm called a night stalker. My special forces team, we stalk the night. We go into the most dangerous areas and we pick up Delta Force and Navy SEALs. Not when it's easy. We move in and we move out. He made an exploding gesture with his hands. And no one knows we were even there. Okay, fine. You're pretty amazing, she said the words sarcastically. But she winked at him. And maybe I'm a little bit grateful that you're here right now. To stalk my stalker. She was trying to put on a brave face. Marshall nodded, turning serious. We'll clean up here, go back to the inn, and then we'll watch the footage. Do you think we should put up some cameras at the bakery in Delhi? She frowned. What if he's watching the place? Let's watch tonight and see what we find. If there are no bites, we'll discuss a game plan with Tim tomorrow. No snorkeling? She asked, disappointed. Oh, we'll still get in snorkeling. She grinned, and the worry around her eyes lessened. Because if anybody's finding the treasure, it's us. She stood and began clearing the table. Dang straight. He took his dishes to the sink. She washed the dishes, and he picked up a towel and dried as she handed each one to him. This was also something they'd done together when she'd had dinner at his parents' house. The kitchen was small, and his shoulders brushed against hers. The more he was around her, the more he wanted her back. He tried to push the thought away. She needed a friend, that was all. After they were finished, she turned to him. Thanks. You're welcome. She stared at his lips. He caught himself before he could get too excited. No, he wouldn't worry about that. Marshall? Her tone was soft. Yeah? Are you ever going to kiss me again? Chapter 18 Cat couldn't believe herself. Had she just said that? Part of her wanted to melt into the floor. Right or wrong, she'd been wondering about that all day. The man was delicious. She laughed awkwardly and started to head back to the table. Never mind. Wait. Marshall's hand closed around her wrist, stopping her. His face had gone serious, and he pulled her closer. More adrenaline spiked through her. I can't believe I said that. His eyes narrowed. Cat. She met his eyes. They were different. When she'd seen him on the side of the road only two days ago, they had been guarded and a bit angry. But now they were pure blue, serene, calm. Yes. Do you want this? Nervous angst pummeled the lower pit of her gut. I don't know. But all I could think about today, as I got glimpses of you working diligently to install all the cameras, was how much I wanted to have another kiss with you. She blinked. And I know I shouldn't feel that way. He let out a light curse word. I thought you wanted friendship. I did too. With a chuckle, he shook his head. Woman, you confuse me. Gently, she reached up and traced the little scar beneath his eye. You confuse me too. I'm not going to lie. My marriage with J.D. was no picnic. 
and I have so much guilt over so many things that happened between us. But last night, when I went to sleep, all I could think about was you. He put her hand to his chest. Do you feel that? His heartbeat was racing beneath her palm. She nodded. I lost you once, and I don't think I could do it again. If you decide you only want friendship, I think I could do it, but I was broken for a long time, too, and I'm scared, too. So many emotions washed over her. Compassion welled up to overshadow them all. I'm so sorry. I was afraid of the fear I felt as a child then, but I'm not afraid anymore. He let out a light laugh and squeezed her hand. I always want to kiss you, Cat. I've wanted to kiss you every time I've been with you since I was 16 years old. That is a fact. Even the last couple of days, even when you're ticking me off, I always want to kiss you. Then kiss me now. She stood on tiptoes. Wait, I just... I have to know one thing. Okay. Why did you marry him? He took a step back, crossed his arms, and gave her a sweeping look that didn't make her feel comfortable at all. His scrutiny had her fidgeting. What? J.D., I watched you fall apart yesterday. Why did you marry the guy? I... I'm going to tell you something, Cat. I came back the next summer to Southport. I was heading over to see you and finally talk to you and hash all of this out. I saw you with some guy in his military uniform walking down Main Street. And then, when I went home and asked my mom, she told me you were engaged. He clenched his hand into a fist. I was so angry at you. I was so confused. Because even now, even after you told me that you were afraid to lose me all day long, I kept wondering why you weren't afraid to lose him. He wasn't my best friend. Not good enough. She threw her hands in the air. Do you want to know why I even talked to J.D.? Why I let him in my life? Marshall's eyes narrowed into slits. Yes, I want to know. How could you let another guy, a guy you might lose, into your life and be okay with that loss? How could you then not be okay with having me in your life? I told you. You were my best friend. You meant more to me than anyone. He threw a hand up at her. It reminded her of the fights they'd had over the years when they would get upset with each other and gesture so wildly. I loved you. You broke my heart. Why? Why could you be okay with losing me and not care if you would lose him? She didn't know how to explain it to him better than she had already. The only reason I spoke to J.D. was because I was at a college party and I was feeling lonely, and I was missing you. And there was this guy there, all by himself. He had on his uniform, and he reminded me of you. An incredulous expression washed across his face. J.D. reminded you of me. Cat was saying this all wrong. Just the military, okay? And that was when you were still shutting me out. I had left all those messages, and I was lonely, I made a mistake, Marshall, a mistake I have paid for in so many ways. I regret what I did back then. I regret how afraid I was to lose you. I was so afraid to lose you that I pushed you away. She was tired of fighting with him. With a curse, she closed the gap between them and put both hands on his face so she could pull him down to her. She paused right before their lips could meet. I loved you too. And that has haunted me for ten years. She pressed her lips to his. At first, he didn't react. He seemed stunned. Then, he put his hands on her hips and pulled her flush against him. The kiss went from gentle to passionate, like a car from zero to sixty. He deepened the kiss, and she rode on the waves. The sensation was euphoric. She had done so many fun things with this man when they were children. Right now, she felt like she was experiencing all of them at once. The feeling of flying and soaring and just plain having fun swept over her. 
He pulled back, and then a huge grin crept over his face. How was that? She let out a giggle, but her brows knit together. I don't know. Let's try it again. His laugh was muffled by their next kiss. Chapter 19 Later that night at the inn, as Marshall and Kat finished cleaning up the dishes in the television area where the guests had watched a movie, Marshall couldn't wait to kiss the woman again. In fact, he was pretty much obsessed with it. After they'd had their little make-out session in her kitchen, they had gone back to the inn. Both of them had mingled a little bit with the guests, and they had taken turns watching the feed from the cameras around her house. However, they had seen no one approach. There was a niggling feeling that maybe someone had watched them put the cameras up. Marshall had mentioned this to Tim only, because he didn't want to worry Cat, but he'd been checking the feeds around the inn, too just in case. He didn't like feeling as though someone might be watching. After the guests had gone to bed, Marshall and Cat sat in the kitchen and stared at the feed. He felt like his mind was in two places. Part of him was with her, experiencing this amazing journey back to love. He grinned as he thought about the words, back to love. Kenzie would have to use it as their book title. What are you smiling about? Cat scooted her chair closer and rested her head on his shoulder. Dang, he liked her. He liked how natural it felt to have her head on his shoulder. She was his best friend, and he connected with her so easily. I was thinking about our book title. What? You know, the book that Kenzie is writing about us? Cat laughed. Your sister? Did she tell you she's writing a book about us? She's mentioned it. He felt a bit vulnerable. New feelings and old feelings about Cat warred in his mind. He didn't look at her as he started the feed. Are you sure you want this? She snuggled into him, looping her arm through his and placing her hand over his hand. Maybe I shouldn't want this. Maybe I should still be mourning J.D. I don't know the right thing, and I don't know if you want this. I know you had someone else. He jerked to face her. Are you serious? I do want this. She sat up straighter. But we don't even know how this looks. This was a pivotal moment. Something private that she wouldn't tell anyone else. Marshall couldn't explain how he knew that. It was just the way he'd felt all those years growing up when they had been best friends and they'd told each other everything. I want however it looks. I want what it should have looked like a long time ago, before I was too bullheaded to answer your messages. Her bottom lip trembled. Marshall, I have to tell you something. Okay. The woman didn't know he was tough. Tougher than tough. He could handle missiles flying at him. Men dying around him. There was nothing she could throw at him that he couldn't handle. You're not going to scare me, cat. Just tell me. She took a deep breath and released it. The reason I was so upset yesterday is not just because that was the day I found out he was gone. It's because I'm the one responsible for getting him killed. Chapter 20 I thought he died when he was deployed, Marshall said slowly. Cat got to her feet, walking over to the large window. Even though it was dark, the moon was bright, and she felt the urge to do something she hadn't wanted to do in a long time. Can we walk on the beach and talk? Of course. He got up, and they headed out past the hot tub and the pool, and then down through the gate and out onto the beach. After they had walked for a long time, he asked, Are you going to tell me? The day before he left, we had a huge fight. I was done with the marriage. I was done with his narcissistic tendencies. He always had to have things his way. He always tried to make me into someone I wasn't. He criticized everything. 
so much emotional abuse. She waved her hand through the air. It doesn't matter. I just, I thought I would deal with it for Cade. Then, the day before he was going to be deployed, I was watching him play catch with Cade. They were throwing a baseball, and Cade was trying so hard, but he kept dropping it. J.D. threw it at him so hard that it hit him in the head because Cade was trying to dodge it. Then J.D. was yelling at him, telling him he had to toughen up or he wouldn't be good enough. The scene came back to her, clear as day, Cade covering his face and lying on the ground, J.D. yelling at him. And I just had this clarity in that moment. I knew I was done. So I told him. It was an explosive fight. I knew it would be bad. So I stayed at a friend's house. But the next morning, I got a text from him that said I was responsible if he was distracted and ended up dying. What? Marshall shook his head. That is so wrong. She was crying now, and he enfolded her into his arms. It wasn't your fault, Cat. It, that it, that's just, I know, she said cutting him off. I do know that, but there's just this guilt. He held her for a long time. Everything quieted inside her. Thank you. For what? Listening? I get it. I've been seeing a therapist this past year. He coughed and pulled back. It's because of my ex, the one who left me at the altar. Sarah told me that she couldn't marry me because she didn't think I would be a good father. What? He shook his head. Truthfully, it devastated me. I finally decided to get help after Mom died. I was so angry about so many things, and I needed help. It taught me a lot of things. The most important is that we are never what others tell us, unless we accept it. Marshall. He cringed. It's been hard, but I do understand why all those things hurt you. I can definitely understand why it was a hard year. Cat pulled him back into a hug, so overwhelmed by all that this man had endured. The sudden urge to punch out his ex swelled in her chest. What? I hate her, and I don't even know her. Marshall laughed and pressed a kiss to her lips. I know the feeling. Chapter 21 Marshall woke the next morning with a start. He sat bolt upright, instinctively grabbing for his phone. He checked the app. There had been nothing suspicious overnight. He pushed the covers off and slid out of bed. It was only 5.30. He walked over to the large window facing the ocean. The sun was coming up, and the colors of the sky were breathtaking. Home. It felt strange to think that word and feel like it might apply to him. He sucked in a deep breath. Kissing Cat was as good as he'd imagined over the past ten years. When he had walked her to her room, he'd felt like a teenager waiting for a kiss before his date went into the house. But it wasn't just kissing her that did it for him. It was holding her. It was talking to her. It was the exact connection that had been missing from his life. The part of him that was immature and stupid wanted to text his ex fiance and tell her that he wasn't broken, that he actually did connect with people. It was her who had the problem, not him. Wasn't it funny that Sarah's opinion mattered so much to him? His mother had often told him that she liked how he was around Cat. He was considerate to her and always laughed when he was with her. When the two of them were together, he was always the best version of himself. His mind wandered to what Cat had revealed to him about her life with J.D., and his heart ached for her. While Marshall would love to rub his ex fiancee's face in it, he only wanted Cat to see the truth. That she was amazing, and that J.D. was a jerk. From the way she explained things, she'd had every right to divorce him. 
He had just died first. Marshall put on his running clothes and headed out to the beach. He turned on classic rock, but after a few minutes, he turned it off. Instead, he did something that he had never told anyone about, something he'd started doing after Sarah left him at the altar and his mother had passed away. He talked to his mom in his mind. So that was where his mind went. He went to the library where she was reading, and he poured his heart out to her, telling her all about Cat and their situation. Before he knew it, tears had started rolling down his cheeks. In his mind, his mother hugged him. Back to Love is a good title for your book, she told him, smiling. He finished his run, and he wiped the tears off his cheeks. Yes, it is. Chapter 22 Cat Had Not Slept Well Once again, she had dreamt about J.D., but when she woke up, her spirits lifted as she smelled bacon. She quickly showered, even though they were going snorkeling. Hopefully Marshall remained true to his word, that they would go snorkeling today, regardless of her stalker. It made her smile to think about how Marshall thought he could boss her around. Truthfully, she didn't mind his bossing in this situation. As she finished putting on her makeup, her phone buzzed. She answered it. Hey, baby, how are you? Oh my gosh, Mom, you're not going to believe how much fun I'm having. Yesterday, me and Grandpa Bullock built a sandcastle so big, the people on the beach took pictures of it, and a couple even asked me to pose in front of it. She laughed. Even over the phone, his happiness was infectious. That's great. I miss you, Mom. How many sleeps until you come here? It was an inside joke, something they would always say with J.D. How many sleeps until he got home? She realized it wasn't that many. Three sleeps. Yeah, I'm so glad you're coming. I have so many things to show you. Her heart swelled. Wasn't this the exact thing she wanted? For Cade to want her? I'm excited to see you too, sweetheart. I love you. I love you too, Mom. Kat got off the call after chatting with her mother for a little bit. She went downstairs and walked into the kitchen. Marshall was laughing with two kids and their parents were laughing along with them. It was like a scene out of a Hallmark movie with an inn and the beach and happy people. Plus, the best part was that Marshall was wearing an apron. He spotted her, and his eyes warmed. Hey, sleepyhead, I made some breakfast for you. She moved to his side and leaned into him. He looked down at her lips, then to her eyes, and he smiled. Good morning. Good morning. Part of her wanted to lean up and kiss him, but she was shy doing that in front of people. She turned her attention to the food, staring at scrambled eggs and bacon and pancakes. And you said you couldn't cook. Marshall shrugged. He swiped a kiss from her, making her laugh. I guess I have the proper motivation. After everyone had eaten and shuffled off on their way, she helped Marshall clean the kitchen. Unlike the other days, when they had been careful as they walked past each other, Marshall took every opportunity to bother her. He tugged at a strand of her hair randomly, or wrapped his arm around her waist and gave her a quick kiss, or he would hip-check her as he walked past. It made her laugh, and it all felt so right being able to finally be playful with him. Are you ready for snorkeling? Happiness surged within her, but it was tempered by worry. Were there any hits on the apps? Nope, so let's just go have our fun, look for our treasure. He paused and flashed her a huge grin. We'll just have to keep waiting. She laughed. And find the treasure and be bajillionaires. That had always been the thing they had said to each other, that they would become bajillionaires. I like it. Almost an hour later, they got off the motorcycle and headed toward the west side of the cove. They walked through the caves, but instead of heading to the lighthouse, they headed in the other direction. Marshall had stopped at a rental place on the other side of town and rented them equipment for the rest of the day. She hadn't even gone in with him, because she didn't want anyone to recognize her. As they worked their way over the rocks and began to put on the equipment, she felt young again. 
Okay, you'd better give me a penny for your thoughts before I put on the snorkel gear and we can't talk. She finished putting on her fins and turned her attention to him. Thank you. For what? There's not enough time to go into all the things I'm grateful for, but thank you for forgiving me and for still being my best friend. She felt herself blush. And for being such a great kisser. He laughed. Hey, you never have to thank me for the kissing part. Are you going to put up or shut up, Stone? She gestured to the ocean. Let's go find this treasure, baby. And Cat? Yeah? Thanks for forgiving me, too. He winked at her. And you're not a bad kisser yourself. She shoved his shoulder. He laughed. They put their masks on and dove in. The side of the cove by the rocks was shallow, so they didn't have to scuba dive. They had spent many hours snorkeling this area, not for treasure necessarily, but because they loved to look at the flora and the fish and everything that the rocks provided. Their hands came together as if drawn by a gravitational pull. From the time they'd been young, they held hands when they snorkeled. It was easier to keep track of each other while they were circling. Marshall took the lead. The water felt amazing, so warm that Kat felt herself relax. She missed her son, but she hadn't realized how much she had needed a break, not just from Cade, but from work and from everything else. In this moment, she felt young and free, and she didn't care about finding the conquistador's treasure. Part of her liked the fact that there was always a treasure to hunt for. When she had been young, She'd felt a burning desire to find the treasure, but today, just snorkeling with Marshall felt like treasure enough. She didn't know how long they'd been snorkeling, each of them periodically diving deeper to turn over a rock, when Marshall gave her hand two squeezes, an indicator that he wanted to talk. They found their footing, and Marshall said, Lunchtime! Cat followed him back to where they had left their stuff on the shore. The man was gorgeous. He hadn't shaved in a couple of days. His facial hair was at that sexy stage, not too long and not too short. His blonde hair was almost to his shoulders, and he had a natural wave to it. Add in his piercing blue eyes and ripped body, and the man was a living version of Thor. Of course, he'd always been gorgeous. Growing up, he'd always run and done push-ups and sit-ups. He'd always been into clean eating, and they used to have a weight set out in the garage. If he wasn't working on his motorcycle, he spent hours pumping iron on it. So many old feelings, along with the attraction she felt for him now, washed through her. How would this ever work? The man's job was dangerous. Marshall got back to the place where they had put down the snorkel gear. Then he helped her out of the water. The man in front of her was much more than her childhood best friend Marshall. Now he was filled out and seemed so much more mature. The sight had made her nervous. Marshall shook out his hair. She giggled. I'm sorry, but you look like a dog. I've been called worse. He moved to his backpack and pulled out the sandwiches they had prepared. It was easy to sit next to him on a rock overlooking the ocean, to lean into him, and then to move back to back with him, the two of them using each other for support. This was the way it had always been. It was the way it always could have been. After a bit, Marshall said, We didn't have time to finish our conversation about J.D. She took a sip of water and tried to ignore the way her heart raced at the mention of her dead husband. It was true. She hadn't had a lot of time to explain to Marshall what she meant. You didn't kill him, Cat. He died serving his country. It was easier to talk about this situation when she wasn't staring into Marshall's eyes. I should never have given him divorce papers the night before he left. I should have waited until he got back. I will never forgive myself for that. Marshall let out a low sigh. Every time I go out on an op, I know the risks. I know I could die. When I signed up to serve my country, I took that on. And believe me, there's been countless times that I left and things weren't exactly right in my head. It didn't matter if it had to do with a relationship with a woman, with my mother, with one of my brothers, or with something I was internally struggling with. She felt him stand, 
and then he stepped around to crouch in front of her, taking her hand. Life is messy, but your husband, when he decided to serve his country, he took on some extra messiness. I can tell you from my own experience that it serves no one to second-guess the past. He let out a derisive laugh and pushed his other hand through his hair. Believe me, I have second-guessed so many things. Like what? she asked. She didn't want to overstep, but she'd heard from Kenzie that the last mission Marshall had gone on had not ended well. His face sobered, and he crossed his arms. Do you want to hear it? You're not going to scare me, she mimicked him. It was what he'd said to her the night before. But she honestly didn't know if it would scare her or not. Marshall hesitated. The last night of my last deployment, I was doing a hot pickup. There was gunfire on us, but I had to get my guys out. They were trapped in the Afghani desert. I dropped the bird into gunfire. One of my guys was on a gun, given the SEAL's coverage. His voice broke. She reached for his hand. He jolted, as if woken from a dream. It broke her heart to see how tortured he was. He enfolded her hand in both of his and stared down at them. Everyone got on, and just as I was lifting off the ground, a missile hit my tail end, and boom. She didn't know what to say. He closed his eyes. She felt his hands shaking. Marshall was a good man, a man that believed in things like honor, duty, courage. It's okay, she whispered. His eyes flashed open. A tear ran down his cheek. No, it's not. I lost three guys that night. That's on me. I keep thinking, if I would have sat her down somewhere else, if I would have waited to land and circled back, maybe those guys would still be alive. She wanted to protest. She wanted to give him the same argument he'd given her about how all the guys knew the risks. But he'd never accept that. Marsha would take complete ownership, and she knew that. I'm sorry. He sucked in a long breath and then blew it out. It's, I'm grounded still, because I didn't pass the psych eval after everything. She squeezed his hand, wishing she could take his pain. I'm sorry. The words weren't enough, but they were the only comfort she could give. Thanks. For a long time, they simply stared into each other's eyes. There were so many feelings she wanted to express. This man, this good man, had been through so much. Fear suddenly gripped her. She released his hand and stood. I don't know if I can handle this. I'm just realizing that a relationship with you would mean you would worry even more. He stared up at her. So what? She remembered Trey and Ava's story. Trey wouldn't marry Ava because he hadn't wanted to die like his own father had done. Marshall stood, a serious look on his face. I still have two years. My commitment is for two more years. Honestly, I've never thought about what retirement would look like. I love my job. I love flying. I couldn't give it up. I would never ask that. Again, a standoff. He reached out, taking her hand. But Kat, I can't deny that I love you too. How can you say that? She threw her hands in the air. We just reconnected. It's been ten years. You were going to marry another woman a year ago. I was married. Marshall shook his head. No. Listen. There's a place that exists outside of our minds and our bodies. There's a place that, I believe, we came from, and we will go back to. Some people call it a soul, new age stuff. I don't know what they call it. The truth? He tapped the center of his chest. That's the place where I love you. That place will always exist inside of me, no matter if we're together or not. And just because I didn't realize how much I still love you, even after all these years, that doesn't mean those feelings weren't there. 
and didn't exist. She felt raw and naked and exposed. But she knew he was speaking the truth. She smiled at him. I guess that's where best friends exist. He returned the smile and put his hands out. Yes. Yes. He pulled their hands to his lips and kissed the back of her hand. But I'm not going to delude myself or you. I want a life together. And I know that life doesn't have any guarantees. But I've lived ten years without you. Those were hard years, Cat. Those were hard years without you. The words warmed her heart, and she willed what he was saying to be true. Those were hard years. They stared into each other's eyes. Time seemed to stop altogether. We can figure this out together. He turned to face the ocean. There was a hitch in his voice. When I first got here, Trey told me that he wanted me home. He told me that I could belong here. And of course I dismissed it. But I don't think I belong here. He met her gaze. I think I belong with you, wherever that is. Part of her couldn't believe that she and Marshall could figure it all out. It was the logical part of her, the part that had opened two businesses in the past year, organized her work schedule and her son's schedule, and dealt with Stan and Margie's schedules, and always tried to stay in control. However, there was another part of her, the part that Pastor Henry had spoke about just the other day. That part of her knew God could create a way when there wasn't one. God heard her and wanted to help. God was still aware of her. I guess we have faith, she said, relenting. Marshall pulled her into him and held her tight. He stroked a hand down her hair. We have faith. Chapter 23 As Marshall snorkeled with Cat's hand in his, he replayed their previous conversation. It was plain as day that she was still afraid. He could understand why. She had blamed herself for the past year for J.D.'s death. She had worked so hard to be a good mom and to open two businesses, not to mention the fact that he had shut her out all those years ago. There was so much relief that came with the knowledge that she had forgiven him. There was so much relief that came from forgiving her. For so long, he had built the story in his head, the story about how she had pushed him away, how she'd never felt anything for him. He'd imagined that she was living this idyllic life with her husband and son. Now that he knew the truth, his whole paradigm had shifted. Everything had changed. All that mattered was her and he found himself daydreaming of a life together and being her best friend again. Of course, he wanted more, but he would wait. He had been waiting on her since he was nine years old. Something shiny caught his eye, and he gave her hand a squeeze before he let it go. He deep-dived and brushed away sand and grit as he pulled out what appeared to be some kind of metal chain. He scrubbed his thumb over the shiny object. It was some kind of pocket watch that looked old. The front had a cross on it. He swam back to her and then pointed, signaling for her to go above water. They both emerged, and he held it up, delighted. Check this out! He pulled the goggles away from his eyes. She already had her goggles off and was reaching out, putting her hand beneath the metal and rubbing the same spot. It's a pocket watch. As if in sync... They headed for the shore. A thought occurred to him. That cross, the way it looked like it was painted on, the double lines. She interrupted his thoughts, grinning widely. That's the same picture in your mother's journal. I know. Energy surged through him. They threw their stuff down, and they put their heads together and stared at the watch. He carefully opened it, revealing what used to be the working components. Cat turned it and stared at the front of it. No doubt about it, this is the cross from the journals. Let's get back to the house and check it out. Chapter 24 Marshall was jittery and excited as they pulled up to the inn. 
They parked the motorcycle, both of them excitedly talking about the pocket watch and the cross and his mother's journal. I think the symbol is actually in my great-grandfather's journal, too, Marshall said as he grabbed the backpack and they headed into the house. I bet it is. Your mother showed me those journals a long time ago, and I never paid attention to some of the symbols that were written on the edges until now. The fact that they had actually found a clue to the treasure had set Marshall's heart pumping with adrenaline. Come on, let's run up there. When he got to the stairs and Vince's little desk, though, Vince stood. Hold on. He looked between them. I think I should show you this. Cat had been laughing as she ran after Marshall, and she nearly fell when he stopped abruptly. Marshall grabbed her arm to prevent her from falling, and she straightened up. Vince looked between them, and something in his expression told Marshall that he understood they were in a relationship. Sorry. Marshall did not want to waste time talking to Vince about the details of the guests during the day. He didn't enjoy hearing about how many towels were left over and who asked for more little shampoos. He wanted to get up to the journals. Can this wait, Vince? Vince held up a paper plate that had rotten, withered fruit on it. I don't think so. When I opened the front door earlier, I found this on the steps. He picked up an index card, and it had this note with it. It's kind of disturbing. It reminds me of one of those old horror movies like I Know What You Did Last Summer. Doesn't it seem strange? Marshall felt Cat tense. Instantly, he reached for the plate and the note. Cat's hand went to her lips. Oh my gosh. Marshall read the note. Why are you at the inn? Why are you hiding? I want to have what you have. You could make this so much easier if you would just leave. Marshall cursed and whipped his phone out. Let's go upstairs. He didn't need Vince as an audience. Thanks, dude. He marched up the stairs and Cat followed. He pressed Tim's phone number. Tim answered on the first ring. Marshall, have you got the radiator in yet? No, listen. We got another note. We got some old fruit, some rotted fruit. They got to the third floor, and he led them down the hallway and into the library. Cat was twirling her hair in an almost manic way. Oh, man, Tim said. The note says, Why are you hiding? I want to have what you have. You could make this so much easier if you would just leave. Have you checked the cameras? Did anyone see anything? Marshall opened up the app that had the cameras on the end, and he began looking at footage. Vince was the one who intercepted this little plate and note. He said he just opened the door and it was there. He shuffled through the footage. I can't distinguish who it is, but I'll send you the clip. Tim cursed. Okay, I'll look at it. We have to figure out who this is. I hate this for her, Marshall. If this weirdo knows she is staying at the inn, you might be putting the guests in danger. Angst flowed through Marshall. You're right. I'll call Trey and we will decide what to do. He ended the call and turned to see Cat staring out the huge window that overlooked the beach. She was still twirling her hair. He moved to her side and took her hand. I can't stay here. I can't put everyone in danger. His mind was already churning with possibilities that would keep her safe and protect the guests. Then we go somewhere else. She turned to face him. You're here to watch the inn. He shrugged. I'll call Kenzie. I know she and Tim don't want you to be in danger either. Maybe we just go stay at your place. She rapidly blinked and pulled away from him, putting her hand to her head. I don't like this. What does that even mean? She gestured to the plate of rotten fruit. I want what you have. It would be easier if you just left. What is he even talking about? And why did he go from baked goods to... To old fruit. I don't know. No one's going to get you, Cat. No one. Marshall wanted to fix this for her. More than anything, he wanted to make her feel safe. Determination coursed through him, and he felt like he was on an op. He was going to protect the guests and stay true to his word, no matter what. It's going to be okay. We're going to figure this out. I know we will. 
She leaned into him, and he opened his arms and held her. She searched his face. Thank you. Thank you for being in this with me. Marshall's chest burned. He thought about what his ex had always said about him having a savior complex. One thing was for certain. He would save this woman. No one would get her. Not while he was still kicking. Chapter 25 Cat's life was flying off the rails. Her son was gone, and the notes and the crazy stalking thing. Not to mention the fact that a man she'd lost over ten years ago was back in her life. Even with the out-of-control elements in her life, though, one thing felt so right. She had Marshall at her side. The two of them spent the next hour strategizing. They called Kenzie, and she and Tim came over. They worked it out so Kenzie and Tim would stay a couple of nights at the inn. Once that was taken care of, she and Marshall told Kenzie and Tim about the watch, and they all spent time poring over his mother's and grandfather's journals. Now, Cat and Marshall drove to her home. They had all decided it might be safer for the guests if Cat wasn't at the inn. She felt horrible about putting everyone in a dangerous situation. As she walked up the steps to her front door, she stopped in her tracks. A stuffed monkey sat on the doorstep, holding tambourines. What the heck? She moved to the monkey and saw a note next to it. She picked it up. Quit toying with me. Just give me what I want. The note dropped from her suddenly trembling fingers. Oh my gosh. Marshall put his hands on her arms. His gaze drifted to the monkey and the note, and a low growl worked its way through him. What. The. Hell. She squeezed her eyes closed and felt Marshall pull her into him. How could she have thought this was just a passing crush? Whoever is doing this is crazy, Marshall. He let her go and bent to pick up the note and monkey. Yes, they are. But guess what? What? My siblings and I are crazier. He gave her a wink and then took her hand. It's going to be okay. An hour later, they sat on the back porch of her little house and held hands, talking in low whispers. It was almost 11 o'clock at night. They decided to call Marshall's siblings tomorrow and talk about the situation. I wonder if the stalker will come to the inn or my house tonight, she said, her voice catching. Marshall gave her hand a squeeze. It's like they're watching and know where we are. Cat tried to calm herself, but it didn't work. I need to distract myself. Let's talk about the pocket watch. She moved back into the house. I want to show you something. I noticed it earlier. Marshall followed her into the house. She led him into her cozy living room, where they seated themselves. She pulled out some of the journals they'd brought. She opened one of his grandfather's journals carefully, flipping to the page she had noticed earlier, but hadn't thought much about. See how there's this cross on every left page? Marshall peered at the book with her. Yes. Kenzie and I were wondering if it wasn't just a crest or a symbol of God. I'm wondering if this symbol had a different meaning for the conquistadors. I don't know. Marshall carefully took the book out of her hands and flipped through it. Honestly, I'm not the expert on these. Brooks is probably the one we should talk to. Right. He stared at her. You want me to call him, don't you? She shrugged. Only if you want to. He glared at her. Don't pretend it's my idea. She laughed. His relationship with Brooks had always been a bit rocky. Fine. Chapter 26 Marshall dialed Brooks's number. I want to talk to him about the stalking situation anyway. Marshall turned away from her and walked into the kitchen as he made the call. Brooks answered, Yes. It is customary, brother that when you answer the phone, you say hello. Sure, it was petty, but his relationship with Brooks had always been a little bit petty. Maybe it was because they were so much alike. That was what his mother used to say. 
They were both competitive, and they were both athletic. But one big difference was that Brooks was a know-it-all, and he liked to make sure everyone knew that he knew it all. A derisive laugh came from the other end of the phone. <laughs> I guess I'll take that as an apology for being an idiot the last time I saw you. Marshall rolled his eyes, but he didn't want to continue a fight that was stupid anyway. Plus, he needed Brooks's help. Boy, Brooks snickered, which rubbed Marshall the wrong way as usual. Usually your timetable to ever apologize to me would be when hell freezes over. So I am guessing you need something. Your arrogance is always so refreshing. Brooks let out his real laugh then. Not his snobby Ivy League laugh. What's going on? I have two situations. The first one is great-grandfather's journals. You and Mom knew them inside and out. Do you remember that cross that was painted at the top of the pages? Ah, uh, yeah. The one that was double-brushed. Exactly. We found a clue that Mom left in her journal, and it led us to snorkel by the ocean on the west side, by the rocks with all the flora. I'm listening. Brooks's interest had clearly been piqued. We found this old pocket watch. It's rusted pretty horribly. Marshall flipped his phone to camera mode. I'm taking some pics, and I'm sending them now. Cat and I just wonder how it fits in as a clue to the treasure. Hmm. Brooks was quiet for a second. That's cool. Wow. He let out another derisive laugh. Again? We're all on some treasure hunt, aren't we? How are you, Cat? Hey, Brooks. Cat smiled at the phone. She'd snuck up at some point to join in the conversation. All of them had so much history together and the treasure was drawing them together again. Kenzie told me you were watching the inn for a couple of weeks. Is everything okay there? Of course Kenzie had been talking to him. Cat and I have a, uh, situation. Kenzie told me that Cat was hiding out at the inn. Marshall threw a hand in the air. I thought that was supposed to be confidential. Clearly that word isn't in our sister's vocabulary. Don't get on Kenzie's case. Brooks's tone had an edge to it. She's already under enough stress with the baby. She doesn't need to worry about you and your hang-ups with me. She can't keep her trap shut, Marshall retorted. Our sister is in a fragile state. I call her once or twice a week to check in on her. She talks to get her mind off her worries and her own body and being able to carry this child. Cut her a break. Plus, it's me. Do you think I give a crap about what you're doing or who you're spending time with? Cat poked him, frowning. Fine. Marshall scrunched up his face at her. Regretfully, Brooks was right. Kenzie made it a point to stay close to all her brothers, even though some of them were more difficult than others. Marshall loved that about her. Plus, Brooks was right. She was in a fragile state. Marshall should be more like Brooks. He should be calling her and checking in on her. Who did Kenzie have? Sure, there was Tim and Trey and Ava, but she couldn't confide in their mother anymore. He suddenly saw the whole situation with Kenzie in a new light. What about Cat? Marshall swallowed his pride. Cat has been having these weird notes left on her car and her home for the past couple of weeks. How many notes? When did they start? Exactly what have they said? Luckily, Marshall knew those details. He rattled them off to his brother, along with the gifts that had accompanied the notes. Dried fruit? Brooks asked. Cat, why would they do that? I have no idea. And there was a monkey when we drove up to my house. A toy one with tambourines. The note said, Don't toy with me. Honestly, I didn't think it was that bad of a situation until now. She glanced at Marshall. Maybe seeing me with Marshall ticked this person off? Hmm, <laughs> Brooks said. I've dealt with a lot of cases with stalkers involved. There's usually something symbolic about what they leave. Why would it suddenly go from baked goods to dried up fruit to a monkey? And I'm not saying that you know the reason. A lot of times victims don't think they know. I want you to take a second, close your eyes, 
and try to get a feeling of what this might be about. At this point, it sounds like you don't know if it's a male or female. You don't know if they're crazy or not crazy. So just close your eyes. Is there anyone that you have been dating? Marshall hadn't even thought about that. He wanted to know the answer to that question, too. No, I haven't dated anyone. I've been too busy running my businesses. Has anyone asked you to go on dates? Random people ask me out sometimes. There's a guy who comes to Southport that works in a law firm in Wilmington, Richard Hill. He's asked me out a couple of times when he's here to visit his mother. I've always told him no. He doesn't seem like a stalker type, though. Marshall was registering this information. In his mind's eye, he could see a man in a suit coming into her deli, flashing his pearly whites. In his hand, the man held a fancy briefcase, and his head was covered in slicked back hair. Maybe he had just come out of court. Of course Cat had men hitting on her. She was gorgeous and funny and kind and... I'm writing his name down, Brooks said. Anyone else? Cat scrubbed her forehead absentmindedly. Uh, I mean, I go out with the girls. Lucy, Cherise, Kenzie, Ava. We do brunches that Lucy organizes, but... Marshall was happy to hear that. Well, I'm fairly certain the stalker isn't one of those girls. Brooks let out a light laugh. I mean... I'm not 100%. Anyone else you can think of. Anyone that gives you a weird feeling. She seemed to be searching her mind for an answer. After a minute, she shook her head. No. No one that I have found dangerous. It irked Marshall, on some level, that Brooks was more effective at helping Cat out with this situation. That was his stubborn ego and pride talking, though and he was willing to sacrifice his pride for her safety. Cat seemed to hesitate. Well, Stan asks me out sometimes, but it's totally silly. He talks to me about fishing a lot. Everything suddenly came together. I think that's it, Marshall said, speaking into the phone. Brooks, Stan had given her keys to his cabin to give her a break this last week, but her car broke down, and that's when I found her and took her back to the inn. It would make sense that he would realize that she wasn't up at the cabin. He probably went up there to check on her, and then came back and left the pie on her porch. And then he set up some device to watch us and realize that she came back to the inn with me. It made him feel useful that he was helping to figure things out. Maybe. Brooks didn't seem too excited about that idea. Cat shrugged, meeting Marshall's eyes. It just doesn't seem like Stan is like that. He doesn't seem weird or creepy. You never know. With the things I've seen doing my job, it's usually the person who feels the least likely that ends up being the one. Chapter 27 They finished their call with Brooks. Cat ran shaking hands up and down her arms as Marshall set his phone on the counter. Okay, Marshall said, so we hang tight and see what little bro can come up with. This is ridiculous. She had put her own life and her son's life in danger. Emotion hit her like a tsunami. I can't believe I didn't take this more seriously. I can't believe I put my son's life at risk. How long has this guy been stalking me? How long has he been watching me? I was too damn busy doing everything else to pay attention. My own parents warned me, and I didn't listen. I didn't listen to anyone because of my pride. She moved away from Marshall. Her world was spinning out of control, just like it had on the day after she found out J.D. was dead. She went to the cupboard and pulled out a glass, which she filled with water. Only when she was gulping it down did she realize that she was parched. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. She had found herself chanting those words over and over after J.D. died, and she had been left with the guilt. She found herself chanting when she was overwhelmed at the bakery or at the deli. In fact, now that she thought about it, she chanted quite a bit. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Marshall's arms engulfed her. It is okay. He leaned into her, and she relaxed and let herself be held. You can't beat yourself up. 
It's not going to help, believe me. I know that from personal experience. All we can do now is think about the next step. She turned in his arms. You don't understand. Everyone told me this was a big deal, but I just brushed it off. I didn't take it seriously. And now? She flung a hand into the air. Now I find out this creep isn't playing around. He's clearly been watching me for longer than I thought. I mean, I thought it was some harmless guy writing those crazy notes. And the fact that he was leaving baked goods just felt really, I don't know, teenager-ish. Like I was his crush or something. It's my fault, Marshall. My fault. I should have known better. I'm a mother, and now I've put everyone in danger because of my stubbornness. Cat, it's okay. It's okay. I'm here to help you. It was too much. Everything was too much. I'm sorry. I, I just need a moment. She rushed out of the kitchen. Cat! Marshall followed her as she hurried down the hallway to her bedroom and opened the door. Just wait a second. She hesitated before turning to face him. Marshall, I know you think I'm strong. I know that I am strong, but when I don't feel strong, I don't like help. I didn't have help the past ten years. I don't need help now. I'm sorry. She stepped into her bedroom, closing the door before Marshall could protest further. Chapter 28 Later that evening, Marshall received a call from Brooks. Hey, he said, adrenaline kicking up. I think I found something. Hit me. Stan has a record. He did a stint in jail before he served in the Marines. Hold up, I want Kat to hear this. Marshall walked down the hallway and lightly knocked on her bedroom door. Kat, Brooks is on the phone. He's found something on Stan. Cat hesitantly emerged and waited. Okay, we're both here now. Marshall looked nervously at Cat. Earlier, when she'd broken down, all he'd wanted to do was comfort her and make everything okay for her. It upset him that she thought falling apart in front of him was weakness. Why would she ever think that? But he had to push that thought out of his mind right now. They had more pressing issues. Cat. I was telling Marshall that when I looked up Stan, he had a record. Before he was in the Marines, he did a stint in jail. Her hand went to her mouth. What? For stalking. A girl had a restraining order against him, and he broke that restraining order three times. Oh my gosh. Why didn't I know that? She shook her head. I should have run a background check. The guy served his country for 20 years. I mean, I think he redeemed himself. Brooks let out a long sigh. I don't know if he's our guy, but in my experience, past performance predicts future behavior. Every part of Marshall had to resist the urge to get on his motorcycle, go track down Stan, and pound his face. Breathe in, two, three, four. Breathe out, two, three, four. Breathe in, two, three, four. Breathe out, two, three, four. For. So what's our next step? He asked calmly. It wouldn't serve Cat if he got upset. It wouldn't serve anyone if he exploded right now. The problem with these things is that you actually need proof. You need footage. I know that probably feels impossible to you, Cat, because you haven't been able to catch him. Think about the times you received the notes. Would it have been possible for him to do it? You mentioned that you were supposed to go to his cabin. That leads me to believe that he possibly already had a camera set up. Or he physically went up there to see if you were there. That's the only way he could have known you weren't there. Cat turned in a little circle. She looked lost. I really can't believe Stan would do something like this. He's just not that type of guy. He's so steady. You should have seen him when I first met him. He was grieving the loss of his wife. She died of cancer. He's been mourning her for the past few months. People often aren't what they seem. If Marshall had learned anything in his life, it was that anyone could be anything. Children could be suicide bombers. 
a person who said they were working for the American government could carry a bomb and blow up his bird. He didn't want to scare her, and he didn't want to escalate the situation, but he also wanted her to realize that she couldn't be so naive. I know people say they change, but they don't. A soft laugh came from the other side of the telephone. Cat, you know that all of us stone boys were bred to help where we can, trust where we can, but be suspicious and ready for a fight. Cat's head bobbed up and down. I know. You guys know how I grew up. I know that not everything in life is roses and daisies. Honestly, I'm blown away thinking that Stan could be the one doing this. I'm just trying to put together the notes. Give me what I want. Is that sexual? He never hits on me, and he's like 15 years older than me. I've never felt like he wanted a relationship with me. It's going to take some time, Brooks said. I suggest you and Marshall get some sleep tonight. I'll get some sleep tonight, too. We'll talk tomorrow about some ideas. Cat nodded. Okay. Marshall? Marshall tugged the phone closer to him. Yeah? I'm thinking we put up some surveillance around her stores. Maybe even some surveillance around the guy's house. You'll need to talk to Tim about that. Can do. I'm going to let you guys go, but we'll talk tomorrow. Thanks, bro. Love you. Thank you, Brooks, Cat added. No problem. At least, no problem for you, Cat, he laughed. Love you, bro. Marshall pressed end. Cat shook her head. I would have never thought it was Stan. Tentatively, Marshall reached his hand out to her. It was kind of stupid. But ever since they had talked through every old feeling, he was unable to stop himself from touching her. Just because you're afraid, just because you're vulnerable, doesn't mean you're going to lose who you are. Plus, remember that I've known you since we were nine. You're one of the strongest people I know. Even after all that crap you went through growing up, you were able to succeed and do all that you've done in your life. He grunted and threw a hand in the air. The fact you even went through an abusive husband says a lot about you, Cat. And I think you're an amazing mother. Of course, I don't know how you mother. I'm looking forward to seeing that. But you're doing a good job. And I'm grateful I'm here in your life. I hope I can help. Whether there's a relationship between you and me or not, I hope there is. But either way, you have your friend back. You can always count on that. She blinked, and then a smile played at her lips. Sorry I had a mini freak out about us. He shrugged. It's fine, and I mean it. I'll be your friend, no matter what. Okay, I'm going to hold you to that even with crazy monkeys and all. Chapter 29 The next day, Cat and Marshall met with Tim, down at his office. They went through everything they knew about Stan. They talked about possible ways they could put up cameras on opposite sides of the street without alerting anyone. Tim tapped on his desk. I could have my guy pretend he's doing work on the stoplight. He can put up a camera that looks directly at both stores. That's a good idea, Kat agreed. Even though she hated being in the situation, it made her feel good that they were taking action. She didn't know if Stan was the stalker, but they had to find out for sure. Kat and I agreed, Marshall told Tim. She'll go into work as soon as you have those cameras up. Hopefully... It will give whoever is doing this time to put another note on her windshield tonight, or whenever they do it. I'm also going to add cameras across the street from her house and the inn, so that should give us a wider range. Tim leaned back in his chair and nodded. I'm sorry I didn't act quicker on this, Cat. I should have gone ahead with a full-scale investigation. Cat smiled. Tim was good at beating himself up. I'm the one who didn't want to take action. I didn't think it was a big deal. I thought it would end. It's my fault. She would not be a victim in her own life ever again. 
Chapter 30 Marshall watched from the covert position of a park bench that gave him a bird's-eye view of the deli and bakery. Tim's guy was already installing cameras on the stoplights. He watched Cat pull in and park her car. She glanced his way and then went into the deli. Marshall was not a patient man. More often than not, his problems in life stemmed from the fact that he wasn't patient enough. Even in this situation with Cat, if he would have answered her messages or called her back, the last ten years could have been very different. But he was done punishing himself for the past. He felt so protective of this woman. With Cat, it was like so many parts of his life had crossed over. He loved her. Yes, he admitted that to himself. He had never stopped loving her. It was more than just loving her. She really was his best friend. They could laugh together, and he never had to explain himself. One of them could say a single word, and the other would understand exactly what it meant. It was refreshing. Plus, she was a good person. A dang good person. Sure, she felt guilty for serving J.D. divorce papers before he was deployed and then killed. But the guy sounded like a grade A jerk. He pushed those thoughts away. None of that mattered. Jittery and anxious, he stood and paced. Even though the temperature was in the 90s, he wore a gray hoodie and a pair of sunglasses, and his hood concealed his head. It wouldn't do to be recognized. He could have patience when he needed it. He was a night stalker, after all. He wouldn't be outstalked by some amateur. Chapter 31 Even though it felt like bees were stinging Cat's guts from the inside when she walked into the deli, she put on a smile and pretended she was delighted to be back. Stan and Margie rushed to her and hugged her. She explained how she had broken down. Marshall had taken her back to the inn, and she had ended up staying there. She left out that the stocking had gotten worse. She had to play it cool. She had to give Stan the chance to hang himself, if he really was her stalker. So you didn't go to the cabin at all? Margie asked, leaning on the counter and twirling her hair. No, I was lucky Marshall drove by when he did. Cat let out a breath. I don't know what I would have done without him. She tried to cast a glance at Stan, without looking like she was accusing him. Well, I'm glad that you still didn't come back to work. Stan smiled and patted her shoulder as he moved past. You needed a break. Are you hungry? I'm good. Margie grinned at her. I could bake you something. I'm good, Cat repeated. The last thing she needed was to throw up. Chapter 32 Marshall watched for a long time. Finally, Cat texted him. We are just doing closing stuff. I'm going to be another hour. You don't have to wait. He texted back. No way I'm leaving. Did she really think he would even think about leaving? Again, he thought about everything she had told him about J.D., the way he used to demean her, how he had made her feel like she wasn't important. Part of him wished the guy was still alive, so he could put a fist in his face. C'est la vie. Wasn't that what he was supposed to say about the past? The things Sarah had told him were ridiculous, he realized. It had been so amazing to talk to Cat about the lie Sarah had told him, the lie about how he would make a horrible father. Part of him was grateful for that experience. Now he understood how people could believe lies, even lies that hurt them. He wasn't sure how long it had been when Margie walked out of the restaurant and got into her car. She pulled out of the parking lot and left. The only ones left in the restaurant were Stan and Cat. His heart sped up. He didn't like to think of Stan being in there alone with her, especially now that they knew about his rap sheet. Fine, it wasn't a rap sheet. It was one case, and after dealing with his own ex's craziness, he didn't want to jump to conclusions about Stan's past. But something in his gut told him there was something going on that had nothing to do with work. 
Out of nowhere, a figure dashed across the street and stood by Cat's car. He bolted from his seat on the park bench and simultaneously texted a heads-up to Tim and Cat. The person was dressed exactly how he had been dressed on camera, with a nylon over his face and a long black coat. He was putting a plate and another note on Cat's car. Marshall dashed across the street and then moved toward Cat's car. As he got closer, he could see that the person wasn't that big. He had a slight frame. It wouldn't be hard for Marshall to disable him. The person turned, stumbling into Marshall. A shrill scream erupted. Ah! Marshall grabbed him by the shoulders. Gotcha! Let me go! Just hold still! Marshall bear-hugged the man. But wait, it wasn't a man. The stalker was a woman. Cat threw open the deli door and rushed toward them. Who is it? Whoever it was, she was struggling like crazy. Marshall grabbed the nylon and yanked it off, revealing the culprit. Margie? Cat said in astonishment. Let me go! She tried to run. Marshall simply grabbed her by the coat collar, as if she were a child he was trying to restrain from running. Just settle down now. We're going to talk. Stan rushed out of the restaurant to join them. Margie? Sirens sounded. Tim pulled up in his cop car. Have you been the one doing this? Cat looked shell-shocked. Margie quit struggling. Margie? Tim looked just as confused as everyone else. Don't look at me that way. Margie glared at only one person. Stan, don't you dare look at me that way. The last week had been perfect. We were partners. We were a team. We had everything going for us. You told me it was a wonderful week. Tim moved toward Margie, holding up a hand. Margie, he said in a soft voice, I need you to calm down. I'm not going to calm down, Tim. Margie looked possessed. She pointed at Cat. I had to get her to sell the bakery. That's all I was trying to do. If she just would have left Southport, then all of this could have ended. Stan and I could have been together forever. In the military, Marshall had dealt with some crazy people. Not that he ever judged them. He had seen firsthand what it was like when someone had convinced themselves of a truth that only they believed they would do anything to prove that truth. It was a dicey business when a person started believing something and then acted on that truth. Heck, hadn't he just been thinking that very same thing about what Sarah had told him about being a father? What if he hadn't reevaluated that? Would he have continued thinking he wasn't meant to be a father? That something was wrong with him? He felt empathy for Margie. Cat nodded. Margie... I think we need to ask Stan how he feels about all this. Stan looked baffled, confused. Margie, what would have made you think that if you owned the bakery and I owned the deli, we would be together? Margie's determined look crumbled, and she started crying. Because we talked about how nice it was to run the shops together. You said you always wanted to do that with your wife. Margie, my wife passed away. But you would move on, eventually, she sniffed, with me by your side. Stan let out a long sigh. Margie, I'm really sorry that you ever thought we could be together. I don't like you that way. Margie burst into sobs. But you could have liked me more. I know it would take time. When we were together running the deli and bakery, you would eventually fall in love with me. Marshall and Cat exchanged a look that said, Crazy. It was the look they gave each other when one of their parents freaked out about something, or one of the kids they hung out with was acting crazy. The inside joke made Marshall feel warm and tingly, which was ridiculous because they were in the middle of all of this drama. Tim let out a long sigh. Margie... I'm going to have to take you in and take a statement. I'm being arrested? Margie looked mortified. She turned to Cat. I never would have really hurt you. I was just trying to get you to sail. I swear I never would have hurt you. I'm not going to charge her, 
Cat's tone was soft. Even though Marshall understood her thought process, he didn't forgive all that Margie had put Cat through. You have to be accountable for your actions. You caused Cat a lot of pain. You scared her. You had all of us scared. Do you want to know what I was ready to do to you? I was ready to hurt you because you were tormenting her. To Cat, he said, she has to be held accountable. No, she doesn't. Cat gave Marshall a determined look. Margie stomped her foot, reminding Marshall of a toddler. It wasn't about Cat, she yelled, glaring at Cat. Not everything is about her. If you would have sold me the bakery, none of this would have happened. The look on Cat's face said she was done with the situation. On second thought, I am going to charge you. What? Margie looked confused. You don't get to treat people like that, Margie. I hired you to work with me even though you had a lot of problems. At every turn, I have given you grace and mercy. But Marshall is right. You don't get to treat me like that. You don't get to hurt me without consequences. So I am going to charge you. There was something about the determined way Cat said those words that made Marshall smile. He was proud of her. She deserved to charge Margie, even though he knew, deep down, that she would have liked to be merciful. He also knew that Cat needed to stand up for herself. She needed to value herself again. Tim turned to Margie. I'm going to take you downtown. You can do this in handcuffs, or I'll just let you sit in the back of my car. But if you act out, I'll have to handcuff you. He started listing the Miranda rights. They all watched Tim put Margie in the back of the car. Before long, Tim turned to Cat. Meet me down at the station. He drove away. Stan let out a long breath. I am so sorry. I had no idea that she felt that way. And that, he gestured to the plate and the note, that she was doing all of this. Cat let out a gasp. Bugs! She left me a plate of dead bugs! Marshall was stunned to see the assortment of insects Margie had left her. If he had worried about being too harsh, he wasn't anymore. Cat picked up the note that Margie had placed beneath the wiper. She read it aloud. If you don't want me to hurt the one you love, you need to leave. Her eyes connected with Marshall's. At this point, Marshall was all out of grace. What do you want to do? Cat nodded to her car. Like I said, I'm going to charge her. She needs to know that even though she felt like she was justified, she can't do this to people. Chapter 33 Cat stared at Margie, who was huddled in on herself on the chair in front of Tim. Margie managed to answer Tim's questions between fits of weeping. I never meant for it all to go this far, I promise. I just thought that if I could get Cat to sell the place to me and sell the deli to Stan, then me and Stan would have a chance. But, she said, indignantly lifting her head and staring at Tim, have you seen the way Stan looks at her? She glanced at Cat in an accusing manner. When you are in the shop, he only sees you. He doesn't even try to joke with me or anything. But if it's just us working, she trailed off and her cheeks reddened, then he sees me. So many emotions rushed through Cat. Part of her truly felt sorry for Margie. The woman had been trying to get Stan's attention for so long, but she clearly had some problems. Her actions were not okay. Tim inhaled a long breath and turned to face Cat. What charges do you want to file? Her heart raced as she faced Margie. In the blink of an eye, compassion swelled within her. She thought of J.D. and how different things could have been if he would have gotten the help he needed. Margie, I won't file charges if you take steps to get help. Mandatory therapy and possibly medication if it's recommended by a professional. For a long time, Margie didn't speak. Then she nodded. 
Okay. Much later that evening, after spending time going over options for mental health care with Margie, Kat moved down the stairs with a towel in her hands and her swimsuit on. Marshall had talked her into relaxing in the hot tub. She walked down the hallway of the inn and through the living room to the French doors by the kitchen. Light music drifted in through the cracked door. Her heart thrummed, and even though it had been a rough day, butterflies swarmed inside her. When she was young, she and Marshall would often sneak into the back and swim when it was dark. Of course, he would have to come pick her up on his motorcycle. It had been so much fun. Now, she thought about the last few days and how amazing this grown-up version of Marshall was. Everything was so different. If only she had never married J.D. As soon as she thought it, though, she took it back. If she hadn't married J.D., she wouldn't have Cade. She would never regret being a mother. It was one of the best things in her life. Hey, Marshall said, already sitting in the hot tub. His arms were stretched out. Cat could appreciate the cut of his muscles rippling beneath his skin. Unlike when they were young and he would always flex at her or try to show off his muscles, the man version of Marshall didn't do that. But she definitely noticed. She averted her eyes and focused on getting into the hot tub. The water was piping hot and it felt amazing. This is nice. Yes, it is, Marshall grinned at her. He patted the wall of the hot tub next to him. Come here. She moved to his side, then leaned into him, relishing just how comforting this man was. I don't think I told you thank you. She turned her head to face him and was startled to see how close he was. Close enough to kiss. Of course. Gently, he reached up and moved her hair out of her face. Then he trailed his fingers behind her ear and down her shoulder. I'm glad everything worked out. Most importantly, I'm glad that you're okay. Kat stared at his lips. She wanted to kiss them. So many feelings warred inside her. She had told herself that she would talk to Marshall about everything she was feeling when they figured out who was stalking her. But now, as she stared into his blue eyes, the old fear came back. His phone buzzed, and he reached out and picked it up. It's Trey he told her as he put the phone to his ear. She couldn't hear what Trey was saying. It's all handled. Yep, it was Margie, but they worked out a solution. Yeah, I spoke to Brooks earlier. Marshall took hold of a strand of her hair and twirled it around his finger. The gesture felt so natural. She had fallen for this man, and it felt like the easiest thing in the world. But she was still worried about Cade. Would Cade like him? What? Marshall quit twirling and then laughed. Hold on, I have to put you on speaker. He tapped the phone to do just that. Trey, tell Cat what you just told me. Hey, Cat, Trey said. Hey, she said nervously, giving Marshall a confused look. He had a mischievous smile on his face. So, Cat, uh, Brooks told me and Ava about the pocket watch you all found. The one that has the same type of cross on it that is used in our great-grandfather's journals? Oh, she said. All of them had spoken about it. Of course they had. This had to do with their family and the conquistador's gold. Trey laughed. Marshall was shaking his head, biting his lip. What? Cat asked. Uh, well, after everything happened with Kenzie, with Mr. Banks, the billionaire, tearing up the town, and before that with Mr. Jones going crazy and almost killing Ava, yeah, we put out some fake clues, just to throw people off. Marshall laughed, letting out a soft curse word. What? She couldn't believe it. Trey laughed again. Ava and I thought it would be better if we could give people something, but kind of control the narrative about the gold, if you will. So people think they find something, but then they come back to us and we have a conversation about it. She met Marshall's gaze and they both laughed. Wow. Trey laughed too. Sorry, Cat. Ava called out from the background. She and Marshall laughed harder. They'd been so excited that they were onto something. Marshall finished talking with Trey and then got off the phone. Well, I guess that's that. She shook her head. 
the ever-elusive conquistador's gold. Yup, he sighed. Okay, just tell me, how much for your thoughts? I'm tired of guessing. It hit her then that she would be leaving tomorrow. She didn't want to lose him again. But did he want an instant family? A smile played at his lips. He stroked his hand down her head again. Come on, cat. How much am I going to have to pay you for your thoughts? She felt herself melting. The man was irresistible. Not only was she attracted to his personality and to everything from their past, but he definitely was Mr. Delicious. What? He smiled back. What is making you smile? Well, some of the ladies in town, and I'm not going to say who, may call you Mr. Delicious. What? He leaned back, but he kept his hand on her shoulders. You're messing with me. Cat leaned into him and reached up, touching the stubble on his face. I shouldn't tell you that, because that will just feed your already inflated ego. She kissed his cheek and added, I don't like feeding your ego. His arms closed around her. Too late. His lips were heading her way, and it was impossible to fight it. Not that she wanted to. She pressed her lips to his and felt herself relax. Kissing Marshall was like the 4th of July, with its exciting fireworks and her favorite cotton candy all rolled into one. She moved closer to him, putting her hands on his chest and enjoying the surge of attraction between them. Suddenly, Marshall broke away and just held her. You're leaving tomorrow. I am. She thought of what her mother had said on the phone last night. What if you came to Florida with me? He froze, then met her eyes. Are you sure? She sucked in a long breath. Yeah, I am. I'd like that, he said, kissing her again. You'll have to ask Kenzie if she and Tim can cover the inn. He pulled her back to him. She already offered. Kat's laugh was muffled by another kiss. Of course she had. Chapter 34 Cat could hardly believe her eyes as she sat on the beach in Florida next to her mom and dad, watching Marshall and Cade in the sand. It was strange how time worked. At one point in her life, it had been her out there, playing with Marshall. Then, when she'd been in the middle of her marriage with J.D., it had been her out there with Cade. Now, it was surreal to see Marshall and Cade together, getting along so well. They really get along, don't they? Her mother said, giving her a nudge with her shoulder, seeming to read her thoughts. Cat grinned at her mom. I thought they would. Marshall, at his core is just a big kid. You can say that again, her father said, though he pretended to be reading his book. He was propped on a beach chair, hat pulled down over his face to protect him from the sun. He had been ecstatic when Cat had shown up with Marshall. She could tell by the way he had told Marshall all about Florida and offered to take him on a special tour of the place. Growing up, her parents had loved Marshall. Now, as she saw her father sneakily watching Marshall and Cade, his smile told her that he blessed the situation. I'm a mummy, Marshall stiffly extended his arms in front of him and stomped toward Cade, who was buried in a pile of sand. I'm going to eat you. Sand flew as Cade jumped out. Delightful yelling ensued. Mom, save me! Cade rushed toward her and dove behind her chair. She can't save you, boy, Marshall stalked over, reaching for her. Cat shrieked. Marshall picked her up and threw her over his shoulder. I shall take your mother and feed her to the sharks in your place. Cat laughed and kicked as he lugged her toward the ocean. Help, Cade! She laughed and pounded on his back. Let me go! Never. The sharks need to eat. I am a mummy. Cade was on their heels, laughing and giggling. He pushed at Marshall's hip. Let my mom go, evil mummy. Right before they got to the water, Marshall bent and picked up Cade. He ran with both of them into the ocean. The sharks must eat both of you. They all tumbled into the water, laughing. 
When Marshall released Cat, she threw her head back and held in a breath. She splashed Marshall. Go away, evil mummy. Cade splashed him too. Mom, this way. We can run away from him. Marshall again gathered them up and pulled them close. The past five days had been amazing. It was like they had always been a family. She didn't know how it had all come together so quickly, but it felt seamless. I'm never letting you guys go. Marshall's tone had turned serious. Cade seemed to sense the change, and he relaxed against him. She relaxed as well, putting her arms around both of them. We don't want you to. Cade giggled, and there was a mischievous look in his eyes. So you're going to be my dad now? Marshall jerked his gaze to her. He looked as surprised as she felt. They hadn't said anything like that to Cade. In fact, they had made it a point that Marshall was her friend, and he was there to visit with all of them. Marshall's eyes grew bright with interest. Would you like that? Cade nodded his head and giggled. Yeah, I would like that. He looked at his mother. Would you like that, Mom? Of course her perceptive son would be two steps ahead of her. Cade, I... We, we haven't talked about that. Marshall grinned at her. Then let's talk about it. Hey, Cat, want to get married? Emotion lodged in the back of her throat, and her vision grew blurry with tears. Impossibly, she found herself answering, I, I would like that. Marshall hugged them tighter, then pulled back and turned to her son. Cade, would you care if I married your mom back in Southport at my family house? He laughed. That would be cool. Would you be my best man? Cade beamed. Does that mean I get to pick the flavor of the cake? It sure does, Marshall said, and he squeezed Cade tighter. Cat met Marshall's gaze over Cade's head. She didn't think it was possible, but she fell in love with him even more. Later that night, after Cade was in bed and she and Marshall were snuggling on her parents' porch swing, she asked, Are you sure you want to get married? I blew that proposal, didn't I? Warmth flooded through her as she laughed, but at the same time, she felt tears come to her eyes. No, it was pretty awesome, actually. He grinned. I like Cade. He likes you, too. But you didn't answer the question. His gaze turned serious. I've wanted to marry you for... Feels like my whole life. I just... I just want to make sure we can be together. I have two more years in Virginia, and then my commitment is up. Then we'll go there. He kissed the back of her hand. Are you sure? What about the deli and the bakery? She shrugged. Maybe I will sell to Stan, if he wants the place. Are you sure? He pulled her closer. Really sure? She thought about everything, especially what his ex had said to him about being a father. It made her so mad to think about her gentle giant of a man doubting himself for so long. And it made her so mad that she had been part of the reason he doubted himself. I want to be with you. I want to be your best friend. I want to be your lover. I want to be your wife. And I want you to be a father to my son. If you want that, I trust you. I've always trusted you. I want that too. He leaned in and kissed her. It was a soft, light, lingering kiss. I love you. He smiled at her. I love you too. And you just made every dream I had, and every dream I will ever have, come true. Chapter 35. If someone had told Marshall a month ago that he would be getting married to the girl he had thought was lost to him forever, he would have laughed his butt off. But he wasn't laughing as he stared at the ocean waves, all dressed up in a tux. When Marshall had first come back to Southport to watch the inn, Trey had said something about it being home. Marshall had brushed him off, but he'd been right. This was home. A hand clapped down on his shoulder. I would say I told you so, if I was that kind of a guy. 
but I'm not. Trey smiled at him, then dropped his hand and stared out at the ocean next to him. Marshall chuckled. Actually, I was just thinking about that very thing. Were you? Marshall had been stewing on the idea of coming back here since he'd decided he wanted to marry Cat. You know I have two years left, but if you're still open to it, I'd like to have that chance to come back and be in your life. I can let you boss me around, and then we can fight and punch each other. I'd like that, Trey said, putting his arm around Marshall and pulling him in. I'm really happy for you, dude. Thanks. I'm happy, too. We didn't know you guys were having a party. Hunter, Brooks, and Trent joined them. They all wore their tuxes. You guys always leave me out of these little brother gatherings, Kenzie sidled up next to Trey and flashed her brothers a smile. You guys look nice. No fighting until after the ceremony, okay? They all burst out laughing. That was the exact thing their mother always said to them before any significant event. They couldn't fight until afterward. The Stone brothers always had a fight brewing. Marshall gave Kenzie a comprehensive look. Sis, you look amazing. Kenzie wore a pink flowering satin dress. She had baby's breath in her hair. Earlier, he had seen Lucy with the women in the dresses she had designed. She had been busy putting flowers in their hair. Of course, he hadn't seen Cat. She was holed up in their parents' old master suite. People would walk in and out of the room and then tell him how amazing she looked. I wish Mom and Dad were here. Marshall hadn't meant to say the words aloud, but his eyes connected with Kenzie's, and he knew she was feeling it too. There was a chorus of, Me too. Silence settled over them. Marshall stared out at the ocean. Kenzie moved between him and Trey, and she looped her arms through theirs. They are here. Can't you feel them? Hunter nudged Marshall's other side and pointed out at the ocean. They're loving those birds in the sky. Don't you remember how Dad used to tell us that the birds meant God was there? He would say that when he was on his ops. Every time he saw a bird, he knew it was a sign from God. Marshall's heart ached for his parents. He sniffed. I do remember that. And don't you remember how much Mom loved the way the water shone in the sunlight? Brooks said, his voice soft. Mom is here, too. Hunter scooped up a rock and skipped it across the water. Don't you remember how Dad always challenged us to a rock-throwing contest? He grunted. I don't think I ever won. Trey laughed. I never beat the old man. Trent turned to face all of them. He put his hand on his heart. Mom and Dad are here. Always. Marshall nodded, then put his hand out. Right here with all of us, in our memories. They were quiet for a few seconds. Marshall noticed someone walking toward them on the beach. Someone that clearly didn't belong at a wedding party. The guy had long hair, a bushy beard, and tattered clothes on. Marshall turned to face him. Can I help you? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. The man's gaze swept across all the tents set up next to the lighthouse for the wedding. He turned back to them. I was told by the sheriff yesterday that I would be able to find the Stone family out here today. He shook his head. Although I wasn't told this was a wedding. Sorry, I didn't dress up. I'm Trey Stone, Trey said, taking the lead. What can I do for you? Kenzie frowned and moved next to Trey. My husband is the sheriff. The man paused, then grinned. You must be Kenzie. Kenzie looked suspicious. I am. Tim told me all about you and your romance books. Kenzie looked embarrassed. Thanks. The man put his hand out. Sorry, I'm Oliver Brown. I just bought a little place down from you and Tim. She shook his hand. Oliver held out a bottle. Anyway, I found this when I was out sailing around the frying pan shoals last week, and I had this feeling I should keep it. Tim saw it yesterday, 
and told me that he thought it might belong to your family. Kenzie took the bottle, inspecting it. Why were you out at the frying pan shoals? Most sailors considered it one of the most dangerous areas to cross between Cape Fear and the Atlantic Ocean. I actually just happened upon it. Trey bent to inspect the bottle. Are you helping to restore the tower out there? He looked at Oliver. Oliver shook his head. No, I just like to sail, and I like interesting places on the coast. Marshall noted that there was a strange crest on the bottle. I'd say the shoals are tough to sail in. Can I see it? Brooks asked, holding his hand out. If anyone knew what the crest on the bottle meant, it would be Brooks. Kenzie let Brooks take it. They say that anyone who sails in the shoals is either crazy or looking to find a ghost. Stop, said Hunter, elbowing his side. There's no ghosts out there. All of them laughed. Hunter never liked to talk of ghosts. Their father had always told them ghost stories about the sailors who died in the shoals. Kenzie smiled at Oliver. There are also stories of sailors who are looking for their long-lost loves. Oliver's eyes widened, and he seemed embarrassed. I'm pretty sure she's not in the shoals. Where is she? Hunter asked. Oliver shrugged. I left her at home a long time ago. I doubt she even remembers me. Brooks held the bottle up. I think this skull shape is the same one on the last page of the journal. Kenzie filled in for him, then laughed. Trey laughed, too. I'll be darned. Marshall hadn't studied the journals like the others, but he felt like this was something important. Brooks turned to face Oliver. I'm glad you brought this to us, but I wonder why you would even keep a bottle like this. It's not much to look at. Oliver took a deep breath. I don't know. To tell you the truth... I just had a feeling that I should keep it. He shook his head. Then, as I was showing Tim my sailboat yesterday, he saw the bottle and said he thought you all might be interested in it. Kenzie scoffed. Of course he did. Then he didn't even tell me last night. Marshall put his arms around her shoulders. Hey, you are tired at night, sis. She rolled her eyes. True. Oliver cleared his throat. Well, congratulations, he backed up. I'll get out of the way. I'm just glad I could get the bottle into the right hands. Marshall was feeling jovial. No, stay, enjoy. Where did you say you were from? Oliver hesitated. I didn't say, but I'm from a little town in Montana called Snow Valley. Trey reached out his hand. And why did you say you were in Southport? I didn't say that either, but, well, I'm here to open a beach clothing company downtown on the pier, and I want to make this place home. Really? Hunter asked, putting his hand out. That's great. Oliver shook his hand. Trent put his hand out. It'll be good to have you, but just so you know, if you meet Cherise, she owns the salon in town, she's ours. He pointed between him and Hunter. Oliver laughed. She's both of yours? Hunter shook his head. No, not both of ours, but one of ours. She hasn't picked yet. Oliver laughed. Well, I'm not looking for love, so don't worry. Kenzie sighed. Will someone tell the man that love shows up when you least expect it? She wagged her finger at him. We'll have to think of a love story for you. Trent patted his brother's back. But my love story is about to begin because I'm going to ask Charisse to dance first tonight. Hunter grunted. Nope, you're not. Everyone laughed. It's time to start, someone called out to them. They all turned. Tim motioned for them to join the wedding party. Come on. The nerves in the pit of Marshall's gut tightened. It's go time. Kenzie linked arms with him. It's going to be great. Marshall nodded. Yes, it will be.
Chapter 36 Getting married a second time had never been in Kat's plans. Getting married at the lighthouse felt perfect. The Stone family had all gotten together and cleaned the place up. Kenzie and Lucy and Cherise had reveled in putting together a wedding at the lighthouse. Kat's heart raised. It was gorgeous. There were tents with lights strung and pale blues and pinks. Kat loved it. As she stared down the red carpet that had been put down, happiness filled her. The man at the end of that carpet was her destiny. So many memories washed through her, cleansed her, redeemed her. All that mattered was right now. It was a new beginning, as Marshall told her often. Yes, that was what she wanted. A new beginning with the man she had loved since she was nine. The wedding march started, and her father and mother linked arms with her on either side. Maybe it was because she had been adopted, and her parents both felt fiercely protective of her, but her mother had made it clear that she was giving her away this time, too. Her mother had railed against J.D. a lot. She'd spotted J.D.'s problems before Kat even knew what was happening. Her mother was adamant that she'd always known that Marshall was truly the one for Kat. That made Kat smile, because there had been a couple of years where her mother had not liked Marshall, especially during the times when Kat snuck out. As they walked toward Marshall, Kat looked around the chairs, filled with people. Most of Southport was here. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw movement. It was Margie. Margie had agreed to get some help, to get on medication and start counseling. Now Margie beamed at her. A man sat next to Margie, an older gentleman who came into the bakery often. Kat's heart warmed. Maybe they were dating. Wasn't there a chance for everyone to be happy? She hoped so. All thoughts of Margie faded as Kat got closer to Marshall. The words, Mr. Delicious, echoed through her mind. She smiled. Her telling him about that nickname had definitely inflated his ego. Her heart fluttered as she thought about their honeymoon. Marshall had a week before he had to report in Virginia Beach. Though she was happy that he wasn't grounded any longer, she was nervous about starting a life with him. Their honeymoon would be three nights, and then they were coming back to Southport and packing up their home before moving to Virginia Beach. She had sold the bakery and the deli to Stan. Stan had plenty of money saved, and he was grateful for the opportunity. Even though Kat wasn't certain about what she would do, she had told Marshall that she did want to start school to get her business degree. Marshall was already looking up online programs, and they were checking into the local college. He was talking about how amazing she would be at school. His simple belief in her abilities made her feel fearless. He had always bolstered her courage. When they reached Marshall, her parents took one of her hands and ceremoniously put it into Marshall's. Her father nodded at him. I trust you. Her mother had tears running down her cheeks. You have been taking care of my baby since that day on the beach when I first saw her giggle and then play with you. Now you will play together for the rest of your lives. Kat's eyes filled with tears. Her makeup was already getting ruined, but she smiled at Marshall. Marshall swallowed hard and nodded at her parents. Then his eyes met hers, and the smile he gave her was everything. I feel like the luckiest man in the world. She knew he meant those words. Her heart swelled with the intensity that always accompanied Marshall. I'm the lucky one. Pastor Henry cleared his throat and then started the ceremony. Kat felt like she should pay attention to what Pastor Henry was saying, but her mind was a mess of nerves and excitement. At the appropriate time, she said, I do. The best part of the ceremony was when Pastor Henry asked Marshall if he would take this woman to be his lawfully wedded wife. Marshall paused and then turned back to reach for Cade's hand. Cade joined them in the circle. Warmth filled her at the tender way Marshall brought Cade's smaller hand into theirs. 
Then he said, I take this woman and I take this son as my family now. The crowd exploded into shouts and clapping. At that point, her makeup was truly done for. She couldn't resist hugging them both. There were sniffles in the audience. When she glanced at the crowd, she saw that they were all crying with her. Pastor Henry finished the ceremony, saying at the end, I now give you Mr. and Mrs. Marshall Stone and their son, Cade. The audience was on their feet, clapping and laughing, then descended on them, and everything became a blur. Laughs and hugs and congratulations were shared. Cade ate up the attention, standing proudly next to Cat and Marshall, and he accepted plenty of hugs himself. When they headed over to the little dance floor that had been laid on a different part of the beach, Marshall took Cat's hand and brought it to his lips. Are you happy? She'd never been happier in her whole life. I'm happy. Are you happy? The music started, and Marshall pulled her in and started swaying with her, gazing into her eyes. Me and you. Always. He leaned in and pressed his lips to her. She pulled back and smiled. Me and you. Always. Thank you for listening to the Stone Family Lighthouse. This has been a production of the Stone Family Lighthouse. Written by Taylor Hart. Read for you by Christopher Ringer. Production copyright, Archstone Inc. and One Shot Productions. All rights reserved. For more information, visit taylorhartbooks.com or oneshotatthetitle.com. Archstone Inc. and One Shot Productions support the right of free expression and the value of copyright. The purpose of copyright is to encourage writers and artists to produce the works that enrich our culture and make our world a better place. The duplication, distribution, and uploading of this audiobook without permission is a theft of the author's intellectual property. If you would like permission to use any portion of this audiobook other than for review purposes, please contact the author at taylorhartbooks.com. Thank you for your support of the author's rights. Names, places, and events in this book are either the product of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously. Any resemblance to persons, living or dead, events or locales, is entirely coincidental.